Earth Launch Complex in Florida, meanwhile, the spacecraft voice lines started glitching. The crew was having trouble communicating with the launch team as well as with each other. It was approaching sunset at the Cape when the countdown was held to permit troubleshooting. Kraft kidded George Page, the test conductor at the Cape, saying that he was keeping score on who called the most holds. The communication systems used between the crew, launch team, and MCC were incredibly complex. Hundreds of engineers, operators, and technicians were wired to their support teams. In mission control there were more than a hundred communications panels, each with 48 talk listen buttons. If you wanted to talk to someone sitting next to you, the voice communications went through dozens of connections. From the MCC to the Cape the communications were carried by numerous telephone lines. When anything broke down, the simplest problem might take hours to troubleshoot and resolve. Doing it during a pad test bordered on the impossible. The launch team continued trying to work around the communications problems. Attempting to resolve the comm problems, Grissom and Ed White exchanged their seed audio electrical connectors while Roger Chafee and the launch team rehearsed the procedures for a dry check of the spacecraft thrusters. At 5.20 p.m., the countdown entered the scheduled hold point at T-10 minutes where the spacecraft would switch to its internal power. The communications problems had to be fixed before proceeding. Kraft entered the hold in his console log, punched at his voice comm, and said, Ground control, see if you can. Get a handle on the voice problems. The rest of you can take 10. At 5 hours 31 minutes and 4 seconds Houston time a brief voice report jolted the launch and flight teams. It was perhaps the defining moment in our race to get to the moon. After this, nothing would be quite the same ever again. Fire. We've got a fire in the cockpit. We've got a bad fire, get us out. We're burning up. The last sound was a scream, shrill and brief. The elapsed time of the crew report, 12 seconds. There would be no final agreement on who in the Apollo spacecraft shouted what. But even today, just reading the words on papyrus chilling, there was a gallant but futile effort to rescue the trapped threesome. The pad rescue team as well as crewmen. From North American, mechanics and technicians grabbed fire extinguishers and rushed toward the inferno. At least twice, shock waves and secondary explosions drove them back, knocking many to their knees. Some got close enough to struggle with the hatch. The heat of the hatch burned through their gloves and the smoke sent them staggering, choking and blinded. The call went out for firemen and ambulances. By then it was too late. I had just finished hurriedly dressing to go out to dinner when I heard a knock on the door. Thinking the babysitter was early, I buttoned my shirt as I walked down the stairs again I heard the knock, only this time more insistent. I yelled out, hold on, I'm coming. Opening the door, I was surprised to see my neighbor and fellow flight controller, Jim Hannigan. He strode in, agitated and breathless. Have you heard what happened, he exclaimed. Bewildered, I raised me Hansar's Jim walked across the room to turn on the TV. He then blurted out, they had a fire on the launch pad. They think the crew is dead. I had a sudden apocalyptic vision of a gigantic explosion that had taken out the flight crew, the Saturn rocket, and the launch complex. Marta had raced down the stairs as Hannigan's wife, Peggy, visibly upset, walked in the door, crying out, it's just awful. I can't believe it. Since the details in news bulletins at that point were few, I assumed, from the emotional state of Jim and his wife, that one of the controllers had reached him on the phone. Kraft had moved quickly to cut off all outgoing calls. Confused, I rapidly switched TV channels. There was no new information, only a brief report that an accident had occurred. I grabbed my badge and plastic pocket protector full of pencils. Nodding briefly to Marta, I jumped into our black Plymouth station wagon and tore out the driveway, shooting through traffic lights on the 
10 mile drive to the space center. I practically died a cop to get in my way. I tried to figure out where in the countdown the accident had occurred. Given my awareness of the command problems in Gemini, my mind raced through the current tests. A thousand questions filled my thoughts as I tried to rule out the MCC as a cause of the tragedy on Pad 34. Nothing I knew about the situation made sense. This had been a very low-risk test. I kept telling myself, the propellant systems are not loaded. I kept thinking about it the way I would analyze an aircraft accident, did some part of the plane fail, was it pilot error, did someone on the ground scroop? The radio was still reporting only sketchy details of the accident as I swung into my parking slot behind the MCC building. I bolted from the car and raced to the entrance. Getting inside was difficult. With the news of the fire, every controller was reporting to the MCC to find out. What happened? Cars were parked haphazardly behind the building. Kraft had declared a total freeze on operations to protect the data, terminating phone calls and directing the controllers to write down every event, any and every recollection of what they had seen and heard. With any ground or flight accident, it was essential to the investigation to bring everything to a dead stop while memories and data were still fresh and uncontaminated by the inevitable aftershock, confusion, and second-guessing. Afcape, they had been able to keep news of the disaster under wraps for about an hour but leaks were inevitable. Wives of some of the technicians had received tense phone calls from their husbands, saying only that they would be home late. Sensing that something horrific had happened, the wives called the newspapers and radio stations with anxious questions. Reporters began to put pressure on their contacts who worked at the Cape and at MCC. Security had barred further entry to the MCC without the permission of Kraft or Hodge. I waited for the guard to break through the busy signal on the phone at the flight director's console. Cursing in frustration, I walked around to the rear entrance, bluffing my way past the guard, saying, the main elevators are locked out. I've got to take the freight elevator to the second floor. Once I was in the control room there could be no doubt that something catastrophic had happened. All I had to do was look into the eyes of the controllers. They seemed stunned, talking in short snatches, all wondering what the hell happened. I finally reached Hodge. Kraft was standing by the surgeon, listening more than talking. Hodge was unusually quiet, muttering under his breath, it was gruesome, then lapsing into silence. Clenching his pipe in his teeth, he fought to retain enough composure to stay focused. It wasn't easy for him. It was impossible for the younger. Controllers. They were milling around, standing, then sitting, too. Agitated to stay st still. They kept playing back the telemetry recordings, looking for clues, desperately clinging to their belief in their data, expecting to find answers. Kraft hung up the phone after a lengthy discussion with Slayton, then solemnly returned to the flight director's console. Deke thinks we were damned lucky, he reported, that we didn't tell us a hell of a lot more, there was fire coming from the capsule, molten metal dribbling down the side of the service module. It was not a good time to be talking about luck, but in times of crisis your defenses kick in. This is especially so among people who have loved to fly. They go on autopilot. Their instincts take over. Nothing could be done for the crew. The important thing now was to find out the how and why to protect the living and to keep moving forward. Death had come to the space program in the most unimaginable way during a test, to three men, helpless, not in the air, but in a cockpit just 318 feet above the ground. The fire had flashed through the cabin in seconds. You tried not to think of the horror of it. We all thanked God it had been quick, but how long is quick? How long does it take to suffocate, to burn, to die? Hodge and I had come from flight testing and knew the risks. Kraft was intimately aware of the dangers from the day he launched Shepard in the first primitive Mercury capsule. We knew there was a high probability that some men would die at some point in the program, but none of us could accept losing our crew on the launch pad. 
We all had assumed that when a calamity struck us, it would be in flight, our nightmare was an explosion during launch, or a flying coffin, a faulty craft stuck in endless orbit. Dutch von Ehrenfried had been at the guidance console during the crew's last seconds. He was white as a sheet, face drawn, for once speechless and on the edge of tears. The poise I had seen so often on the judo mat. And in competition had left him. He was now just a vulnerable young man who had witnessed his friend's deaths. John Aaron, filling in on the ecom console, passed the minutes playing back data, seeing the brief electrical current spike, then the rise in cabin pressure and temperature. He pushed himself beyond exhaustion and finally had to be driven home. In these harrowing hours and the days that followed there was no way to comprehend or accept the loss of Grissom, 40, White, 36, and Chafee, 31. If there was anything that could be retrieved from this tragedy, it was the evidence, it was right there in front of us on pad 34. We had a chance to discover the cause of the fire before another spacecraft was put at risk. The fire did something else. It reminded the American public that men could and would die in our efforts to explore the heavens. It recreated the tension and uncertainty of the early flights of Shepard, Grissom, and Glenn. The Russians worked in secret, but the entire world. Could watch our flights on television. Success had become almost routine for us, until now. The country had gotten complacent. Only many years later would the full count of losses become known, these three Americans plus four Russians, all brave, good men who ran out of luck, whose technology failed at a crucial moment. We were torn between feelings of fatalism and defiance. The United States had catapulted men into space 16 times without a casualty more serious than a stubbed toe although we had lived through some very scary situations. In our series of 10 Gemini trips, Americans had repeatedly broken all records for survival in space, had strolled casually into the void, had navigated their craft through complex maneuvers, tracking down and docking with another spaceship. With each flight the bar had been raised higher. No one knew how many orbits Apollo 1 would attempt. Grissom, White, and Chafee would have been blazing yet. Another path, an open-ended mission, a bold departure from the rigid, limited space flights of the past. Theirs was to be essentially an engineering flight, a shakedown for the Apollo systems. Built by North American, the command and service module was by far the biggest and most sophisticated space vehicle ever designed. We had come so far, so quickly, from Alan Shepard's pioneering 15-minute flight when reporters asked Shepard what he thought about as he sat atop the Redstone rocket, waiting for liftoff, he had replied, the fact that every part of this ship was built by the low bidder. It was a funny crack, but with an edge. In marked contrast to the tiny Mercury capsule, Apollo was, in spaceflight terms, practically a luxury liner. It had hammocks for full-length sleeping, hot and cold water, and a primitive galley. The spacecraft was the transportation for the crew to Earth orbit, to lunar orbit, and back home. It consisted of two sections, or modules, the upper one cone-shaped, the lower a cylinder. In the top set section, called the command module, the astronauts occupied three cockpit couches looking up at a maze of controls, gauges, dials, switches, lights, and toggles. The service module was essentially an engine room. It housed the fuel, the crew's oxygen, the basic electrical system, and a large rocket with 22,500 pounds of thrust that would supply the propulsion required to enter and leave a lunar orbit. The CSM was 34 feet long and weighed about 30 tons when fully fueled. The Saturn booster rockets were enormous. Towering 223 feet above the launch pad, the two-stage Saturn IB rocket provided 1.6 million pounds of thrust at liftoff and was used for Apollo Earth orbital missions not requiring an LM or lunar module. Asterisk the SIB was a prototype for the Saturn V and used the same SIVB upper stage as the more powerful Saturn V. Asterisk LEM vs LM, 
In the early planning of the Apollo program, the term LEM was used, but by the time the program got started, their excursion, E, was dropped from the vernacular and it simply became Lunar Module. The Saturn V rocket with 7.7 .7 million pounds through stat liftoff was the largest rocket ever developed by the United States. Standing 363 feet tall, it was used for missions that carried both the CSM and LM. The LM was a bug-like, rocket-powered craft that two astronauts would board for the descent to the moon's surface. The LM, with landing legs folded, was mounted on an adapter at the forward end of the SIVB, which was in turn enclosed by four tapered conical panels with the CSM perched on top. For lunar missions the SIVB, the third stage of the rocket, injected the CSM and LM into Earth orbit, and after a checkout period the engine reignited to place both spacecraft into a lunar trajectory. The capsule of Apollo 1 was a total loss, charred and blackened both inside and out, it's sensitive. Instruments ruined beyond any useful purpose except for whatever clues it might surrender. The three bodies had been left strapped in their seats for seven hours while the first anguished experts tried to sort out the causes of a fiery accident that traumatized an entire nation. One by one the controllers left after securing the records, the logbooks, and the voice and telemetry tapes. Almost by reflex, everyone drifted over to the singing wheel, the controllers watering hole. As word of the Apollo 1 fire spread through the Clear Lake area, Nelson Bland, the owner of the singing wheel, cleared the building except for the controllers. Throughout the evening, more drifted in as others left. Worried wives came looking for their husbands, clustering in one of the back rooms. It was like the nights of years earlier, when you lost a squadron pilot and a good friend, all that was lacking were the songs we used to sing back then, our way of saying, in the words of Dylan. Thomas, death shall have no dominion. This night, however, was one of limited and subdued conversation. We mourned our crew and the loss of whatever navy we had left. We had known setbacks before. We had lived through some bad days, but we had never taken a knockout punch like this one. I wished there was some way to get in a judo match. I just wanted to feel some physical pain. The beer was not helping anything. When we returned to our homes that night we were changed in ways none of us could describe. The next day was no different. The controllers wandered between the offices and the control center, their minds now moving to the question, what's next? Kraft was nowhere to be seen. I guessed that he was probably working with Bob Gilruth, Deke Slayton, and Joe Shea, the Apollo program manager, to put together an investigative team. The day stretched on forever as dribs and drabs of data filtered into the offices. There were many rumors, few facts. ACI was sitting in my office, a picture of an antique biplane hanging in a tree caught my eye. I had carried it with me to keep me on track since my time in flight test at Holloman Air Force Base. A caption below the picture read. Aviation in itself is not inherently dangerous. But to an even greater degree than the sea, it is terribly unforgiving of any carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. No one understood the risk any better than Gus Grissom. He had been quoted as saying, if we die we want people to accept it. We hope that if anything happens to us it will not delay the program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. Roger Chafee had been Capcom for my first mission as flight director. I had worked with Gus and Edwitine Mercury and Gemini, but we hadn't spoken for some time except for brief phone calls or crisp debriefings after a test. Now it was too late. They were gone, and all I had was some foggy memories of three Americans who had died in the race for supremacy in space. A rational feeling or not, I felt that I had personally let down the crew of Apollo 1. But I also knew that I had to put aside these feelings and take the lead in rallying the controllers to get us moving forward again. I had seen Mueller, Lowe, and Williams get out in front and lead when we had had problems and setbacks. Now it was my turn to set an example. Monday morning, I told Hodge I was calling a 
meeting of my branch and my flight control team in the auditorium. Hodge, deeply disturbed by the fire and still searching for his own answers, agreed and expanded the meeting to include the civil servants, Filco controllers, and our spacecraft contractors. The auditorium in our office area held 250 and was half full when John and I arrived. The controllers were still in the bewildered state they had been plunged into on Friday night muted and samba, feeling, as I did, that we had failed our crew, but not knowing what to do about it. Hodge spoke first, citing the known facts of the accident, then describing the newly appointed review board and the investigating team headed by the director of the Langley Research Center, Floyd Thompson. I recognized a few of the Thompson committee members. Frank Borman, the Gemini astronaut, and Max Faget, the director of engineering, were from Master of Science, and John Williams was from the Cape launch team. When Hodge completed his briefing, I still did not know what I wanted to say as he motioned me to the microphone. Emotionally I had come out of the shock, and my feeling now was one of pure anger. Anger that we in flight control in some way had let the crew down. I climbed the four steps to the stage, looking at all those faces of people I knew so well. I wanted them. To get beyond shock, then say, as St. Peter did in one of his epistles, let us get good and angry and then let us make no mistakes. Yes, we had experienced a terrible tragedy and a devastating setback, but this was not the end. The testing and the program would go on and we were the ones who would carry it forward. It was up to us to make sure that the Apollo 1 crew had not died in vain. I started talking about me feelings, and the words finally poured out. I didn't quite know where they came from, but I spoke slowly, deliberately, and with conviction. Spaceflight will never tolerate carelessness, incapacity, and neglect. Somewhere, somehow, we screwed up. It could have been in design, build, or test. Whatever it was, we should have caught it. We were too gung-ho about the schedule and we locked out all of the problems we saw each day in our work. Every element of the program was in trouble and so were we. The simulators were not working, mission. Control was behind in virtually every area, and the flight and test procedures changed daily. Nothing we did had any shelf life. Not one of us stood up and said, Damn it, stop. I don't know what Thompson's committee will find as the cause, but I know what I find. We are the cause. We were not ready. We did not do our job. We were rolling the dice, hoping that things would come together by launch day, when in our hearts we knew it would take a miracle. We were pushing the schedule and betting that the cape would slip before we did. My remarks were received with silence, no movement, no shifting in the seats. The controllers, each and every one, knew what I meant. I was just putting their thoughts into words. From this day forward, flight control will be known by two words, tough and competent. Tough means we are forever accountable for what we do or what we fail to do. We will never again compromise our responsibilities. Every time we walk into mission control we will know what we stand for. Competent means we will never take anything for granted. We will never be found short in our knowledge and in our skills. Mission control will be perfect. When you leave this meeting today you will go to your office and the first thing you will do there is to write tough and competent on your blackboards. It will never be erased. Each day when you enter the room these words will remind you of the price paid by Grissom, White, and Chafee. These words are the price of admission to the ranks of mission control. The specific cause of the Apollo 1 fire was never identified, but the conditions that led to the fire were clear. We had a sealed cabin, pressurized with oxygen. There were extensive combustibles in the cabin, including a lot of explosively flammable Velcro. The wiring and plumbing systems were vulnerable to damage and, in retrospect, we made the wrong hatch design trade-offs. It is easy to see all of this in 2020 hindsight. Like so much in technology, there was a necessary trade-off. 
The hatch was a two-piece design. The exterior opened outward while the interior pressure hatch opened inward. It was a brute, heavy and awkward. Given the design, a rapid escape from the spacecraft was impossible. But the NASA and North American designers hadn't been as worried about escape contingencies as they were about the possibility of a hatch popping open into the vacuum of space or another inadvertent opening during a water landing. The premature opening of Gus Grissom's Mercury hatch and the loss of his capsule was a lesson not easily forgotten. A fire on the ground was considered such a remote possibility that the cabin contained no extinguisher. Even if there had been one, it probably would not have worked quickly enough in a time frame of a few seconds. Today's Halon gas full flood system might have worked. The fire involved a pure oxygen cabin atmosphere, flammable materials, and an ignition spark from somewhere in the spacecraft. Before we could fly again, we had to eliminate one or more of these elements in the interior of the spacecraft. Everyone, designers, launch team, MCC, and even the crew, had not given enough thought to what an oxygen-rich atmosphere could do, particularly in a cabin stuffed with flammable material. I worked with the controllers, assembling the data for the Thompson Committee. After putting the data together, I listened for the last time to the final minutes of the Plugs Out countdown. We took all the tapes and other records, everything from MCC and the Cape, and shipped them up to the investigating committee. Asway fought back from the tragedy, tough and competent joined with discipline and morale in defining the culture of the controllers. These words became our rallying cry. The controllers gave me a t-shirt with the words stenciled across the chest. I was proud of their gift. And proud to wear it. The ultimate success of Apollo was made possible by the sacrifices of Grissom, White, and Chafee. The accident profoundly affected everyone in the program. There was an unspoken promise on everyone's part to the three astronauts that their deaths would not be in vain. At the time of the accident, every element of the program was in trouble. The command and lunar modules were behind schedule, the software was late, and the systems were often failing during testing. The Saturn had had problems also. The second stage, SII, rocket was an engineering and production nightmare. After a second SII explosion, in ground testing, there were some contractor changes at the production and test facilities. There were recriminations, but no excuses. Engineers were having difficulty moving the leading edge technologies from the laboratory esto the production line. At North American and in the US Congress, the report. Written by General Sam Phillips before the fire raised. Questions about competence, quality, and workmanship by the manufacturer. If they sneezed, we caught the flu. Every spacecraft design change triggered more changes in mission control and in the simulators. The traffic piled up and engineers found they were making changes on changes. By late spring, however, the program emerged from the chaos of the fire. Momentum began to build again. In March 1967, the mission designations were changed. After the Apollo 1 fire, there would be no Apollo 2 or 3. Two unmanned Saturn IB flight tests, AS-201 and 202, were not redesignated with a sequence number. The next mission after those two Saturn IB flights was designated Apollo 4, the first flight of the Saturn V. For our own internal purposes, mission types were given letter designations. The controllers preferred this letter sequence since it denoted the broad objectives and was used in lieu of numerical designations. First Manned Command Service Module, CSM, Sea Manned Test of CSM and Lunar Excursion Module, LEM, D High Earth Orbit, up to 4,000 miles, and test of the CSM at lunar reentry speeds, E4 Lunar Dress Rehearsal with CSM and LEM F first lunar landing, G subsequent lunar missions H1, H2, and H3 extended lunar surface missions J1, J2, J3, and so on. The general public, of course, knows the main flights in the lunar sequence by number, G was Apollo 11, H2 the all too well named Apollo 13, and so forth. 
The summer and fall of 1967 were the busiest times I had ever known. Nothing seemed stable. Change was constant. The two certainties were that Wally Skira would fly the first manned CSM mission, and the lunar landing goal for 1969 was unchanged. We had two and a half years to pull it off. Everyone went back to the drawing board. The command module would be redesigned at a cost of $75 million, and a safer spacecraft emerged. Among the changes was a unified hatch that combined the exterior launch protective cover with the pressure hatch. The launch cover protected the CSM surface from the rocket blast when the escape tower was jettisoned during launch. The entire hatch mechanism swung out and could be opened by the crew in 10 seconds. 11. Out of the ashes. When we completed a mission, it was like putting pictures into a scrapbook and then turning to a fresh, blank page. Someday we would have the luxury of looking back and remembering all the moments captured in those earlier pages, but the press of events gave us no time to indulge in reflections, to celebrate past accomplishments, or to grieve. For a time we simply could not dare to look back at the Apollo 1 Inferno. We could only look forward to the next blank page, the next mission. But there was no way that any of us could escape those thoughts that come unbidden in the dark hours of the night, we would dream about those terrible last seconds. They would be with us forever. We would not leave the sadness behind until we accomplished what Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee wanted America to do, land. On the moon. Spaceflight forced you to live with risk by focusing on the task at hand. I would compare it to a pilot walking away from an accident, muttering, son of a bitch, that was close. Then, still shaken, he lights up a cigarette, picks up his helmet and parachute, and starts reviewing his actions and identifying what, if anything, he would do differently the next time. After hoisting a few with his squadron mates, he gets ready again to climb into his cockpit home. At mission control, certain things were understood. Every mission must achieve its objectives, and it must be accomplished on schedule if we were to keep John F. Kennedy's pledge to land a man on the moon in this decade. While we were recovering from the fire, the space scientists sponsored by NASA continued their work to develop a follow-on exploration program for the moon. I was sent to the University of California, Santa Cruz campus, in August 1967 to brief a group of government, individual, and university scientists on the Mission Control Center's mission responsibilities and on the techniques we used to develop mission rules. Preparing for the briefing in the campus library, I realized how narrow my world had become because of the intensity and isolation of my work over the last seven years. I had never been on a West Coast campus. What I saw was beyond my belief, the TV headlines coming alive. It was my first live encounter with the hippie generation. Their songs and chanted slogans dimly penetrated the library as we worked. When I left I was glad to get back to a world I understood. But would these young people comprehend the meaning of all we had been trying to accomplish for so many years, the greatest use of economic and technological power in history for peaceful purposes? The Vietnam War was only one challenge facing, and, unfortunately, dividing, our country. Countless American lives were going to be lost before that long war was brought. To an end. I honored those who served, I could not. Sympathize with those who did not honor members of their own generation, young men who were far removed from college. Campuses and demonstrations, who had no choice but to fight and be killed or maimed. I returned from that campus in California wondering what the young people I saw there would make of the legacy we were trying to pass on to them and to the rest of mankind. November 9, 1967, Apollo 4 There was little fanfare the day NASA recovered from the shock of the Apollo 1 event and resumed the space race. Arthur Hill of the Houston Chronicle reported from the Cape on the launch of the unmanned Apollo 4, the first flight test of the Saturn V, the world's mightiest rocket. It was the only machine powerful enough to launch the two Apollo spacecraft, the CSM and LM, into Earth orbit and then hurl them toward the moon. The power
Powerful engines shook the press stands, Hill's story began, rattling light fixtures and bouncing tables up and down. It was an awesome sight as brilliant yellow fire engulfed the launch pad at liftoff. This time the fire was with us. We sent Saturn into space on the most immense pillar of flame ever seen at the Cape. In mission control, all of us felt elated as America resumed its voyage to the moon. The Saturn performed perfectly, blending new and old propulsion technologies in each of its three rocket stages, then as the mission ended, the command module was hurtled earthward at 7 miles per second to test the heat shield during reentry. The Apollo 4 test, more than any other, demonstrated George Mueller's fearless all-up approach to testing. It showed that we had the right guy filling the job as NASA's boss of manned space flight. All-up meant that every element of the space system was on. Bored and operable. There were no boilerplate spacecraft. If you were successful, the concept was labeled brilliant, and you could focus your energies on the next step, the next set of unknowns. If you had problems, you found them early and somehow made time to fix them while keeping on schedule. If you failed, a lot of expensive hardware was reduced to junk and the schedule shattered. I didn't know much about the NASA hierarchy. Our administrator, Jim Webb, lived in another world, Washington DC, from whence came our funding and our mandate. Webb, boss of the whole organization during the years of Mercury, Gemini, and early Apollo, had had a long, distinguished career, including serving as director of the Bureau of the Budget and Undersecretary of State in the Truman administration. A profoundly serious man with a vigorous manner and an ability to deliver a great speech when one was required, he knew every bureaucratic pitfall there was to know and how to navigate around them, inventing new strategies as needed. He was adroit at securing funding. From an often reluctant Congress and at keeping NASA's critics at a safe distance from his people who were doing the work. His style was low-key and effective. He knew how to delegate and give people like George Mueller and George Lowe the authority they needed to achieve the goals in each mission. The miracle of the NASA rebirth after the fire was due to four of the best leaders the program ever had. George Mueller, the boss of manned spaceflight, was a modest man, trained as a research engineer, with a great feel for the complex details of operations. He provided the foundation before, during, and after the calamity, and took the heat from Congress. Above all, he stood up for his people throughout NASA and provided an unwavering direction with his ALUP test concept. In 1966, the year before the Apollo fire, Goddard Space Flight Center advised me that they were not installing consoles for controllers on the two Apollo tracking ships. GSFC, the operator of our communications network, believed that the rapid Advancements in communications technology would allow transmitting data and communications by satellite by the time the Apollo missions began. Since I had worked many shifts with the ships in Gemini, I was critically aware of the support they provided in covering key mission events and providing orbital gap coverage. I wanted a controller team aboard the ships for Apollo. I was not willing to risk the crew or mission objectives by making the MCC dependent on may happen technology. I expressed my concerns to Kraft and after a brief discussion he stated, you're going to have to convince Mueller. He considers himself a communications expert and is the only one that can turn around GSFC's decision. The following day I flew up to Washington to sell my recommendation to Mueller. This was not the first time I met Mueller. I had a lot of respect for the way he blocked for his team and took the heat when things went wrong. During a particularly rough press conference after the Gemini 9 Agena failure he sat with seven of us at the press table. Late in the conference a reporter asked, this is the fourth straight mission where you have had some major problems. When are you going to start kicking some essence that was as far as the reporter got before Mueller tore into him. He described the problems, the actions taken, then concluded with supportive remarks about his team. His vivid response brought a cheer from the other reporters. Mueller was busier than hell at NASA headquarters, trying to get the Apollo program up to speed. 
As I sat outside his office I watched grim-faced engineers and project managers carrying the bad news into his office. During the summer of 1966 the Apollo program seemed to be unraveling. I waited in the secretary's office as the time for our appointment passed and the afternoon turned into evening. About 8 p.m. he came out, apologized, and told me he had reservations for two for supper at the Georgetown Inn, so we would have our meeting there. During the meal, this man who knew more about communications technology than I ever would, listened politely as I briefed him between courses on why we needed controllers on the Apollo tracking ships. I was impressed by his patience and courtesy, the force of his technical arguments, and his willingness to consider my ideas. To this day I am awed that a man with so much weighing on his mind would spend an entire evening with somebody way down the chain of command. He listened thoughtfully and then told me to go back to Houston, he would make a decision on the following day. Early in the afternoon word came down, my argument had prevailed. GSFC was directed to place controller consoles on the tracking ships. George Lowe, the son of an Austrian immigrant, joined NASA's predecessor, Narka, after his army discharge and worked his way through the government ranks. After the Fatal accident Lowe replaced Joe Shea as the Apollo program manager. He was a master at getting people to work together, creatively channeling their energies and thus building the momentum to achieve the objective. The flight directors knew Lowe well from his middle-of-the-night visits to mission control during a flight where he sat silently in the viewing room, Lowe worked both at Master of Science and back at NASA headquarters. He had a rare blend of integrity, competence, and humility. You would do whatever he asked you to do, regardless of the odds and regardless of the risk. Rounding out the NASA management that directly affected us were Sam Phillips and Frank Borman. Phillips, an Air Force Lieutenant General, came in from the Minuteman ICBM program. He possessed an uncanny ability to spot problems, define solutions, and keep the complex development processes moving ahead. Borman, the astronaut who toughed it out on the 14 day Gemini 7 mission, was one of the most respected of the second class of astronauts. Flight controllers saw him as a table pounding let's cut out the bitching and get on with it type of guy. He was the one who finally stood up during the agonizing over the redesign of Apollo 1 and said, enough. Let's get on with the job. It's time to fly. We moved from disaster to flight in less than a year because we had leaders of this caliber and because they trusted us. In June of 1967, as Apollo forged ahead, fate reached out and grabbed me when I was made deputy to Hodge for the Flight Control Division. The division, the home base for the flight directors, controllers, and instructors, had grown to 400 personnel. Virtually every malfunction procedure, schematic, or mission rule used in training, or carried aboard the spacecraft, was produced by this division. The division planned and was now flying an average of six missions each year, a punishing load, and I was glad to give. John a hand. I also welcomed the opportunity to step into division management because of the challenge to reach beyond my experience as a flight director and start developing broader organizational skills. I believed I had the capability to do more. I immediately acquired new respect for Hodge because of his ability to perform as both division chief and flight director. To ease the burden on Kraft and Hodge, the original plan was for Lonnie, Charlesworth, and myself to work two missions, skip one, then work two more, alternating as the lead flight director for every third mission. After the fire, Kraft had his hands full leading the four divisions, flight control, landing and recovery, mission planning and analysis, and mission support in the flight operations directorate. As a result of his workload, Chris would never again sit in the chair as flight director. Now that I had moved to Hodge's deputy position, the flight director staffing changed again, looking at the workload, I decided that I could cover only about half. the missions and I changed the sequence so that I worked only the odd-numbered missions, starting with Apollo 5. Aware of the coming overload, 
Kraft selected two more flight directors, Pete Frank from Mission Planning and Milt Windler from Recovery. I believed all flight directors should be selected from the ranks of mission control and was surprised by the selection of two virtual unknowns. Since they would need time to come up to speed, I successfully lobbied Kraft to add Jerry Griffin, a top-notch Gemini controller, to the list so we could get some immediate help. Working as Hodge deputy was one of the most enjoyable times in my life. Initially, I didn't think I would make a good deputy. I am too impatient, love to work with people directly, and like to lead the charge myself. I am used to giving orders, not offering suggestions, and get impatient when I know a team can move faster. In the case of the flight control division, In 1968, it turned out that Hodge and I were a perfect fit. Where I was direct, Hodge was philosophical. Hodge studied the alternatives, I was quick to pick a direction. Our balance of temperaments allowed us to lead the division well. Hodge provided the vision, the long-term strategy, while I concentrated on the tactical. Hodge dealt with finances, I rallied the people. We both worked on the organization and structure. I liked the way John put his thoughtful comments in the flight director's logs, the way he characterized his decisions. I also enjoyed him as a person. Hodge was typically English in his approach to work, that is to say, a real gentleman. He got more done without the continual bluster of many of his peers. Above all, he had consideration for others and their opinions, which stood him well with his peers, but not necessarily his bosses. It was time to let the missions begin. The division was a powerhouse, knee-deep in talented leaders and team members. We were indeed tough, competent, and ready for Apollo. Un unmanned missions in every program are forgotten except in NASA's record books, something that annoys controllers, who know how difficult it is to control a Virgin spacecraft and booster, and operate with software all fresh off the production line. The controllers had to do the crew's job without the benefit of their presence. Using ground commands in place of the crew switches, we performed all the maneuvers and tests called for in the flight plan. Every controller loved the unmanned missions. We were the first to fly each new spacecraft. No man would fly until these missions were successful. Among the more exacting, and exasperating, tests was that of the lunar module, that bug-like frail craft that would put two astronauts on the moon while the command module circled over them in moon orbit. The LM was a two-stage spacecraft, standing 23 feet tall on four rather spindly legs. The lower or descent stage had the propulsion systems and propellant used to get the craft down to the surface of the moon. Triangular bays supported the batteries, water tanks, and helium used to pressurize the propulsion system. The landing legs supported a porch and ladder for the crew's descent to the moon. When the EVA was completed, the descent stage provided the platform for the ascent, or upper, stage's launch off the moon. The ascent stage contained the living quarters, controls, displays, and the attitude control, guidance, navigation, and radar systems used for each maneuver. The brain of the LM was housed in a state-of-the-art computer with 36,864 word fixed and 2,048 word erasable memory. This stage also contained the ascent engine, propellants, batteries, life support, and the communications and data systems. Directly over the crew's heads was the hatch that provided access, when docked, to the command module through a tunnel. Crewmen stood in the lunar module, looking forward through a small triangular window on each side, with the commander in the left and LM pilot on the right. The external skin of both stages was paper-thin aluminum, the lower stage covered by multiple layers of gold mylar insulation. You could easily poke a pencil through the side of the spacecraft. Portions of the interior were covered with netting to save weight and catch anything that might fall into nooks and crannies inside the LM. Designed to operate only outside the Earth's atmosphere, the LM looked ungainly, had no heat shield, and was incapable of safely entering the Earth's atmosphere. I was flight director for Apollo 5, the unmanned shakedown crews off the LM. 
The test plan consisted of a series of descent engine maneuvers to simulate a lunar landing, a fire in the hull abort, and a sequence of ascent engine maneuvers simulating a rendezvous of the LM with the CSM. The LM ascent engine is buried in a cavitine the top surface of the descent, landing, stage, the fire in the hole test. Fire in the hole is a term used in mining when explosives are about to be detonated, involved shutting down the descent rocket, blowing the bolts that attach the ascent and descent stages, switching control and power to the ascent stage and igniting the ascent rocket while still nestled to the landing stage, all these events occurred in fractions of a second, just as they would in a real aborted landing close to the lunar surface. The fire in the hull abort was the most critical test of the mission and one we had to accomplish successfully prior to a manned mission. On a personal level, this was the start of my journey to the lunar landing. The mission brought me face to face with the team of controllers that would take an American to the lunar surface. I dove into the mission as if it were the last one before the moon. My Apollo 5 white team was a curious mixture of youth. An experience. Jerry Bostick was breaking in a new Fido. Dave Reed, while John Llewellyn had an old grizzled World War II bomber pilot, Jim Ianson, under his tutelage. The contrast between Reed, a city slicker, quick to respond, and Ianson, a bushy mustached West Texas rancher with a slow drawl, set the extremes of the team. Jack Craven and Don Puddy were my LM Systems controllers. The mission was a flight controller's dream, consisting of a Saturn launch followed by a continuous string of eight maneuvers spread over five orbits. The entire mission was scheduled for only eight hours. If all went well, the mission would be flown totally under the command of the LM computer. This was the first mission for the new LM team and the most complex unmanned test we would ever fly. The LM's contractor, Grumman, was also new to the space program. Grumman was understandably nervous and they worked very closely with my team to get through the first flight of their frail but essential contraption. I anticipated, per Murphy's law, that if anything could go wrong it would. In the months before the first test I put heavy emphasis on making sure that if the LM automatic systems failed, the MCC team could take over and do the job. By the time we approached launch readiness, we had developed several different routes to achieve the primary mission objectives, incorporating eight ground-commanded alternates to the basic mission plan. Three days before launch I faced a new problem. Jack Craven, my LM control engineer, responsible for the guidance, navigation, attitude, and propulsion systems, had been in a traffic accident. His Volkswagen was demolished, with Craven taking the steering column in the chest, there were no broken bones, but he was beaten up. Just breathing hurt. He was unable to speak beyond a hoarse, raspy croak. With only a single team, I was faced with scrubbing the planned Apollo 5 launch. Since unmanned missions were executed by ground control, the loss of an experienced controller made us terribly vulnerable. Craven, a former Navy Hurricane Hunter, was one of the most technically qualified controllers ever to step up to a console. Older than the rest and often a bit cranky, he had come from the recovery division to flight control in order to get a piece of the action. What we didn't know at this time was that he was suffering from an increasing hearing loss. Even so, as Apollo progressed, he was given a troubleshooting job, often assigned a second man at the console for critical events. Dwight Coons, my flight surgeon, trained in medicine at the University of Toronto, volunteered to get Craven ready to fly the mission. A launch countdown is a massive undertaking, like writing the score for a symphony. Putting one together for the first time is an experience not easily forgotten. The Apollo 5 lunar module, launch support equipment, software, and procedures were exercised in an integrated fashion for the first time in a countdown demonstration on Thursday, January 18th. The one-day test stretched to almost three days and, without a gap in testing or a day's break, 
we began the launch countdown. Point one of the many things NSA operations at MCC had in common with the military was that rest was a scarce commodity. If you are standing watch and then doing ship's work at sea, you run on about six hours of sleep in 24. Same goes in intense aircraft operations or field deployment in the infantry. You learn to live with fatigue for very long periods and not let it erode your focus or dull your edge. AF launch minus one day review Dr. Coons reported that Craven could support the mission but he would be virtually immobile and have difficulty speaking. Bob Carlton drew the job of responding to Craven's grunts and mumbled comments, selecting displays, issuing commands and communicating to the control team. Bob would later become my LM control systems engineer for the lunar landing. January 22, 1968, Apollo 5 Late in in the afternoon, after a ragged countdown and six hours of delays, I finally gave the call to the test conductor, MCC is go for launch. Dr. Coons had done well. Craven was at the console in a stiff-backed chair, headset on, incredibly erect, unable to move head and body. He was a big-time coffee drinker and I knew his body was aching as much from lack of caffeine as it was from Coons's therapy. Seated next to him was Carlton, serving as his voice and hands. The stakes were high, but failure was not on my mind. We had been virtually wedded to the LM and Saturn booster for a week. The launch was smooth as Saturn. The LM, once separated from the booster, coasted through the second and into the third orbit, the control team snuggling up to their consoles. The only sound was a periodic hoarse grunt from Craven to Carlton. As the ship off the Australian coast acquired telemetry, the Capcom, Jim Fucci reported, signal strength good, mission sequence 5 queued. Clocks in sync. After a final check with his controllers, he said, flight, we're go. I acknowledged, listening as Fucci counted down the final seconds to the first test of the LM's engine. The action was about to begin. Fuji called out the final events, the computer is in control, engine arm, plus X jets firing, engine start. 10%. I instantly thought, go for it. Then Fuji suddenly called shut down. The words came almost as an expletive, something that we were not expecting. In seconds, Fuji transmitted commands to secure the system, then more commands to borrow into the guts of the LM computer to find out what had happened. We were now getting the telemetry in the MCC from Australia. After briefly assessing it, Gary Rennick, my guidance officer, came online. Flight, we had two alarms, DPS Delta V and forget it. I thought, what the hell are they? A quick check of the LM showed no apparent problems. Then Craven grunted instructions to Carlton. Precisely. Measuring his words, Carlton said, the alarm indicates that the thrust did not build up fast enough. The time set in the computer for thrust buildup was too short. We need to change the computer timer. Rennick said, that makes sense, flight. The forget IT alarm indicates that when the command was given to throttle the engine, nothing happened. I was proud of my guys. Within minutes of the alarm, they had decoded the problem caused by an Incorrect computer instruction and were moving toward an answer. The tracking station coverage was soon going to go to hell. We had only three and a half more hours before the lunar module went beyond the ground network. While the LM crossed the Pacific to the United States, we developed a plan to change the computer timer, delay the mission planner revolution, and attempt to return to automatic LM computer control. On the third pass over the states, a problem that had been previously just a nuisance now became critical. Mission control was having difficulty commanding the spacecraft. The signal strengths were so poor that it took three or four tries for each command. We quickly decided to start a go-for-broke ground command sequence on the fourth and final pass across the states. The control team struggled to get the target updates and maneuver information into the lunar module computer, punching the commands in manually from the consoles. Kraft and the Apollo program manager, George Lowe. Joined 
blinked me at the console as we rapidly discussed the options. Kraft, unfamiliar with the team's jargon, said, I don't know what you're doing, but keep it up. Good luck. Then he returned to his console behind me. Low remained at my console, asking me what I intended to do. I said, George, I am going to try a Hail Mary pass. I am going to go for the full set of objectives using manual sequences. I will have a backup if we run out of time and tracking stations. Kraft motioned Low to move away from the console and give me room to work. I said a prayer that we could get the ground commands in when needed. I was at a crossroads. I wanted to accomplish every LM test objective, but I could not risk the loss of the fire in the whole test. To hedge my bet, I set an MCC wall clock counting down to the time of the final tracking station pass where I would settle for the last ditch plan. The team's dialogue between positions in the last minutes became so rapid, crisp, and intense that I could hear Craven yelling instruction Stowe Carlton, completely ignoring his pain. Other controllers, their work done, hunched over their consoles, trying to figure out how to help us. I would select the mission sequence, the commands would be executed by Renick, my Guido, and the event calls would come from Carlton. The three of us had to be perfectly synchronized. The fact that the schedule for the lunar landing was now hanging in the balance never entered our minds. We were committed to success. We were after the whole enchilada. Time no longer had a meaning, we were locked into orbits, elapsed time, targets, and command sequences. We had to get the engine testing and the fire in the hull objective completed in the next orbit or the mission was a failure. A new problem was bugging Reed, my flight dynamics officer, as he edged up to my console. Flight, on. The next maneuver, if the engine burns too long we will. Splash the LM in the Atlantic Ocean. We have to get the engine cut off in at the right time. I nodded to Reed, silently assuring him that somehow we would get the commands to the LM to stop the burn. If it didn't, we would lose all of our flight test objectives. This was no time to take counsel of our fears. The ship off the coast of California sent a command that started the descent engine. Rennick and Carlton, in perfect sync, called out events, and times and snapped out the backup commands. The descent engine shut down after 1 minute, 20 seconds, coasted, and then restarted. As the engine continued to burn my mind clocked the objectives as each milestone passed by. The call from Carlton, fire in the hole, abort stage, we are stable, made me smile and several of the controllers gave a brief cheer. I heard Craven's chuckle over the hubbub in the room as the LM ascent engine burned briefly, then shut down as planned. Reed reported, flight. The engine shutdown occurred at the right time in orbit. The high-speed tracking indicates we have passed minimum perigee, lowest altitude point. The altitude is now increasing. You could feel the collective sigh of relief that we had not splashed into the Atlantic. A half-orbit later we commanded the final ascent engine maneuver, completing all of the LM objectives for the mission. As a result of the command problems, we had ruptured a control fuel tank blown a jet nozzle off the LM, tumbled the gyros, and expended all ascent rocket fuel. But we had satisfied all objectives in our last-ditch maneuver sequence. I was so ecstatic I felt like starting our party in mission control. As the LM left our telemetry screens, the spacecraft was heading toward its fiery reentry off the west coast of Panama. It was past midnight when we finished, but not too late to say thanks to a great bunch, young kids and two. Salty old timers. I regretted that the singing wheel was closed because of the late hour, denying me the chance to buy my team a few well earned beers. Although this was just an unmanned mission, the lunar module showed the resilience, the flexibility, the margin we would need to go to the moon. We had dodged bullets before, but this time we caught one in midair and spit it out. The morning newspapers declared, Apollo mission a success, lunar program on track. I am poor at committing to memory vast amounts of information, so I developed a series of indexed handbooks that I could refer to instantly at the console, 
these documents were my bridge to the controllers. I color-coded the books and highlighted the key constraints. By the time a flight was ready to launch, I had spent hundreds of hours with my system's handbook, mostly at night at home, long after Marta and the kids were asleep. I wanted to know. The guts of the spacecraft the way I had known about the components of the aircraft I had flown. By acquiring this knowledge in detail I was able to communicate with my system's controllers at a level deeper than the other flight directors. This enabled me to get answers faster and make decisions quickly in real time. My greatest fear approaching launch day was that I would lose one or more of my books. To assure that they were easy to find, I used pictures of various striking young women from the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition for all my book covers. The controllers knew about me book covers and, if one were missing, this virtually guaranteed a prompt return. I went back and forth daily between the office and mission control with my four large distinctively covered volumes on dermy arms. No final lunar schedule was yet in place when Kraft called a surprise staff meeting on April 8, 1968. We had flown three unmanned Apollo missions since the fire, all of them little noticed by the public and the media. At the meeting, Kraft reviewed the results of the missions up to Apollo 6, then he started to speculate on a possible alternative sequence if problems kept pushing against the timetable for the lunar landing. Finally he drove right to the core. The lunar schedule is in trouble. We must understand and fix the problems with the Saturn. Apollo 4 and 5 had gone very well, but on Apollo 6 we had first stage rocket thrust oscillations that caused the Saturn to bounce like a pogo stick. Minutes later, two of the second stage engines shut down, and when we got to orbit we could not restart the SIVB engine. Kraft then continued, the LM is overweight and the software for its computer is not ready. None of this was news to me and I wondered where he was heading. Kraft then continued, each mission in the flight sequence from now on must clearly resolve some flight unknown or add a new capability to our missions. The E-mission does not make sense to me. It only goes to a 4,000 mile apogee, highest point of the orbit. That is not high enough to check out the CSM lunar navigation and verify the navigation and tracking software we will use in the MCC during a lunar mission. If we are going to do the E-mission, I don't see why in the hell we don't go to the moon and test the techniques and software we will use for lunar navigation and tracking. The chief of mission planning, John Meyer, had been waiting for this opening. Within hours of the meeting, his conceptual flight planners were on their computers. Within a month, Meyer's team had developed a basic plan with a lunar flyby and a lunar orbit alternative. Satisfied with Meyer's planning, Kraft directed the work to continue and to be expanded to involve all of his divisions. Chris, always the master at balancing risk and building options, now had a lunar mission alternate, and, given the opportunity, I was sure he would use it. 12. The X Mission August 1968 I, I was suddenly the acting division chief for flight control. The Manned Spacecraft Center director, Dr. Robert Gilruth, concerned about the lack of planning for the post-Apollo era, assigned John Hodge to study how the Manned Spacecraft Center should be organized to meet the space programs of the future. I had my hands full juggling flight director and division chief duties when I received a call to report to Kraft's office for a one-on-one -on -one meeting on Friday morning, August 9th. I was hoping that the meeting would be short and it was. With no preamble, or even hello, Kraft announced, George Lowe wants to fly a mission to the moon this year. He believes he can have a CSM available in December. The shock on my face must have been evident as Kraft continued, George wants to drop the E-mission from the schedule and then use the Apollo 8 crew for a lunar orbit mission using the CSM from Apollo 9. Your, Apollo 9, mission will be slipped two months to get training. For Borman's crew. Kraft had accomplished much of the mission planning with the studies he had commissioned in April. Now in a gutsy move George Lowe picked up Kraft's lunar mission plan. 
Lowe saw that it provided a way to continue to move forward on the lunar landing schedule and flight test the lunar navigation and tracking while the LM program resolved its problems. The LM spacecraft deliveries were lagging due to a broad range of developmental problems. I recognized Lowe's plan as a bold move that would let us get to the moon be the most direct path and buy us some badly needed schedule time, provided it worked. Kraft asked me to give him a list of the minimum number of people needed to assess the plan. After reflecting a few moments I gave him names of five controllers. Kraft's response was succinct, we don't need to get the training, booster, or LM people involved yet. Let's keep it to Bostick and Aldrich. Jerry Bostick and Arnie Aldrich were flight controllers in my division. I'm flying to Huntsville with Lowe and Slayton this afternoon to see if they can get a Saturn ready for the mission. We need to get Marshall Center leadership behind the plan. As he motioned me out of the office he concluded, I will need your assessment by Monday if not earlier. Keep this under your hat. I walked away thinking that weren't her. Von Braun's Germans and my trajectory team were in four. One hell of a surprise. I had mixed emotions returning to my own office. I am conservative in my planning and had long believed in a thoroughly planned and incremental approach to the lunar goal. Personally, I believed the best track to reach the moon was the current sequence. Lowe's plan would heighten the risks, but by moving ahead on several fronts at once, it would buy us time. On his return Friday night from Alabama, Kraft, with Lowe, called the flight designer, Bob Ernell, and Jim Stokes, the computer boss, to his office and got right to the point. I need launch window data for a December lunar mission, and I need it by Monday morning. With no hesitation, Ernell replied, I'll need all the computers in buildings 12 and 30, and I'll need them through the weekend. Kraft turned to Stokes and ordered him to give Bob everything he needed to do the job. It wasn't going to be easy to carry out Kraft's new marching orders, but Apollo succeeded at critical moments. Like this because the bosses had no hesitation about assigning crucial tasks to one individual, trusting his judgment, and then getting out of his way. In 1968 computers were still incredibly slow by today's standards. We sometimes needed a run of six to eight hours to come up with a single answer. Computer data entry was time-consuming and the complexity of the data entry often introduced errors in the data input, the long running time and the drain on the memory often resulted in the machine crashing just before it could crank out the answer. With four mainframe computers at his disposal running around the clock, Anul was barely able to generate the mission data. Emerging in the early hours Monday morning, he provided Kraft with options for an Atlantic Ocean splashdown in November. December 1968, and January 1969, and a single Pacific Ocean launch window from December 20 to 27, 1968. Early Saturday morning, I received a call to attend another meeting with Kraft. His secretary had already called a half dozen new principals, including Bostick and Aldrich. The meeting was again short, Kraft indicated that MSFC was studying Lowe's plan and that he needed a commitment from his four divisions in two days. Leaving the meeting, Aldrich and Bostick were on top of the world, unable to believe their luck, they were going to lead the planning for the first lunar mission. We were fully aware of the intense workload ahead, and the reshuffling of priorities and the risks that we had to address. Our decision processes might seem unstructured and extemporaneous, but those involved, even the very young, had the requisite experience and were masters at the art of risk judgment. All were acutely aware of the consequences of failure. The teamwork used to respond to changes and problems during a mission is the same used to respond to planning actions before the mission. Our technique assured a rapid, competent, and multidisciplinary response. Working and weekends had become a habit, at least a half day just to catch up and get ready for the training or testing every Monday. Bostick made a few phone calls when he returned to his office. When you received a call from work on a weekend you dropped what you were doing and just reported in. 
A half hour later as three controllers walked into his office Bostick began, a few of us just had a meeting with Kraft. George Lowe wants to go to the moon this December. By Monday, Kraft wants to know whether we can do it or not. A full-scale debate erupted, geese, Jerry, we've never been out of Earth orbit before. We don't even know if we can compute a lunar injection maneuver. Christ, we don't even know if the booster guidance can do the job. Unruffled, Bostick rolled on, I want you to get together a small team of the best people you have, give them the job, and turn them loose. I need an answer by Monday. Bostick then turned to Chuck Dieterich, a young, thin, lanky Texan with a Pancho Villa mustache. Chuck, he said, I've tagged you as the lead retro for the first lunar mission. You will have my full support. Dieterich, a specialist in reentry trajectories, had never worked a manned mission. He was momentarily overwhelmed by his new role. His other two teammates would be his section and branch bosses, who would be working for him. Such was flight control in the final year before the lunar landing. Assignments and opportunities came like a lightning flash. There were no precedents, no guidelines. All of a sudden you were given a job and you just did it whatever it took. A lunar trajectory consists of a string of maneuvers, one to leave Earth orbit, several to adjust the trajectory en route to the moon, and then two maneuvers to enter lunar orbit. The return to Earth requires another maneuver that is again adjusted during the return. At the time Kraft asked us for a decision we did not have integrated trajectory software, no maneuver in this sequence had yet been fitted end to end with any other. Kraft was in his element Monday morning as he assembled the pieces of the plan, weighed the alternatives, and sorted out his options. Bostick said, Chris, if the MCC support team can get the lunar programs into the computers, I don't see any reason why we can't do it. I gave Kraft the go for my division and finished with the staffing plan for the flight directors and the control teams. The group then selected the week of December 20th as the launch window. This meant a CSM end of mission landing in the Pacific Ocean. This was a major early decision, the Navy could cover only one Oceanus the primary landing area. Once the decision was made, we had to live with it for the rest of the Apollo program. The Pacific gave us the promise of a large ocean target and warmer, calmer waters, or so we hoped. The Navy liked the decision and began planning for operations from Pearl Harbor. To keep this mission clearly separated from the current plans, I designated Apollo 8 as the X mission. Until the mission was approved, we had to keep all mission data for the originally planned E mission. The X mission was now joining the ranks of the Gemini for Space Walk, the Gemini 76 Rendezvous, and Mueller's all up Saturn test concept as examples of the high risk, high gain leadership we had in the 1960s. The decision to go to the moon with Apollo 8 was made before we had ever flown a manned Apollo spacecraft. The X mission meetings occurred daily, each one pounding another element of the plan into place. By August the 16th, one week later, the team had expanded and for the first time I felt I was dealing from a full deck. We were continually admonished to keep what we were doing a secret, but it was like hiding an elephant in your bathtub. The constant closed door huddles, the changing work priorities, and the longer hours gave us away. A press conference was held on August 19 to announce the official changing of the mission sequence, moving Frank Borman's crew into the December launch slot and formally designating the mission Apollo 8. The announcement described this as a high Earth orbital mission, with a lunar option. It took only a few seconds for the press to figure out what the plan really was. Kraft wanted to use Lunny, Charlesworth, and me for both Apollo 7 and 8. I advised him I intended to stay with the current lead flight director assignments, shifting Charlesworth forward to cover the Apollo 8 mission. In the fall of 1968, I was like a guy juggling grenades wrapped in barbed wire. I was grappling with my new duties as acting division chief. I discovered there is a hell of a difference between being a deputy and being 
with the boss. Now I had to cope with politics, budgets, job assignments, and direction of an organization of 400 amid the rapidly evolving flight program. I didn't know it at the time while I was working as Hodge deputy, but Chris and he had had disagreements on a number of policy issues. I believed that Chris thought John was too conservative to be a flight director. Looking back, I see why Hodge let Maroon flight control. I suspect he felt that his days as a division chief were numbered. My salvation was Hodge's former secretary, Lois Ransdale. Lois adopted me into the office and showed me the ropes. Lois was precise and direct, and had a fiercely protective attitude about her division. She became my trusted adjutant, the guardian of the office door and my schedule. Years later, she was given an honorary flight director title, selecting the color pink. In the history of flight control, only two others, Bill Tyndall and John O'Neill. My deputy director during the shuttle era have been awarded this recognition. All around us, the tumult of the 1960s continued. The war in Vietnam had intensified. Television brought the casualties into our homes at night, but we did not yet realize we were losing. Campuses across the land were seething as students protested the war and marched for civil rights. Race riots had broken out in major cities in the summer of 1967. Then, after Martin Luther King was shot and killed on April 4, 1968, there were riots in more than a hundred cities. In June Robert F. Kennedy was killed while campaigning for the Democratic nomination for president. Even the space program was picketed and bomb threats were reported. Everything we carried into the Mission Control Center was inspected. Security guards roamed our parking lots during missions. We practiced bomb threat evacuations from Mission Control, always leaving a small team to hold the fort if we had a crew aloft. These events provided a violent background to our final charge to reach. The Moon. Fortunately, the public's support for the Lunar program remained high. Apollo was a bright glow of promise in a dark and anxious era. Apollo 7 would be the first manned Apollo mission, and the shakedown crews for the redesigned command and service module. Each of the spacecraft systems would be tested in flight, the recorded data analyzed by both controller and engineer during the only flight test to qualify the CSM before actually going to the moon. Wally Skira, Walt Cunningham, and Don Isley had been assigned as the backups for the ill-fated Apollo 1 two months prior to the pad accident. Now it was their turn to fly after nearly three years of training. Skira, the first astronaut to fly all three programs, was the veteran whose cool performance during the Gemini 6 pad shutdown and whose almost fanatical preparation for missions put him high in the ranks of those regarded. As heavy hitters by the controllers. Worley, ever caustic, never kept his opinions to himself. While preparing for the mission, he let it be known that he was damned unhappy with the inclusion of the TV camera in the spacecraft and the planned dog and pony shows that would be broadcast from the command module. He considered it an invasion of the privacy of the crew and the sanctuary of the spacecraft. But Kraft was equally adamant that the American public, which was underwriting the program, get an opportunity to see space flight in action through these live video broadcasts. The TV Camera 1 October 11, 1968, Apollo 7 returned to manned flight testing. A launch countdown takes two days. When it starts, there is relief because the tedium of the training period is over. Once launched, the only option is to move forward, facing problems, identifying solutions, forging ahead. A flight control team is an elite force, playing in a sort of Super Bowl with each mission. The real difference, of course, is that we are not playing a game and Lucin just never an option. If Apollo 7 succeeded, we would be on schedule for the lunar landing. If we failed, the chances were high that there would be no lunar landing before the decade ended. During the final hours before launch, 
Every engineer in the program has the right to voice any and all concerns he might have by sending last-minute memos and making phone calls to tell the flight team what worries him about some aspect of testing or some unexplained glitch. The maiden launch of a manned spacecraft brings many systems online for the first time. We were given a lot to worry about from the new North American engineers. The launch team attempts to give us a perfect system for liftoff. But no matter how hard they try, with thousands of components, 850 crew controls and displays, and 350 telemetry measurements, there is no such animal as a perfect spacecraft. We always have some glitches, some uncertainty, the same can be said for the MCC ground system. We had our share of hiccups. The greatest focusing mechanism in the space program was the countdown. Clear, crisp, and unequivocal decisions had to be made during the final hours and minutes. As the count progressed, people in each area of the program came forward. After assessing the technical issues, all made their calls. Everyone swallowed some problems, bit their own bullets. Launch day was like a fresh start, a new day, and I loved it. My team started the countdown and checked out the MCC, then handed over to Griffin's team for the CSM and Saturn systems testing. Lunny picked up for the launch, the handoffs between the three teams going flawlessly. Shortly after 10 a.m. in Houston, the race to the moon got the wave from the starting flag. The launch went smoothly, the Saturn rocket blasting the CSM into a low Earth orbit. To television viewers, as the engines ignited, there appeared to be one heart-stopping moment of hesitation. But because Apollo and its two-stage launch rocket weighed 1.3 million pounds, the launch acceleration was gradual, taking 10 seconds to clear the tower. The late morning liftoff dictated the orbital shift schedule. Lunny's team, with all the crewmen generally awake, worked the day shift. I had the swing shift with Don Isley on watching the spacecraft, and Griffin got the graveyard shift, staying in touch with Wally Skira and Walt Cunningham. Skira had set up a duty watch on board the command module, so that an astronaut would be awake throughout the entire mission. This plan was counter to the experience we had in Gemini and none of the flight directors thought Wally's watch was a good idea. It was tough enough to sleep the first days in space and if someone is awake, rustling around or communicating, it is impossible. Glenn Lunny had handed my team a clean spacecraft at the beginning of the sixth revolution. The trajectory experts in the trench worked the maneuver sequence to set up a rendezvous with the Saturn IVB booster on Lunny's morning shift. The CSM was trouble-free, so my principal concern was a report by our weatherman that a low-pressure system was developing off Cuba, 750 miles south and east of Houston. With Houston's proximity to the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico, a hurricane could make it toughen mission control. A half hour before we were to hand over the controls to Griffin's gold team, Skira said, Houston, I have developed a head cold and have taken two aspirin. I've gone through eight or nine Kleenexes with some pretty good blows. I'm thinking about taking a decongestant or antibiotic. My team surgeon recommended the decongestant only. took him to the press conference at 2 a.m. and was surprised by the large turnout. The doctor turned out to be the star of the show and, with few problems on the spacecraft, Skira's cold, the first space illness, made the headlines of newspapers across the country and grabbed time on the network telecasts. At liftoff, three flight tests remained before Apollo would go for the lunar landing. We had a lot to get done. The flight control team tracked each objective and added new ones to exploit each opportunity. With a single shot to qualify a spacecraft, little was left to chance. The Apollo 7 flight plan was incredibly precise, breaking objectives down and literally keeping each minute and second chock full of activity. The mission objectives are listed in a thick manual that spells out every detail of the required test. The flight plan was designed to cover all of these objectives, and if some weren't accomplished, they 
would be added to the workload of the next flight. As the flight progressed, the test results we received led us to update the flight objectives, add new tests, or modify existing ones. It always has been this way in spaceflight and will continue to be as long as missions are measured in days and weeks. Skira knew the lunar game plan and understood that we had a lot to get done before we could take the next spacecraft to the moon. As the mission continued, Morley's cold was as much a test of the flight control team as was flying the mission. The flight directors were hard-pressed to satisfy a cranky Skira and push ahead to clear the deck for the next mission. There was little that pleased Skira about what we were doing at MCC, and the discomfort and irritability caused by his cold soon made him pretty testy with Cunningham and Isley as well. Glyn Lunny, in particular, always seemed to be at the helm when Worley was testy with the ground team. By the midpoint of the mission, I realized how lucky I was to be working the night shift. The video reports, Cervento 11 minutes long, had caught the public's fancy. They were dubbed the Wally, Walt, and Don Show and aired once each morning during the Apollo Pass between Corpus Christi, Texas, and Cape Kennedy, the only two ground stations equipped to pick up the transmissions. By the third day, Skira cancelled the daily TV broadcast with a clipped, no further discussion. We were left with the task of convincing a skeptical press that all was well between the operations team and the crew. Deke Slayton, embarrassed by Skira's outburst regarding the telecasts, murmured on the voice com, Christ, Wally, all you gotta do is flip a switch. By the fifth day, the headline in the Houston Chronicle declared, Captain Awakes Grumpy. The press started getting in their licks and the controllers counted the days until we could get a new crew. None of the mission rules discussed dealing with a grumpy commander. Skira finally relented on the broadcasts, and at one point the astronauts, trying to make amends, held up crudely lettered signs that read, Hello from the lovely Apollo room, high atop everything. With Skira and Cunningham asleep, my team would listen to Isley talking in a hushed voice from his astronomy lab on high. He identified the stars and remarked on the vista from his platform as his partners, the Sleeping Beauties, rested. With the lunar mission scheduled less than two months away, we started releasing our backup computers to the mission designers during the day to check out the new trajectory software coming online. At night, with the Apollo 7 crew asleep, Charles Worth, using the same backup computers, started launch abort training one floor above us for Apollo 8. Meanwhile the low-pressure area had turned into a hurricane, crossed Cuba, and entered the Gulf. We were still keeping a close watch, but it appeared the full force would hit the Mississippi and Alabama coastline and not Houston. But I developed a contingency plan for the control center if the storm moved farther west. Skira continued to make life difficult and by the seventh day of the mission, both Kraft and Slayton were involved full-time, now arguing with Worley over an unsuited reentry. Skira had been taking his shots freely at the controllers, but I was amazed when he started zinging Kraft and Slayton. With a head cold, ear blockage during entry would be annoying at best, and at worst, painful and potentially disabling. If the astronauts re-entered without their helmets they could pinch their nose and blow to try and clear the ear blockage. This is the technique used to clear ears when descending in an aircraft. The designers, however, pressed for a suited reentry in case of a sudden loss of cabin pressure. It was one of the classic risk. Trade-offs we run during a mission, but this time the argument was going public. While the bosses argued with Skira on the voice com, the teams continued grinding away with the planning, chalking off the objectives, patiently explaining each and every funny to the crew as we were able to develop answers. Controllers use the term anomaly or funny to describe something in the CSM or LM systems operations that is not as expected. Every item of this nature is logged and pursued until it is understood, and each is discussed extensively with the crew. Lunny set a standard for every future flight director, giving real meaning to the word discipline in the flight controller's vocabulary. Refusing to rise to the bait of Skira or the press, he kept the flight directors and teams on track. Two days before reentry, 
After a series of flight plan updates, the mild-mannered Isley got into the act and complained about a flight plan maneuver update. I want to talk to the man or whoever it was, he said, that thought up that little gem. That one really got us. When Jack Swigert, the Capcom, one of the fifth class of astronauts selected in 1966 responded, okay, Don, Skira cut in, I have had it up here today and, from now on, I am going to be an onboard flight director for these updates. We are not going to accept any new games like adding 50 feet to the velocity for a maneuver, or doing some crazy test we never heard of before. Prior to a mission the velocity for each maneuver is specified in the flight plan, but as the mission goes forward the delta-v, change in velocity, is updated to trim the orbit for reentry, as well as to set up daylight conditions at landing. Lunny's log said it all, refer to the crew voice transcript, I can't stand to write it. The handover for the first time indicated his frustration. I have finally had enough of this crew. In the final days of the mission, the control teams, Capcoms, and flight directors, covering four. Wally felt like embarrassed parents of a kid throwing a tantrum. In retrospect, some of the exchanges seem sophomoric, except that the stakes were high and discipline and teamwork were victims of this feuding. I regretted it and still do, partly because the pettiness that crept into the mission obscured the fact that Apollo 7 was carrying on with the task that was interrupted by the Apollo 1 fire a task that had been left unfinished for nearly two years, and one we owed to Grissom, White, and Chafee. My tenth and final shift passed peacefully. Griffin knew that Skira had been counting the hour till his return to Earth and was ready to come home. At crew wake up on his final shift, Griffin as a joke threatened to keep them up another four days to equal the American space flight duration record set during Gemini. The crew, of course, vetoed the idea, and then Griffin handed them over to Lunny to bring them home, after eleven days. Despite all the interpersonal static, Apollo 7 did the job. Only 26 discrepancies were detected in flight. Over half were related to the instruments and communications. This was America's second longest manned space flight, and the command and service module checked out beautifully. I never figured out why Skira had such a burr under his saddle. Perhaps he just could not deal with the irritation of having something as piddling as a cold invade the trip of a lifetime. In any case, the careers of two younger astronauts suffered. Neither Cunningham nor Isley flew in space again. The control team cheered when Lunny later received a medal for the mission from President Johnson at the LBJ Ranch. His performance went well above and beyond the call of duty. Three years later, when we designed the emblem of the flight control team, we remembered our best days with Skira. As the central theme of the controller's patch, we used the Sigma from his Mercury spacecraft, representing the unbreakable link between the crew and ground. We made our peace with the grumpy commander. 13. The Christmas Story The successful Apollo 7 flight cleared the way for us to land on the moon in the coming year. A lot of flight and ground testing remained, and I was sure that there would be surprises but we had developed the momentum required to pull off a miracle. Our greatest worry was that we had to complete three virtually flawless missions and achieve every major test objective before we could shoot for the lunar landing. I didn't think much about the odds, but since every mission would be a first, the odds had to be stacked against our success. In the late 1960s our simulation technology had progressed to the point where it became virtually impossible to separate the training from the actual missions. The simulations became full dress rehearsals for the missions down to the smallest detail. The simulation tested the crew's and controller's responses to normal and emergency conditions. It checked out the exact flight plan, mission rules, and procedures that the crew and controllers would use for the flight. The problems thrown at the controllers and crew by the SimSup, simulation supervisor, prepared them for the real crises that might come in any phase off the mission from launch to splashdown. Simulation attempted to make events that could 
happen in real time, malfunctions in any one of the many spacecraft systems, trajectory problems, or failure in the ground systems as realistic as possible. With hundreds of possible malfunctions and many time-critical mission events, the training opportunities were limited only by the hours and weeks available to train. We simulated every mission phase in a variety of normal and emergency conditions. By the time the training period for a mission ends, the astronauts and the MCC teams must be thoroughly familiar with the pre-mission plan. They must know what should happen and be capable of making a correct decision to continue the planned mission or execute a mission abort under any set of circumstances. A lunar mission consists of a series of time-critical maneuvers strong end-to-end. -end. Two and one-half hours after the Saturn liftoff from the Cape the lunar phase of the mission normally begins with the translunar injection, TLI. Maneuver. Midway through the second revolution in Earth. Orbit the Saturn IVB stage is reignited, increasing its velocity from 25,500 to 35,500 feet per second. After SIVB engine cutoff, the CSM separates from the booster rocket. The velocity from the TLI maneuver places the spacecraft into an orbit 250,000 miles high with the moon at the highest point of the orbit. The next phase of the mission is Kala Translunar Coast, TLC and lasts about three days. Small maneuvers are performed during this period to trim the trajectory to pass 60 miles in front of the moon three days after the TLI maneuver. 52 hours into this period, the CSM leaves Earth's gravitational field and enters the lunar gravitational field. During the TLC phase the mission control center is in continuous communication with the crew. Three days after liftoff the astronauts perform the lunar orbit injection, LOI, maneuvers with the CSM service, main, propulsion system engine. LOI consists of two maneuvers. That place the CSM into a 60-mile circular orbit. Around the moon. After the lunar phase of the mission is completed, the CSM service propulsion system is again used for trans-Earth injection, TEI. The return period is called the trans-Earth coast, TEC, and takes about 60 hours prior to reentry into the Earth's atmosphere and splashdown. Eight days after Apollo 7 returned to Earth, Charles Worth and his green team began the first lunar mission simulations. The post mission assessment gave the command module a solid go. The next spaceship, in a schedule based almost entirely on gut instinct, would go to the moon in less than 60 days. way approached the lunar prize, NASA's future was far from certain. Starting in 1967, Congress had made significant budget cuts in the manned programs and shortly after the Apollo 7 landing they announced there would be no space program beyond the Apollo application program, a planned minispace station that would use Apollo hardware. Responding to the uncertainty about our future direction, Master of Science Director Dr. Gil Ruth established an advanced programs organization element within the Master of Science, which reported directly to him. Since John Hodge had been outspoken about NASA's lack of planning for the future, Gil Ruth selected him to lead the effort. Hodge's new job was to seek out new NASA opportunities in space, develop a rigorous and logical program plan for the future, and establish a more businesslike structure for NASA. With Hodge moving into his new job I officially became the Chief of the Flight Control Division, FCD, the administrative home for the majority of the MCC flight. Controllers. I reported to Kraft as one of his four division chiefs. The FCD included the MCC flight directors, assistant flight directors, trajectory controllers, the trench, booster and spacecraft systems engineers, science and procedures officers, and the simulation instructors, Simsup and his team. 16 of the 21 controllers normally present in the main control room, as well as Simsup and his team, were provided by the division. The FCD comprised seven branches and two small groups corresponding to the major MCC operations functions and had about 300 personnel. The operations branches were flight dynamics, trajectory, 
CSM and LM systems, experiments, mission simulation, flight control, and a requirements branch that assured the MCC configured correctly for simulations and missions. The flight directors and booster engineers from Marshall were two small groups at my staff level. The FCD controllers developed the mission strategy, performed pre-mission planning, developed CSM, LM, and experiment schematics and troubleshooting procedures. They wrote the mission rules, supported the design and checkout of the spacecraft and MCC, and performed the integrated crew controller training. With the exception of the headquarters mission director and mission scientist the remaining MCC controllers were provided by other organizations at the Master of Science. While Charlesworth and Lunny pulled together the teams for the lunar mission, I started preparing with my team for Apollo 9. Mission planning and preparation takes about one year, with the final training starting about three months before launch. The objectives for each mission were vastly different from the preceding mission and now, with the launches spaced at two-month intervals, every flight director and controller was working several missions simultaneously, constantly juggling schedules and priorities. The workload was punishing. 60 to 70 hour work weeks became commonplace. From the early days of space virtually all of the trajectory data coded in the MCC originated from the Mission Planning and Analysis Division, MPAD. MPAD consisted of several hundred mathematicians and scientists, supported by a large array of high-tech contractors, John Meyer was the boss and Bill Tyndall was the deputy. In late 1968, Tyndall was reassigned as a staff engineer for George Lowe. In the restructuring after the fire, Lowe gave Tyndall the task of uniting the entire Apollo team, civil servants and contractors into a working group to determine how to use the hardware and software most effectively to achieve each mission's objectives. Tyndall's genius was his ability to focus on issues and coax diverse people to work together. He combined the friendliness of a puppy with a comic wit. His operational intelligence was brilliant. We formed a particularly strong bond, and our families spent a lot of time together at his beach house. Although our technical backgrounds were very different, we were both emotional about our work, perpetually optimistic, and gave our people unconditional support. Bill Tyndall swung into the Apollo 8 mission with zest, resolving issues from the simplest to the difficult. While he was slugging it out with Skira on Apollo 7, Tyndall was holding daily meetings to work out how we would navigate to the moon, and how to get into and out of lunar orbit. Allegiance to Tyndall did not come easy for the trench. For a while, Bostick's team believed that Tyndall was really doing their job. Bostick's deputy, Phil Schaffer, and Llewellyn complained about these turf issues, while Tyndall tried patiently and persistently to gain their support. By the time of Apollo 8, however, the trench had become Tyndall's most zealous group of converts, actively supporting, debating, and testing his plans, carrying into the training his decisions and mission rules. We were, in a sense, in a race against ourselves, every event and decision converging on the launch date. Tyndall was unsinkable. Only a month away from the Apollo 8 launch, he was still arguing with Frank Borman on the best way to navigate the return journey from the moon. Tithe men of the trench, Apollo 8 was the mission, it would be their greatest achievement. Living in the world of pure mathematics, they were the first generation fully at home with computers, incredibly young. Dreamers and visionaries who were venturing in their imaginations and theories with the crew into the unknown, working at the very edge of our knowledge and primed to overcome any difficulties that came their way. Their work, coded into computers and plotted in piles of charts and graphs littering their consoles, was the foundation for every computer instruction in the Saturn rocket and aboard the spacecraft. The trench and the trajectory designers were totally dependent on the millions of lines of code that they wrote in a variety of computer languages such as Kubel and HAL. These computations would hurl the Saturn toward the moon, and then would swing the CSM into lunar orbit. Apollo 11 would be the flight for the ages, but Apollo 8 was a very big leap that drew on one spiritual and moral resolve. 
For us it would become the second greatest Christmas story ever told. Think about the imagery of a rocket soaring through limitless space, so close to heaven the passengers could reach out and touch the face of God. After the methodical intensity of the testing, the frequent crisis meetings, the incessant intrusion of the media, and the briefings of just one more VIP, the last couple of days before launch always seemed strange. All of a sudden time and motion stopped. As it seems to honor ship caught in the doldrums. I initially welcomed this brief and strange interlude preceding each mission as the final time to catch a breath. Then as the clock kicked over into the last 24 hours, the minutes seemed to hang. This was my first mission as FCD chief. Success belonged to the team, failure was ultimately my responsibility. Even though I was not flying this mission, I went through the same emotional and physical process as my controllers. It was tough to stay away from the control center and stay out of the way of the guys doing the job especially during the final hours before Apollo 8. The team understood my anxiety and called me to report, the count is on schedule and they are in fueling. Why don't you have a beer and get some sleep? We'll call if anything comes up. The evening before the launch of Apollo 8, a visitor arrived whose presence told you something powerful, something historic, was taking place. He was Charles Lindber. He belonged to a more romantic time, when flight was still more an art than a science. His career and his life created a kind of vapor rail that stretched. Across the years, Lindbergh was with us, as he should have been, when Americans reached for the moon, so long the object of man's curiosity and dreams. Perhaps more than anyone in the history of flight, he had inspired human beings to explore the skies above them. Commandingly tall, his hair gray and his manner both reserved and modest, he was an honored guest at the invitation of Wally Skira at a very private party given for the astronauts and a few of their friends. The plane lined Burr flew from New York to Paris in 1927 was powered by a single engine. Lined Burr had sailed through uncharted skies, hacking it out, as Wally put it, with the most primitive of technical equipment. No radio, no radar, a windshield a bird could break. Lined Burr's presence was a kind of laying on of hands. I felt that he had handed the stick and rudder over to the astronauts. December 21, 1968, Apollo 8 The green team started arriving at Mission Control two hours after midnight. Cliff Charlesworth was at the flight director's console, backed up by a group of trench controllers barely out of college. To a great extent, this was their show. For the first time, man would leave the Earth's gravity and be captured by the gravity of another heavenly body. The trench would Provide the guidance and navigation. Working closely throughout the early morning hours with John Meyer's mission planners, they fine-tuned their equipment, their techniques, and themselves. Mission control is a big, big space, but there is no room in it for ego, only for flawless teamwork. Sitting in the control center and surrounding buildings were a bunch of very nervous designers, engineers, and computer programmers. All of their work since Kennedy's speech in 1961 was about to be tested. Every assumption, trade-off, and decision they made in creating the system was about to be put on the line. They were threading the needle, shooting a spacecraft from a rotating Earth at the leading edge of the moon, a moving target a quarter of a million miles away, passing 60 miles in front of it three days after launch. Buried in the dungeons of the auxiliary computing room was Holbeck an early entrant to the space task group. Now he was the chief of the lunar mission design. His work. Of almost a decade was about to come to fruition. This was payback for the years of freezing at his desk, thermostats turned down to cool the computers in their office complex. Wrapped in sweaters with a heater at his feet in the midst of a broiling Houston summer, Hal represented the labor, the frustration, and the exuberance of almost eight years of work by the mission planners. Chances are you have never heard of Holbeck, who grew up, as many of us did, believing in Buck Rogers. He was one of the unsung heroes of Apollo, of whom there were many. 
It may not stretch the truth to say that without the likes of him we would not have made it to the moon. The next morning, shortly after dawn, I found myself in mission control, wearing a green vest hand tailored by Marta, on occasion I wore a vest the color of the other leads for their flights. In the trench, Fido J. Green, Retro Chuck Dieterich, and Grand Pauls, the Guido, were racing the clock. The three had joined flight control after Gemini and had grown in their skills during the Apollo unmanned missions. Green and Pauls flew their first manned mission on Apollo 7. When the countdown resumed after the planned hold, Jay Green finished configuring his displays for launch. After he gave the command, flight, Fido is go for launch, he muttered a silent prayer that it all worked. In mission control, for a few moments, time seemed suspended, everything happening in slow motion. Then in a collective fashion, the momentum built and mission control surged forward. Today we would go to the edge of the moon. It was at moments like this that we counted on Captain Refsmat, our imaginary mascot. In the trench a Refsmat is shorthand for reference to stable member matrix, a set of equations used among controllers, crews, and flight designers as the mathematical means to determine angles with reference to navigational stars. It is the one constant that ties together all of the other. Reference systems used during a mission, often as simple as a line drawn from the center of the Earth through the launch pad. With data from navigational stars and a refs mat, the crew can determine the spacecraft's position and velocity in space with the spacecraft computer. The guidance officer at the control center is the keeper of the refs mats during the mission, synchronizing the ground and spacecraft updates so that the computations will always agree. The captain was born during a discussion between John Llewellyn and a newcomer to the flight dynamics branch. Standing by the coffee pot, the rookie asked Llewellyn the name of a controller who had just placed an IOU in the cup next to the pot. Llewellyn responded instantly, Sheet, man, that's Captain Refsmat, the ideal flight controller. He's the best we've ever had in the trench. The new guy nodded knowingly, glad to pick up the name. his new working partners, especially one considered the model for the trench. Ed Pavelka, a gifted FIDO of the Gemini era, heard off Llewellyn's joke and decided to sketch a picture of Captain Refsmat for the branch. Within days, a two-foot cartoon was hanging in his office. Almost immediately, ideas from other trench inhabitants poured in and Captain Refsmat was outfitted in the tools of his trade. He wore a pot helmet with a hinged top opening to a radar antenna and truth-seeking glasses with a black line inscribed across the lens showing the correct deorbit attitude. He had a supply of Refsmats in a pouch on his belt and a variety of awards and decorations, consistent with his august status as the ideal controller. The captain was a patriot. He wore a crisp military jacket with captain's bars on the lapel and a pair of khaki shorts. With knobby knees, tennis shoes, and a broad military brassard, he was an apt replica. Of the ideal. For all of the things wrong in the. World. Captain Refsmat stood for what is right. Pavelka hung the cartoon on a grey metal locker in the hallway, and within days graffiti started to appear expressing the various controllers' thoughts, opinions, gotchas. Over the weeks and the months, the graffiti provided an outlet for the working guys' feelings about their work, their bosses, and life in general. Captain Refsmat lived in flight control during the Apollo and Skylab years. He flew our missions, earning his medals for tough assignments and new worlds he had conquered. Today he was the fourth member sitting with the trajectory team in the trench. At 6.51 a.m. Central Standard Time, less than an hour after dawn, Apollo 8 lumbered skyward with Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and William Anders on board. The Earth Orbital Checkout and maneuver injecting the spacecraft onto a lunar trajectory was uneventful. I was just an observer for this mission but I remember the feelings of pride and relief the instant the Apollo 8 crew left Earth for the moon. After the launch, my feelings hit a new peak when the translunar injection time came and went. Then when I heard the crew report the maneuver's completion, it really hit me. 
I had to get up and walk outside because I was so happy I was crying. Being a bystander in mission control is tough and doubly tough on a flight director and new division chief who had nothing to do except wait and hope and pray. Observer status for me was a living hell. I never liked the viewing room, which was reserved for families, politicians, and the wheeler dealer contractors. I have never felt comfortable with the high rollers, so if I was not on a console I roamed the back rooms, looking for a place to plug in my headset. Apollo 8 was one of the best spacecraft ever produced. By North American. The system's controllers continually searched their telemetry for the slightest fault, constantly reassuring themselves and their flight directors that, no, flight, we don't have. Any funnies? On the second manned flight of the CSM, only seven spacecraft discrepancies were noted. None was major. In the early afternoon of December 23rd, after a brief countdown, a mission control wall clock clicked over to 00 000 000, all balls in the controller's idiom and civilization crossed another boundary. Now only 30,000 miles from the moon the Apollo 8 crew had left Earth's gravity field. At 2.29 p.m. Central Standard Time, mankind for the first time was captured by the moon's gravity. The celebration was brief, the pressure mounting, the controllers were already computing the critical lunar orbit insertion maneuver to be executed in 14 hours. During their journey, the crew had not seen the moon, trusting the computations developed by the trench. The two mid-course corrections set the conditions for the precise point and time to enter lunar orbit. The numbers were flawless, and as the early afternoon passed in Houston the tension mounted. The two mid-course maneuvers had nailed the final trajectory and Capcom Jerry Carr's call, you'll go for lunar orbit insertion, did not surprise the crew. The spectators in the viewing room hunched forward and the usual buzz of communication ceased. Borman had maneuvered Apollo to the burn attitude. In the control room, the computers had been rechecked and the pregnant waiting continued, with brief moments of banter. As the final minutes counted down, Cigarette smoke hovered above the consoles, the room silent. Apollo 8 you're looking good, good all the way, 10 seconds to loss of signal. After a quick attaboy from Bill Anders, the final. Words came from Jim Lovell, we'll see you on the other. Side. To the split second, a burst of static marked the expected signal loss. The first humans to see the far side of the moon were now on their own. It would be 32 minutes until we saw the crew again and we would know the maneuver result. After the time passed for the first of the lunar orbit injection, LOI, maneuvers the controllers scattered to the rest rooms. On their return the trench changed the 10 by 20 foot projection display stretching across the front of the mission control room, for all previous missions the display was the ever familiar track of the spacecraft tracing its path across Earth's continents and oceans. During the translunar coast period the trajectory from the Earth to the Moon had been depicted as a skinny, stretched out horizontal S. Now the display screen for the first time in a mission showed the pockmarked lunar surface. Unable to bear the tension, Cliff Charlesworth stood and muttered to Lunny and Kraft, I gotta get out of here. Walking down three flights of stairs, he emerged from mission control, lit a lucky strike, and began a brisk walk around the two duck ponds in the central plaza of the manned spacecraft center. Frustrated at his inability to control his emotions, he finished his second cigarette, and then purposefully strode back to mission control. The controllers sat in profound silence, watching the clocks, waiting to see if the burn had come off, reviewing the few options available if it did not. Pavelka no longer checked and rechecked the data. He knew it was right. He also knew it was too late now to make any changes. Every controller's mind focused on the one event we could only now see in our minds. Was the Apollo engine burning? Did we get a full burn? Did the crew wave off the LOI maneuver and were they now on a return path? To the Earth. The minutes never seemed to end. It was like one of those dreams where you have to fight to wake up. Two clocks were counting down to spacecraft acquisition, 
The moment when we would reacquire communications and data from the CSM and astronauts. The clock now approaching zero was the one all eyes were watching. If the crew waved off, and the maneuver had not been performed, mission control would have an early signal acquisition and it would come when the clock reached zero. The time came and went so we knew Apollo 8 had performed the LOI maneuver. The next question was, did we get the planned full burn, eyes now switched to the second clock. Again, time seemed to hang suspended, unmoving. Suddenly the other clock's numbers were all zeros, and within a second of the time predicted, the ground controller announced, flight, with he had telemetry acquisition. The controllers murmured in relief, and a brief cheer broke out in the room, Apollo 8 was in the planned lunar orbit. While the spectators in the viewing room continued their buzz, Lunny's controllers heaved a collective sigh of thanks to the trajectory gods, then hunkered down to review the telemetry and tracking data, giving it a meticulous reading. Borman, Lovell, and Anders were in lunar orbit another event in the sequence of firsts, a new plateau achieved. With the tension and anticipation relieved, the Mississippi gambler, Cliff Charlesworth, lit another lucky, reached for his coffee cup, and said, anyone want any coffee? I'm buying. I have never seen a broader smile on his face. As the lead flight director, he had pulled the planning, teams, and mission together and he had done it well. The rest of us could only wonder, or guess, at how it felt to be the first humans to see the far side of the moon coasting silently, now barely 60 miles above the surface. The Russians, it should be noted, had photographed the far side using an unmanned probe. Kraft, Gilruth, and low on the back row of the control center could hardly contain themselves, the viewing room was overflowing and the people gathered there stood and cheered wildly before making their own dashes to the restrooms. Missions are tough on kidneys and bladders. During the two revolutions after the burn, the crew excitedly described the craters of the moon, giving them temporary names to honor the leaders who got them there, Lowe, Gilruth, Kraft, Payne, Slayton. Craters were named for Grissom, White, and Chafee, then for Ted Freeman, Elliot C., Charlie Bassett, and C. C. Williams, astronauts who were killed in aircraft accidents, as the Apollo 8 crew called the role of the courageous test pilots who with their lives provided the foundation for this mission on Christmas Eve 1968. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders were like explorers from ancient days, seeing a new land for the first time and reporting almost constantly during the portion of the orbit on the moon's front side where we could communicate with the crew. Borman, concerned as the crew day approached its 24th hour, grabbed a two-hour rest break, then demanded that his compatriots get some rest before preparing for their final orbit and the critical trans-Earth injection maneuver that would conclude the lunar phase of the mission and start the homeward-bound leg of their journey. I was sitting at the console, reading the flight plan, when, on their ninth orbit of the moon, Anders began reading from the Book of Genesis. It was a surprise, beautiful and timely for this achievement and this day. I felt a chill as Anders said, softly. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now I was really grateful that I was not working the mission. I was enraptured, transported by the crew's voices, finding new meaning in the words from Genesis. For those moments, I felt the presence of creation and the Creator. Tears were on my cheeks. One orbit later, on the tenth revolution of the moon, early Christmas morning, the crew left lunar gravity for their return to the planet Earth, forever changing our world, opening the door to a new generation of explorers. We grabbed for the lunar prize and we got it on our first shot. There was a postscript to this perfect mission. For years we had kidded the recovery team to stay away from the landing point or else we would hit the aircraft. Carrier. As the guidance system performance improved, this actually became a possibility. The trench did such a good job for Apollo 8 that Bill Tyndall dispatched a letter to the head of the recovery division, 
Jerry, I've done a lot of joking about spacecraft hitting the carrier, but the more I think about it the less I feel it is a joke. The visual reports of the landing indicated the spacecraft flew right over the carrier and landed only 4,572 meters, 2.8 miles, away. This really strikes me as too close. The consequences of hitting the carrier would be catastrophic. I seriously recommend that you relocate the recovery forces at least 8 to 16 kilometers, approximately 5 to 10 miles, from the target point. 14. 1969, the year of Apollo. There have not been many years in American history to rival 1969. Richard Nixon moved into the White House and Across the globe from Northern Ireland to Southeast Asia it was a dangerous world. Senator Ted Kennedy drove off a bridge at Chappaquiddick, probably ending his chances for the presidency. Even more amazing, the Mets won the World Series. Yet it really was the year of Apollo. The ecological movement kicked into high gear. Apollo 8's stunning images of the Earth in vibrant color, images never before seen by man until we pushed our way into space, brought home the reality of what we had accomplished in sending men to the moon. It provided the environmental movement a powerful visual expression of the concept of spaceship Earth. Now the images indeed seemed real to those of us who had helped send this craft to the moon. For a brief moment in December 1968 we had united all humanity. In the coming months, in the greatest adventure of mankind, we would attempt to place two Americans on the surface of the moon. The fast-track effort for Apollo 8 put us behind for the Apollo 9 launch, now just two months away. Our holiday celebrations were brief. My white team began training two days before the new year. We faced two missions before we could make the landing attempt. I had the Earth orbital flight test of the lunar module, and then on Apollo 10 Lunny would pull the pieces together in a full dress rehearsal of the lunar landing. These were the final months of the campaign to reach the moon. Although we had few details, the death of the cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov in the flaming crash of the Soyuz 1 capsule in Central Asia in 1967 indicated that the Russians were having problems with their space systems. After An 18-month hiatus, the next Russian manned missions, Soyuz 2 and 3, in October 1968, accomplished a rendezvous, but the spacecraft were unable to dock. Docking, an essential technique for space operations, was finally accomplished in January 1969 on the Soyuz 4 and 5 mission. It looked like the Russians were almost three years behind us in operational manned capability. My staff kept the division humming as my team prepared for Apollo 9, the last in Earth orbit. It was like Wally Skira's flight in many ways, but this time it was a shakedown cruise off the lunar module, the last test before we went to the moon. The lunar module had no heat shield, it could not return to Earth, the test required the CSM and LM to separate to test the LM engines and practice rendezvous, then the two spacecraft had to re-rendezvous and dock for the crew to transfer back from the LM to the CSM for return to Earth. We practiced solo rendezvous with Dave Scott in the CSM in case we had to rescue the LM crew. We had two manned spaceships to operate, a lengthy rendezvous, and a lot of engine testing. As the flight director I would be working with a team of 21 personnel, the largest MCC control room team in history. I was concerned that the span of control might be too large for rapid and correct decision making. From now through the lunar landing, the missions were on two-month intervals with both MCC control rooms on the second and third floors operating simultaneously. We had a great Apollo crew, and the delay due to moving Apollo 8 into our slot let us get much better acquainted. Our crew consisted of Jim McDivitt, Dave Scott, and Rusty Schwiekart. McDivitt and Scott were Gemini veterans and had spent time as Capcoms in early Gemini. With the advent of dual spacecraft missions, we referred to the commander of the mission, McDivitt, as commander, the lunar module pilot, Rusty Schwiekart, as LMP, and the command module pilot, Dave Scott, as CMP. 
Since Scott, like McDivitt, had come up through the program as a Capcom in mission control, he was close to the controllers and sent them his pilot's notes drawn up during preparation for the mission. The controllers would check them for accuracy. Their review helped him create a damn good handbook for future CMPs. Rusty Schweikart was a virtual unknown to us. He had spent little time in the mission control center and, while involved and friendly, was deferential about taking a position or arguing a policy, an understandable attitude for a newcomer. McDivitt established another first by designating astronaut Stu Roussard as the full-time representative of the crew for all topics. Given the complexity of this mission, McDivitt felt there was too great a chance for something to slip through the cracks. Roussard did as a sounding board to keep Polisius constantly in the forefront. These steps seem elementary, but in the rapidly moving flight program, with the constant parade of crews and expanding control teams, we were hard-pressed to do anything but the fundamentals for each mission. We were learning by doing, with little time to reflect, only to respond. February 1969 My Apollo 9 teams were a mixed bag in terms of experience. One of the flight directors, Jerry Griffin, had been a superb Gemini GNC flight controller. Now, fresh from his first mission as Apollo 7 flight director, he was roaring to go. Pete Frank, the rookie flight director, had been carrying most of the flight planning and mission rule work while Griffin and I were working with Lunny on Apollo 7. The flight control teams always stepped into the breach to help the flight directors, especially the rookies. The primary objective of the mission was to flight test the lunar module. The testing of the LM began shortly after getting to orbit. During launch, the LM is bolted into a long tapered adapter atop the forward end of the Saturn IVB rocket stage. The CSM sits atop the adapter and once on orbit, the command and service module separates from the adapter, turns around, and flies formation with the rocket. The four sections of the tapered adapter open like huge flower petals before being and exposing the docking mechanism at the top of the ascent stage of the booster. It looks like something out of a James Bond movie. The crew maneuvers the CSM to carefully dock to the LM and then extracts it from the adapter. The workload got so heavy in the final six weeks that Cliff Charlesworth, coming off Apollo 8, was drafted to fill in on the shift schedule and give us a hand. There were only so many trained and experienced people to go around. Once again, the clock was our enemy. You learn Naverto relax during simulations about the time that you think your team is really humming and ready to launch, sims up case a hole in your bubble. We were about halfway through the training for Apollo 9 when Jerry Griffith, the sims up, taught me a lesson I never forgot. I had worked with my Fido Dave Reed only once before, on Apollo 5. This mission was Reed's first manned launch. The Saturn launch period is extremely complex. The flight director and Fido have four major abort options during launch and several of the abort options overlap. At any one second you may have two methods to terminate the mission, so the timing of executing aborts between the Fido and flight director is critical. The Fido uses five large screen displays and his TV data to select the abort options. The flight director uses the same displays for launch phase timing and as a memory jogger on the abort mode boundaries, Griffith had observed that the handoff between Reed and me was not going smoothly and decided to give us a test. During training, a Fido has to learn to communicate with the flight director so flight knows his intentions before critical points are approached. The goal during launch is to get to orbit if possible. Orbit represents a stable point where we can gather our wits and figure out what to do next, or if necessary, how we will get home. An abort involves moving from the time-critical launch sequence to an even more time-critical abort sequence. This is an irreversible process, and doing it with problems on board the spacecraft is pretty tricky. The control team and crew spend a lot of time during training to get the decision process and timing right. The launch simulation got off to a good start. 
When the SIVB stage engine ignited, SimSup started a leak in the CSM propulsion system. My GNC recognized the leak a few seconds later and started monitoring the pressure decrease to compute the leak rate. So far the team was responding smoothly and we had done everything right. SimSup then shut down the SIVB engine at the precise moment when we had an abort mode overlap. Reed had two choices, light the CSM engine and continue to orbit, or turn around and use the engine to deorbit the spacecraft in the Atlantic Ocean near the west coast of Africa. The GNC, however, had not computed how much fuel was available with the leaking tank to accomplish the maneuver. The CSM, now near orbital velocity, was racing toward the African coast, covering five miles in each second we delayed. With no data from the GNC, Reed could not make up his mind which abort option to select. I had been monitoring the FIDO GNC communications and, at the same time, watching the giant plot boards. Reed was hesitating. With no call from FIDO I stepped into the breach, saying, Capcom, mode III abort. Mode. 3. The crew executed the abort but by the time I made. My call it was too late to land in the Atlantic. All the crew could do was prepare for a land impact. There is no feeling in the world to compare with the feeling you get when you know you blew it, and you have to explain in excruciating detail during simulation debriefing why you acted as you did. There are no excuses. The astronauts, controllers, training team, and MCC staff listened to the debriefings. When I finished mine, Simsup came up on the voice loop and rubbed the final salt in the wound. Flight, the crew was killed, the landing point was in the Atlas Mountains in western Morocco. Those mountains are 14,000 feet high, the parachutes don't open until 10,000 feet. I had blown it. I had killed the crew. The astronauts knew it, my controllers knew it. I knew it. I had acted like a rookie. Marta does a lot more than make my mission vests. In the final few days before a launch, usually after supper, she will say, Jean, I think it is time for your mission haircut. After leaving Langley I could not find a barber who would clip my hair short enough. Frustrated, I bought a hair clipper, and standing in front of the mirror I could cut the sides and top the way I liked it. Marta then stepped in and finished the top and shaved my neck. In December 1972 Carmen and Lucy at a family meeting told me, Dad, you scare the boys away, they see you with the short haircut and they are afraid to come to the door. Couldn't you let it grow a bit longer? Marta nodded her agreement. Their plea was so earnest that I had to acquiesce. For the next seven months I sported somewhat longer hair, combed in a 1950 style. I finally rebelled when they asked me to get it styled. In August 1973 the kids asked me what I wanted for my birthday. My response was I want to cut my hair. The next day Marta and I collaborated on a crew cut, and I was happy again, the kids found out what Marta already knew, my hair length made no real difference. The boys were still afraid of meeting me at the door. March 3, 1969, Apollo 9 Surveying my launch team as the countdown progressed, and looking at the enormous beast we were about to launch, I felt a disconcerting mixture of confidence and humility. I am sure that the pad team did also. The Saturn V on the television screen in front of me was the world's most powerful machine, towering 363 feet above the flat Florida shoreline. My team, whose average age was 26, just a few years out of school, had within its hands the power to change the direction of history. On the launch pad, ice from the liquid oxygen tank's condensation glistened in the searchlights, mist swirled around the umbilical tower and platforms. At the top was the CSM, with the detachable escape tower for the command module at the very tip of it all. Buried in the tapered adapter section below the CSM and atop the launch vehicle was the lunar module, the spacecraft we would shortly test, weighing over 6.5 million pounds, 
the Saturn rocket consumed 23 tons of kerosene and oxygen before it started to move. As it climbed along the launch tower, a ton of frost was shaken loose from the tanks, falling past the swing arms into the flame bucket. When the rocket exhaust hit the streams of water pouring into the flame bucket to absorb the intense heat, steam billowed along the flame trench that directs the exhaust heat away from the launch complex. By the time the Saturn booster shed its first stage, 2 minutes and 41 seconds into flight, it had consumed almost 5.5 million pounds of fuel. When you turned loose the energy of a Saturn rocket, you simply had to have trust in your crew, your team and in yourself. Through trust you reach a place where you can exploit opportunities, respond to failures, and make every second count. As gigantic as the machine was, and as puny as we humans were measured against its towering bulk, the human factors balanced the technology on the scale. It would be this balance that would be, indeed had to be, maintained successfully throughout manned spaceflight operations. The control room contained 21 team members, but the decision process during a Saturn launch focused on 10, the three booster engineers, Fido, Retro, Guido, two CSM systems engineers, the Capcom, and myself, the flight director. We had a bewildering set of options for Singus during the 12 minutes of powered flight. My mission rules were perched on the right corner of the console, a multicolored, two inch thick document containing several thousand rules for the conduct of the mission. These rules had been whittled down to less than a hundred for launch. We knew from the pre-mission studies and simulations that a launch abort was the final and often risky option to terminate a mission. The nightmarish scenario we faced was making a wrong decision and placing the crew into orbit with no way to return to Earth. An equally nightmarish outcome was executing an abort that either was not necessary or that, if executed improperly, might also kill the crew. With only seconds to assess a situation and then pick a path, we had to determine clearly the course of action before we launched. Except for trajectory problems that allowed no alternatives, our judgment was that things had to be going to hell in a handbasket in the spacecraft or booster before we would abort the launch. The count progressed. In the final 15 minutes, you could feel this incredible pressure build, all controllers felt it. Once the Saturn was launched, we would be tied to our consoles for at least a half hour. I gave the controllers their final chance for a pit stop before the doors were locked. We made a final rush to the restroom, standing in line, then sprinting back to the consoles. When I returned, I put on my white vest while inwardly I was marching to the cadences of Sousa's stars and stripes forever. During most of powered flight, our decision time frame was about 20 seconds, sometimes less. With our training, 20 seconds was a lifetime. In that time you can detect a problem, hold several crisp conversations, select displays, make a decision, and issue the command voice instruction all in less time than it takes to air a short television commercial. Nearing launch, an internal clock kicked in as auto-sequence started. I could feel the sweat in the palms off my hands. This was, after all, my first manned Apollo launch as flight director. At launch minus 50 seconds, the electrical power transfer from the launch pad to CSM fuel cells and batteries was complete. This brief period was the time that I hated, I always had had it. I had a long list of ground equipment I needed for launch, scattered around the world, much of it mandated by the mission rules. I prayed it all held together for the next 20 seconds. I established my personal cutoff for killing auto sequence at launch minus 30 seconds. My risk judgment told me that the MCC must suffer a crippling failure before I would I call the launch team with a no-go at this point, terminating the automatic launch sequence. I bowed my head briefly and made the sign of the cross as the engines roared and the crew called, lift off, the clocks have started. The Apollo 9 mission was sheer exhilaration for both the astronauts and mission control. While docked during the first four days we thoroughly checked out and tested the propulsion systems of both spacecraft. 
Then Rusty Schweikart and Dave Scott performed an EVA between the dock spacecraft before starting the rendezvous, the LM maneuvered to rendezvous with the CSM just as it would have to do. In lunar orbit. No Apollo crew was better prepared than McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikart. They had been in training since 1966, when they were initially assigned as the backup unit to Apollo 1 until replaced by Skira's crew. If anything went awry during the lunar module testing, Jim and Rusty could have found themselves adrift in space in a machine with no capability of returning safely to Earth. In that event, Scott, flying the command module, would have been called upon to make the first space rescue in history. Scott knew his spacecraft better than any prior command module pilot. If he had had to initiate a rescue attempt, you could be damn sure he would have succeeded. Combining two rendezvous techniques developed on Gemini 9, we flew the most complex rendezvous to date. The LM rendezvous radar, computer, and propulsion systems passed every flight test. LM emergency power down checklists and techniques for using the lunar module engine while docked to the CSM were developed and tested. These rudimentary lifeboat Techniques would provide get-home alternatives for certain CSM failures and would be vital during later missions. The mission debriefing proved that the lunar module, in a zero-g environment, was a remarkably sturdy space buggy. The only problem we had was that Schweikart was space sick for four days. Overall, it was a damned good mission with a great crew. Several times during the mission I reached task saturation with the control of two spacecraft, while planning and executing the mission. I was convinced that the only way to ensure effective support for spacecraft operations when the LM and CSM were separated in lunar orbit was with two separate teams in the MCC, one following the CSM and the other the LM. Two complete communication sets were available at each console to support shift handover. When the CSM and LM were operating independently, I believed that one flight director could work with the GNC and ECOM, the other with control, lunar module guidance, attitude control propulsion, and navigation, and TELMU, LM electrical, environmental, and EVA systems. Lunny and Charlesworth were both skeptical that two flight directors could work side by side on the same mission from the same console. A decision on the dual flight director arrangement was deferred until we could test the concept on Apollo 10. Which would set the stage for the final push to the moon. Lunny led the team for the Apollo 10 mission, with Milt Windler and Pete Frank on the wings. I closely followed every event in the mission. The procedures, plans, and rules were virtually the same ones we would use on Apollo 11. Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan took the Apollo 10 LM to within 10 miles of the lunar surface, then staged a rendezvous with John Young in Charlie Brown, the mothership. After 31 orbits off the moon, Apollo 10 left for home. The flight plan, navigation, and tracking techniques, and the exact procedures were used in an end-to-end -end basis to shake out any problems and further reduce the risks of the landing mission. Every MCC maneuver computation, every controller display, and even the team shifting scheme was tested. By the time of the Apollo 10 splashdown we knew that the total mission system, the crew, controllers, and spacecraft, was ready to go. The only remaining uncertainty was the lunar landing and the subsequent liftoff. Lunny's and Charlesworth's experience at the flight director's console during the mission persuaded them to agree to the dual flight director approach once the LM was on the moon's surface. 15. Simsup wins the final round. There are luminous points in memory that are as fresh and vivid as if they had just happened. This is the way I remember the day I was commissioned in the Air Force, the day I got my wings, and the day I was married. I remember the first time I flew a Sabre and the hour of my bittersweet last flight. I remember meeting Marta, our joyous reunion upon my returning from Korea, and the births of each of our children. In space, I remember the four-inch flight, my first mission as flight director, Ed White's EVA, and Apollo 1. Some of these moments tore my heart out while others were pure joy, an opportunity to share an instant with Marta or my team. 
Still, others were purely visceral. The thrill of doing something for the first time, being involved in a great event or leading in a great cause. Between the flights of Apollo 8 and 9, a brief meeting joined the list of those moments I will never forget. As 1968 came to a close, I realized that if all the remaining missions went well, I would be a flight director for the first lunar landing. Every controller wanted to be a part of this historic mission and all had been jockeying for some position since early in the Apollo program. Although we were incredible team players, each of the flight directors wanted a challenging and historic mission. A position in mission control was the next best thing to being in the spaceship. More than just working the mission, however, I wanted to lead the team that would take the first Americans to the moon. The role of the dice put Glyn Lunny, Cliff Charlesworth, and me on the schedule for the first lunar mission. This was a reunion of sorts, the first time the three of us had worked together since Gemini 12. Since the, the Apollo 1 fire, Hodge had rotated the lead assignments among Glyn, Cliff, and me. When I became Flight Control Division Chief, I saw no reason to shuffle the lead responsibilities, so Charlesworth retained the lead flight director role for Apollo 11. One of Cliff's initial tasks was assigning the flight directors for the mission phases. There were eight major phases of a lunar mission, five of the eight would have been demonstrated on either Apollo 8 or 10. The three new mission phases were the lunar landing, surface EVA, and lunar ascent. Our experience made it a toss-up for the phase assignments. Cliff had launched the most Saturn rockets, Glynn would have been to the moon twice with Apollo 8 and 10, and I would have the most lunar module experience. We had all worked manned command modules. Cliff and Glynn were considered by the controllers as trajectory biased, favoring work on the trajectory aspects of the mission, while I was considered as systems biased, favoring work with the CSM and LM control teams. I hoped that when Charlesworth put the pieces together, he would give me the assignment for the landing phase off the mission. The meeting where that actually happened was almost anticlimactic. Cliff walked into my office, stood at the window, stared out for a moment, and then turned with a smile on his face. He knew that I wanted to get down to business, but he just toyed with me for a few moments, passing the time of day, then abruptly said, I think it's time to decide on the Apollo 11 phase assignments. With no further preliminaries, he continued, I think I should launch Apollo 11 and do the EVA. Milt, Windler, will take the entry, this leaves Glynn for the lunar ascent, and you with the landing. Is that okay with you? I nodded, and the meeting was over. The entire session had taken less than 60 seconds. I had drawn the flight director assignment to put the first man on the moon. I had to tell someone and the list would start with. Marta. Seldom would I call Marta bearing glad tidings, it was usually, I'm going to be late, or I'm not going to be home to help one of our kids with a math test preparation. This time I couldn't wait to tell her. Marta, guess what? Cliff gave me the lunar landing assignment. When I called the staff in, they could tell from the way I was ricocheting around the office and from my ecstatic expression that I had gotten the glittering prize, the moon landing. They were as happy as I was. My landing team formed up quickly. Each team was constructed on a mission-by-mission -mission basis. When the flight directors received their mission phase assignment, the branch chiefs carefully matched the personalities and strengths of controllers to those of the individual flight directors and their capabilities to handle the mission events. Bob Carlton, nicknamed the Silver Fox for his prematurely grey hair, had the responsibilities for the LM navigation, control, and propulsion systems. His call sign was Control. During the last seconds of landing, his slow, deliberate Alabama drawl would be the only voice on the intercom, calling out the seconds of fuel remaining. Don Puddy, the tall, intense Oklahoman who never wasted a word, was the self-appointed leader of the lunar module team, responsible for communications, power, and life support systems, call sign Telmu. Steve Bales filling the Guido, guidance, 
position, was one of the first of the computer with kids. Steve in many ways was more like the system's controllers. He had not yet developed the arrogance so characteristic of the typical trench inhabitant. He spoke rapidly, running his words together occasionally, then letting them stumble out. You could tell how he felt by his voice inflection. His large, round black. Rimmed glasses set him apart from most of the controllers. Fido was Jay Green, the pipe-smoking New Yorker. A rabble-rouser who did not like it when things got quiet. He liked to coach the flight director along a decision path. He was elite in the ranks of the Fidos, cocky and crisp with his calls. Bostick, my branch chief with responsibility for the trench, knew that I was the weakest flight director when it came to the trajectory, so he gave me an experienced Fido who would teach me the new stuff I needed to know for the landing. To Green's left sat the retro, Chuck Dieterich. Like Green, he had a classic disdain for any controller who did not immediately surrender to the wisdom coming from the trench. Chuck would either bury you with more data than you needed or cut you at the knees, once telling me during a debriefing, you don't want to hear about that, flight, it's too technical. The combination of Chuck's Texas and Green's New York accents during the rapid-fire exchanges on the voice loops. Made for interesting listening during time-critical operations. Their voices were unmistakable. The final member of the trench was Gran Pauls, who would work with Bales. Gran was a tall, blonde, taciturn controller who had the habit of turning to look at you when you called. His nasal inflection reminded you of someone constantly suffering from an allergy. Like Steve, he was typical of the next generation in the MCC. Slayton selected Charlie Duke from the astronaut class of 1966 as my Capcom. Duke was well experienced in the operation, having worked on Glynn's team for the previous mission. For flight directors and Capcoms, the principal tools used during the mission were the MCC intercom and crew voice loops our common job was to listen, integrate, communicate, and act. During mission preparation, Duke provided the communications conduit. Aware of both crew and MCC concerns during meetings, he brokered and summarized the resulting actions with the crew. Watching him operate, I knew why. The Apollo 10 and 11 astronauts wanted him in the Capcom slot. Of all the astronauts, he would have made a hell of a good flight director. I had a great feeling about the easy confidence Duke showed during planning sessions. He contributed to making my mission preparation successful, helping to bring the controllers to the highest pitch of readiness in the three months before the lunar landing mission. The SimSup and his team came from the Flight Control Division's mission simulation branch. SimSup was my other partner in team building. He worked with the flight directors and the branch chiefs in carefully monitoring controller performance during training and certifying them suitable for mission support. There was no way one flight director could do this job by himself. My lunar module team, the four controllers in the trench, and Charlie Duke were the core controllers for landing. Our job was to get the LM, an odd-looking contraption, like a praying mantis, Mike Collins said, close enough to the surface to let the crew take over and attempt landing. Close enough was subjective. Only the crew in the LM would know whether to land or abort in the last few hundred feet. It was our job to get them to their decision point. There were three members of the command module team in the control room, looking over Mike Collins's shoulders in the spacecraft. Ed Fendel was making the transition to a consolidated, CSM and LM, communications position. Ed was intuitive in responding to problems and he developed great young controllers. He was also noisy, poked fun at every controller, and could be disruptive. You had to earn his respect and keep him on a short leash. I worked with Ed many times during Gemini and liked his spirit, commitment, and willingness to step up to responsibility. Above all, I liked him because he never left the flight director hanging and never catered to anyone. His independence irked many of the controllers, but they respected him. 
Glyn and Cliff considered him a pain in the ass. The rest of the team consisted of Buck Willoughby and John Aaron. During the landing phase their job was to monitor Mike Collins's solo operations in the command module. During the descent, if needed, we would use the command and service module as a communications relay point and possibly an orbital rescue vehicle. With the assignments completed, I called the first meeting of the white team to finish working out the detailed landing strategy. Personal and team readiness would emerge from our study and the team working sessions on the trajectory, flight plan, and the mission rules. Then the simulation training would integrate the ground team with the astronauts and test our mission planning. The white team had a total of 11 days of simulation to get ready for the landing. Only seven of these were with the crew. Four were with math models and a simulated astronaut. Bill Tyndall had started weekly meetings on the descent phase in April and had released a barrage of Tyndallgrams and assorted notes. Tyndallgram was the name given to Bill's comic and highly treasured memos of the techniques meetings he conducted from 1966 to 1970 to document key engineering and operational decisions. In May 1996 the memos were bound in a single volume and distributed to Bill's many friends. Tyndallgrams were converted into new procedures, flight plan entries, and the jargon used by the controllers in their go-no-go. -no -go. One of the Tyndallgrams really grabbed our attention and also gave us a few laughs. It began, there is another thing about powered descent crew procedures that has really bugged me. Maybe I'm an Aunt Emma, certainly some smart people may laugh at my concern but I just feel that the crew should not be diddling with the computer keyboard during powered descent unless it is absolutely necessary. They will never hit the wrong button. Of course, but if they do, the results can be rather lousy. The next day we started a review of every crew computer keystroke and its effect throughout the descent phase. Another Antima note challenged the terms used by my flight controllers after landing. Once we get to the moon does go mean stay on the surface, and does no go me an abort from the surface? I think the go no go decision should be changed to stay no stay or something like that. Just call me Aunt Emma. We changed the procedures for the entry reef to landing process into a series of stay no stay decisions. Tyndallgrams, spiced with humor, idiosyncratic grammar, and personal revelations, got the job done. After Apollo 11, at a post-mission beer party, flight control made Tyndall an honorary flight director, with the team color gray. His color is retired, like that of many flight directors, and now hangs in the third floor of the mission control center. I asked him to sit next to me at the console for the lunar landing. Tyndall, ever modest, declined, but I persisted in my request and he finally agreed. He was one of the great pioneers of manned spaceflight. During the mission rules sessions, Buzz Aldrin was the crewman usually involved, demonstrating his knowledge of a variety of subjects, and generally dominating the crew side of the conversations. Neil Armstrong seemed more the observer than the participant, but when you looked at his eyes, you knew that he was the commander and had all the pieces assembled in his mind. I don't think he ever raised his voice. He just saved his energy for when it was needed. He would listen to our discussions and, if there were any controversy, he and Aldrin would try out our ideas in the simulators and then give feedback through Charlie Duke to the individual controllers. Buzz and Neil seldom took a strong position during the meetings, but they were good listeners. They knew enough about us to trust us, to give us the benefit of the doubt. Mike Collins used a different tactic. He worked directly with the trench and systems guys. By the time we got towed rules sessions, all the problems were ironed out. We published our first complete set of rules for the Apollo 11 mission on May 16, two months prior to launch. With no landing simulation experience, this first set of rules represented the sum total of our knowledge from our meetings. With the simulations starting in early June, the learning curve would be steep resulting in planned rules updates weekly until launch. Simulation training is broken into two parts, nominal and contingency. The nominal training occurs early in the simulation period. 
It lasts only two to three days and is used to establish crew controller action timing, locate the go-no-go -no -go decision points, and exercise the Procedures for the planned mission The contingency training Tests the crew controller decision process in a mission environment while solving complex trajectory and systems. Problems Training scripts are developed by SimSup's team, and problems are programmed into the simulators without the crew's or controller's knowledge. The training environment becomes as close to the real thing as possible, with the training team testing the flight team's strategy, knowledge, and coordination while probing into the psyche of the crew and controllers. Nothing is sacred, no quarter is given and none asked. Training for a lunar mission was a daunting task. Training to cover every conceivable aspect of the first lunar landing bordered on the impossible. To get a handshake on the unwritten rules for the landing, I had a final strategy session before simulation startup with Neil, Buzz, Mike, and Charlie Duke. It was in this session that I outlined the landing strategy. We had only two consecutive orbits to try to land on the moon. If we had problems on the first orbit, we would delay to the second. If we still had problems, we would start the lunar descent to buy five additional minutes to solve the problem. If we couldn't come up with answers, we would abort the landing and start a rendezvous to recover the LM, then jettison it and head back home. If problems surfaced beyond five minutes, we would try to land and then lift off from the surface after a brief stay. We would try for the landing even if we could only touch down and then lift off two hours later when the CSM passed overhead in lunar orbit with the proper conditions for rendezvous, the LM had limited electrical power. The lunar liftoff time had to be precisely established to allow rendezvous and docking before the LM batteries failed. I knew Armstrong never said much, but I expected him to be vocal on the mission rule strategy. He wasn't. It took time to get used to his silence. As we went through the rules, Neil would generally smile or nod. I believed that he had set his own rules for the landing. I just wanted to know what they were. My gut feeling said he would press on, accepting any risk as long as there was even a remote chance to land. I believed we were well in sync, since I had a similar set of rules. I would let the crew continue as long as there was a chance. The SimSup presided over some of the most complex technology of the space program. The only real things in the simulation training were the crew cockpit and the consoles in mission control. Everything else was make-believe, created by a bunch of computers, lots of formulas, and a skilled bunch of technicians. The business was more art than science because we were training for something that had never been done before. Every time an astronaut threw a switch or a controller sent a command, a series of equations was triggered in the simulation computer. This pulse started a chain reaction, the data cascaded through 16 other computers, sending impulses to the cockpit or the controller's displays. SimSup needed a thick skin. When the simulation hardware and computers misbehaved, he had an unhappy crew and control team while we waited hours to restart. The training. If they balked too often, Slayton, Kraft, and the flight directors would get involved. The squeaky wheel invariably got the grease, priorities were rearranged, and someone downstream, another flight director and group of astronauts, would be stuck with less and would start screaming about being cheated out of their training. Simulator training was routinely conducted 16 hours each day. Both primary and backup crews were being trained for the subsequent two or three missions on two sets of training hardware. For the coming mission in the sequence SimSup had a prime and backup crew and four teams of controllers to get ready for a mission in 90 days, and he always had the priority. The simulation team, like the flight director, worked to the launch day deadline. When the controllers clocked 12 a days, the training team worked 14. When he was not training, SimSup was studying the controllers. crews, and mission strategy, looking for the holes and developing new training runs to exploit the perceived holes. 
Sims up for the descent phase was Dick Coos, who struck me as a quiet young academic. In fact, he was a discharged sergeant from the Army Missile Command at Fort Bliss, Texas. Dick was an early hire into the Space Task Group, assigned to train the crews and control teams. His background was in computer guidance for the early ground-to-air missiles. Simulation was an entirely new field, but with his computer experience he took to his work with a passion. Coos went up through the ranks rapidly and developed into an excellent simsup. Dick was a thin guy, wore wire-rimmed glasses, expressed himself in incomplete sentences, and seemed unsure of what he was trying to say. His external demeanor set you up for his training sessions, which were like a rapier, cutting so cleanly that you did not know you were bleeding until long after the thrust. Coos was a worthy adversary and an excellent choice for training my white team for the Apollo 11 landing. Simsup had months to design the training sessions, we had but seconds to minutes to solve problems he posed. The early sessions were rugged. Simsup's team attacked every aspect of our knowledge, even the relationships between space and ground teams. They pounded away at the strategy and timing. When we were through, we were in a place beyond exhaustion. Landing training kicked off at launch minus eight weeks. My team, fresh from Apollo 9, had a hot hand, and from the beginning it seemed we could do no wrong. The first two training days were used to nail down the timeline for the landing preparation, establish the go-no-go -no -go points, give the controllers a walkthrough of the landing sequence, and become familiar with the three-second communications delay when working at lunar distances. Initially the three-second delay didn't seem like much, but if things start to go wrong in the final seconds. Before landing you could quickly find yourself in the corner of a box with no more options. The mission rules and procedures were refined during the initial two days of training and I felt well prepared to start the landing abort simulations. Mental preparation was key to getting through a simulation. Each individual on the team had to find his very own way to be up for the challenge. Marta always sensed when I had to start working on it. She would say, isn't it time for you to get ready? She would then round up the kids and give me the time and space to start my internal preparation for each day. She made sure that I had some internal peace and was centered as I left to face whatever the day would throw at me. We had so much to do and so little time. Dick Coos was as concerned about the adequacy of the training schedule as I was. Putting all of the pieces together in 11 days of training scattered over two months was tough. After the first two sessions Coos's judgment was that we were too damn cocky, and a bit of humility learned early in the training might make us more receptive. Looking at my team through the glass wall in the control room, Dick gave orders to increase the pressure. Smiling confidently, he thought, Kranz's team will remember June 10th as the day that started them down the path to the moon. Kuzi's team leaned forward at their consoles, savoring the coming battle. Today only the fittest would survive. The first session was the warm-up. Seconds after we started the descent it seemed every controller had problems. The voice loops were jammed by controllers voicing instructions through Charlie Duke to the crew. Seconds after the crew responded another problem surfaced, then another, until Bob Carlton advised he had problems in the ascent stage. If we continued, would leave the crew on the surface without a way home. Once the abort call was made and the engine throttled up, Coos Kayed on the loop, good one, flight. You nailed it. Let's start the turnaround for the next run. Through the glass wall, I could see Dick standing behind his console. If the first run was an indication, today was going to be mano a mano. By the third run of the day the time criticality and complexity of each training run was peaking and my team was barely holding its own. Coos was having his own problems trying to keep the simulation computers from crashing. The fourth run ended in a crash. I and the trench J Green got behind on his calls, allowing the LM landing speed to build up. Our final instruction to abort was too late and Green's large plot board in the front of mission control was mute testimony to the futility of our action. With the three-second delay in communications to the moon, 
the crew was splattered across the sea of tranquility. This was our first crash, the result of a few seconds delay in our communication and decision process. After a tough and very frank personal debriefing, Jay and I dared Coos's team to get us again. On the next session Coos delivered the coup de grace. With a virtual repeat of our previous crash, this time, with the crew approaching the lunar surface, the LM primary computer failed while I was working an LM electrical problem with the system's controller. The distraction caused by troubleshooting an electrical fault resulted in a late switch to the backup computer system for the abort. It seemed that no matter what we did, we just were not fast enough. We were learning the hard way about the deadman's box, the second's critical relationship of velocity, time, an altitude where the spacecraft will always impact the surface before the MCC can react and call an abort. I in flying terms we were behind the power curve. The debriefing was long and intense, focusing on the need for some new rules. Approaching the moon at a high rate of speed the LM can go a hell of a ways in three seconds. Green took the action to change his mission rules and plot board limit lines to add a bias to accommodate the communications delay. The next two runs were a washout. I felt like a novice flight director, the sweat soaking my shirt at the armpits. There was something in the air, something I could not put my finger in. I felt unprepared, edgy. My moves and calls became hesitant and unsure, and I believe my voice betrayed my unease and passed it to my team. Kuz never backed off, his pressure was unrelenting. We were just hanging on, and our performance was in a downward spiral, every team member frustrated, tried desperately to get the team on track. By the final training run I felt like the coach of a Sandlot Ball Club behind 21-0 in the third inning. All this had taken place in one day. I had just had my worst day of simulation ever as a flight director. But when the LM headed for the lunar surface, I would be working in precious seconds. We had to work out the bugs now. During training runs it was customary for the big bosses, Kraft, Slayton, and even George Lowe, to listen in. On the flight director's loop from their offices, we would cut. The loops during the debriefings so that we had some privacy for soul searching or a plain old fashioned eschewing. After the final busted training run, the telephone behind the console rang. Frustrated, I picked it up with my customary crans here. I heard the familiar voice of Kraft. I listened to your runs today, he said. Sounds like you had a tough time. What's going on? I think he really wanted to take a reading on my frame of mind by listening to the sound of my voice. He knew the business, and he knew the job, so my response was simple. Chris, you've had these types of days. It is just a matter of time and training, we'll work it out. After Chris hung up, I switched off the ringer on the phone so I would no longer hear if he called. Simsup was winning the battle and there was little we could do except hunker down, study some more, get more training under our belts, and come back and do it again and again and... Again, this was the time where tough and competent. Discipline and morale took on a real meaning for me. Morale was not a new word in our vocabulary. The belief in our mission, our team, and ourselves was the key to our eventual success in Gemini. Morale sustained us during the difficult evas and when the Ajnars failed to reach orbit. I had to practice what I preached. Sam Phillips set up a preliminary telephone conference the week before the flight readiness review with George Lowe, flight surgeon Chuck Berry, and myself at the Houston end, Kennedy Space Center director Rocco Patron and Deke Slayton were at the Cape. I was surprised at the turn of the meeting when Phillips asked if we each felt comfortable with the schedule. He indicated a willingness to push launch into August if we needed more training time. We each carefully measured out the time we had remaining to train and figured the few extra days would not buy us that much. Then it came down to Chuck Berry, Chuck was concerned about the crew workload but after stammering a bit about the crew schedule, he also gave a go. My team was coming up to its peak very smoothly, and I did not want to back off. This was a time when the pressure was good. 
I think that Phillips also talked to Neil that day, and he got a go from the crew. The flight readiness review was conducted on June 17, and there were no major open items. The review went well until Kraft made a few comments about the landing data rules. A free-for-all started, and I was kayed on to write some specific rules on the communications and data requirements for landing. This issue continued to be debated until the week before flight, and it appeared that some of the folks at headquarters were getting damn nervous about the consequences of a crash if one occurred. Chris, Cliff, and I agreed on the real rule. That we must have enough data to reconstruct what went wrong. This rule left me the maneuvering room to take it right down to the surface before I had to make a land or abort call. Once we were close, I intended to let the crew go if everything appeared okay to them. I considered a low altitude fire in the hole abort more risky than landing without data. I always looked at a fire in the hole abort the same way I looked at a parachute when I was flying jets. You Use a parachute only when you have run out of options. The day before the launch, I processed a write-in mission rule change that legitimized this landing philosophy, the flight director will determine if sufficient data exists to continue the landing. No computer could make this call, it had to be a human decision. July 1969 During the last two weeks of training, the individual and team confidence were restored, thanks to the superb efforts of the simulation supervisor and his team. We were approaching readiness, so we took the day off on July 4, 1969. The MCC final training day always had been a confidence builder, with most of the training runs focused on achieving the mission objectives. However, this wasn't the case when we returned on July 5, and by midday I was doing a slow burn. Since Armstrong and Aldrin had deployed to the Cape, Coos was running us through the paces with the Apollo 12 crew. We were in top form, having aced six tough landing aborts in a row. As we continued to work through the final training exercises, the Apollo 12 backup crew moved into the simulator. SimSup often did this in the last day of training, giving us a less experienced crew in the simulator that forced us to do more prompting and work harder. This way we would not take anything for granted. We had started the day with Pete Conrad and Alan Bean. By midday, however, their backups, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin, joined the simulation. The final simulation before a mission was much like a graduation ceremony, except that instead of going out into the world to get a job, we had the task of landing an American on the moon. Sitting at the console, late in the afternoon on July 5th, my mind had closed the books on training and was racing ahead to the thousand items to be closed out in the final two weeks before launch. Mentally I had made a fatal misjudgment. Dick Coos had been monitoring my team and was not about to give us our diploma. He made up his mind that we would have to earn it. Dick quickly scanned the simulation scripts, then called out to his team, Hey guys, open your books to case number 26 and have them loaded in the simulators. The technicians coordinating the simulator setup responded, case 26 is loaded. Dick smiled and turned to his team. Okay. Everyone, on your toes. We have never run this case, so it is going to take a hell of a lot of precise timing on our part. This one must go by the numbers, so stand by for my callouts. If we screw it up I hope you got a bunch of change calls we'll end up buying the beer. The simulation picked up with the crew performing the final systems checks before starting the descent. I pulled my controllers for the start engine go no go, and Charlie Duke Caletto the LM crew, Eagle, you are go for powered descent. Five minutes later, the descent engine started and we were on our way to the surface. I thought, this is going to be a good one to wrap it up. Three minutes into the landing sequence Coos nodded to his team. Okay gang, let's sock it to them and see what they know about computer program alarms. The LM computer Provides a series of five-digit alarm codes. The computer alarm signal crew or ground procedural errors, 
computer hardware or software problems, or out-of-limits conditions. An ominous note states 30,000 series alarms indicate a computer abort code that results in a software restart. 20,000 series alarms are more serious and will result in the computer going to idle. In the trench, Steve Bales, the Guido, was busier than hell. He had done well so far today in training and was damn glad it was all about to end. Steve was responsible for the LM computer. He had to make sure it got the right data from Earth and then had to be certain that guidance, navigation, and control functions during the landing were being executed properly. Within seconds of Kuzi's malfunction entry, Steve was peering intently at his television display. He was seeing a 1201 alarm code indicating a computer restart. This was the first time he had seen this code except during computer. Ground testing. An equally perplexed LM pilot in the simulator called up data on the LM computer display. The code was meaningless and he decided to wait for a mission control call to enlighten him. At Bales's fingertips was a small one quarter inch thick blue handbook containing a glossary of the LM software. Quickly paging through the index he read 1201 executive overflow, no vacant areas. This meant that the computer was overloaded, the LM computer was unable to complete all its jobs in the course of a major computer cycle. Bales had no mission rules on program alarms. Everything still seemed to be working, the alarm did not make sense. As he watched, another series of alarms was displayed. Punching up his backroom loop, he called Jack Garman, his software expert. Jack, what the hell is going on with those program alarms? Do you see anything wrong? Steve was counting the seconds, waiting for Garmin's response, happy that the crew had not yet called for an answer. Garmin's response did not help. It's a bailout alarm. The computer is busier than hell for some reason, it has run out of time to get all the work done. Bales did not need to consult the rules, he had written every computer rule. But there were no rules on computer program alarms. Where in the hell had the alarm come from, he felt naked, vulnerable, rapidly moving into uncharted territory. The computer on the LM was designed to operate within certain well-defined limits, it could only do so much, and bad things could happen if it were pushed to do things it didn't save the time or capacity to do. Staring at the displays and plot boards, Steve desperately sought a way out of the dilemma. The computer was telling him something was not getting done and he wondered what in the hell it was. After another burst of alarm Steve called, Jack, I'm getting behind the power curve, whatever is happening ain't any good. I can't find a damn thing wrong but the computer keeps going. Through software restarts and sending alarms. I think it's... Time to abort. Seconds later, oblivious to the problem, I was startled by Bales's call, flight, guidance, something is wrong in the computer. I've got a bunch of computer alarms. Abort the landing. Abort. Charlie Duke picked up the call. We gonna call an abort, flight? My response was curt, abort, Capcom, abort. If there was one word guaranteed to get your attention in mission control it is the word abort. This word is never used casually and literally rings across the voice loops as the word is passed to the crew, computer controllers, and support personnel. An abort is an intensely time-critical effort where every action must be perfect and perfectly synchronized. In an abort your chances of getting out alive are good if the abort is done at the right time. If you are off the timeline, your chances are not good 200,000 miles away from home. An abort is the last option, one that must be perfectly executed with perfect timing if you're going to pull it off. The crew confirmed the abort call as they throttled up the descent engine, then staged. The ascent engine ignited and moments later they set up a rendezvous with the command module. I felt that we had made the right necessary call, but I was really unhappy with coups. Damn it, we should have finished our training with a landing on the surface. The flight controller debriefing was extensive. 
After listening to the confession of the team members, Kuz gave his evaluation of our performance. Slowly, methodically, Dick took us through the problem, then plunged in the dagger, this was not an abort. You should have continued the landing. Kuz had grabbed me by the throat, I wondered where the hell he was going. Half dazed, I was anchored to my chair as he continued, the 1201 computer alarm said the computer was operating to an internal. Priority scheme. If the guidance was working, the control jets firing, and the crew displays updating, all the mission-critical tasks were getting done. Kuz's voice then became almost fatherly as he continued, Hell, Steve, I was listening to you talk to your backroom and I thought you had it nailed. I thought you were going to keep going, but then for some reason you went off on a tangent and decided to abort, you sure shocked the hell out of me. Then Kuz made the final cut with his knife, you violated the most fundamental mission rule of mission control. You must have two cues before aborting. You called for an abort with only one. Bales, the proud, capable young computer with kid, was devastated by the simulation. The controller's world, however, is black and white, go or no go, right or wrong. A controller can never make an excuse. He's only. Answers when he fails are either I was wrong or I don't know, but I will find out. Bales was frustrated and mad, damn mad, and his response was short. Flight, I'm gonna pull a team together after we finish the debriefing. I'll tell you what the hell went on when we figure right out. Every controller has experienced the bitter taste of failure. A single busted training run is abysmal, a busted run on the final day of training is unacceptable. Slowly, we took off our headsets and packed up our gear. We had run the last race and Simsup had won the battle. We would just have to get on with our job. Later that evening, I got a call from Steve. Kuz was right, and I'm damn glad he gave us the run. The computer whizzes at the MIT labs, and our own assessment, said we could have continued. I'm going to stay with the team tonight and get out some rules. I've talked to Kuz, and he is going to set up some training runs in the morning, if that's okay with you. Kuz scheduled four hours of training on program. Alarms the next day. The runs were scheduled with the Apollo 12 backup crew as well. Simsup triggered various alarm types during several intense training sessions while Steve Bales and Jack Garman collected computer performance data and response times during alarm conditions. On July 11th, nine days prior to landing, Bales modified his already lengthy listing of reasons to abort the lunar landing, adding a new entry to the trajectory and guidance section of the rules book. All 5 to 90 item 11, powered descent will be terminated for the following primary guidance system program alarms, 105, 214, 402, continuing, 430, 607, 1103, 1107, 1204, 1206, 1302, 1501, and 1502. Steve did not put program alarms 1201 and 1202 in the mission rules listing requiring an abort. The intense training period prior to flight had found our Achilles heel, something that could have distracted the MCC team and crew at the wrong time. Something that could have been a mission buster. Simsup had won the last round. 16. We copy you down, Eagle. On the day before launch, I feel like I am going into the seventh game of the World Series of playing for the Stanley Cup. The energy starts flowing, and my mind is filled with thousands of bits of information that I will need soon. I am impatient, eager to get on with the mission. Even at home I pace in endless figure eight s like a large cat in a small cage, as I frequently do behind my console. Marta has been through this before and knows there will be no relief until launch. She keeps the conversation light, but she knows I am starting to feel the pressure. This wasn't unique to the lunar landing, it happened every mission. July 16, 1969, Apollo 11 I am 
up at 4.30 on the morning of the launch, wide-eyed alert, and thinking about the countdown, there have been no phone calls, so it must be going well. I can't wait to get to mission control and find out for sure. I fire up my psyche and crash around the house like the proverbial bull in a china shop. Marta tries to keep me quiet since the kids are sleeping. As usual, she makes me an enormous lunch, generally two of everything. We say goodbye in hushed tones. I'm sure she's glad when I leave. Prior to launch, the pressure I feel asserts itself through nervous kidneys, until commitment of the final. Go. Then I become icy calm. Other than that, I never have any problems. I sleep well. My only other on-console symptoms are sweaty palms, a tendency to engrave words in the log, and the endless clicking of the ballpoint pen. The other flight directors kid me when the sweat-soaked paper curls as I write. ACI drive to the MCC, I wonder what Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins are feeling as they prepare for this day. How do they feel as they enter the transfer van, go up the elevator, and across the platform to the command module? I believe we share the same feelings when it is time to get the show on the road. The race anticipation of the countdown reaching zero, the point at which there is no turning back. It is the final commitment. The black team led by Glyn Lunny began support of the Apollo 11 countdown 12 hours before the predicted launch to support the Cape checkout of the CSM and booster systems. The LM is not checked out. During the launch day countdown and will not be powered. Up until short before the lunar landing. In this way the teams can start working into the mission shifting cycle. I arrive shortly after Charlesworth and Lunny have completed their handover. When Lunny goes off to get some coffee, I search for a chair. We tried labeling the chairs, but on launch day they have a habit of moving around the room and losing their labels. The back row is filled with the brass, craft, Bob Gilruth, and George Hage, the mission director who represented the NASA headquarters mission policy interests. As the count progresses, Charlesworth lives up to his Mississippi gambler image. He is his usual cool self, saying little and wearing a smile across his broad face. He is ready to play any hand that is dealt him today during the Saturn launch. There is no external indication that today is any different from any of the other days in his life, although... Cliff seems to be keeping closer tabs than usual on the trench. He likes to play mental gymnastics with his people, asking questions to which already knows the answer, showing his guys that he has not lost his touch. Today he is pressing them harder. I think this is how he relaxes. With the uncertainties and the fast decisions we face, I think all launch flight directors search for something to feel comfortable with and hold on to. I sit to his left and enjoy watching him do his thing. Kraft, seated on the row above us, is also having his problems. He left his heart at the flight director's console after Gemini 76. Since that time he was faced with the formidable task of leading his four divisions into Apollo. As the count progresses toward liftoff, he becomes nervous and fidgety. He asks Charlesworth questions about the countdown, Cliff turns, frustrated by the interruptions, and in a mock serious voice, says, Chris, if you don't settle. Down, I'm going to have to ask you to leave the room. You're making me nervous. I smile, this is one of the few times we can tell our boss to call it. Kraft hesitates, gives a thumbs up, reluctantly settles in his chair, and then mutters at the console. The countdown progresses smoothly. It is hard to believe that this is the day we are going to launch the mission that will land on the moon. Charlesworth gives the cape the go for the start of the terminal count and advises the controllers of his intention to lock the doors at launch minus nine minutes. The controllers scramble in the usual last-minute rush to the restrooms. After the completion of the final communications checks, everyone hunkers down and I mumble a silent prayer for the crews and controllers as we start the voyage. The launch is flawless, as if this is just another simulation on a very good day. The only indication that this is the real lunar mission is the muffled commentary of the public affairs officer, Jack Riley. Riley. 
is a neat guy, trains as a member of the team, and covers his flight director's flanks just like a good wingman. Sitting next to Charlesworth, I hear Riley's voice over the air path. He is speaking so loudly into his microphone that his words penetrate the background buzz of the room. I pick up his words. Lunar landing mission. Then it sinks in. Today is different. We are launching the mission that will try to land Americans on the moon. On this flight America will go the final 50,000 feet. Charlesworth continues his chatter with the controllers, giving the crew their ghost periodically throughout powered flight, all eyes in the control room are on the plot board, as the markers plotting the radar trajectory streak along the flight path and into the cutoff box. Collins, the command module pilot, calls out cutoff, at 11 minutes and 42 seconds met, mission elapsed time, and the controllers scramble to call up their displays for. The orbital go-no-go -no -go decision. After a rapid conversation with his controllers in the trench, Fido Dave Reed shouts, Go, flight. We are go. We are committed. We are in Earth orbit and there is no turning back. I pick up the second shift after Charlesworth has guided the mission from launch through translunar injection and has extracted the lunar module from the Saturn IVB. There is little for me to do after shift handover except track the spacecraft and get the crew to sleep, this is my first experience with Translunar Coast, and for the first time I enjoy continuous communications while the spacecraft is en route to the moon. Since there are no problems, my team spends the entire shift studying and noting any funnies. Each spacecraft is unique and has its own personality. Learning these characteristics is essential if the controller is to make the right calls and not get fooled under pressure. Buck Willoughby, the CSM GNC, John Aaron, Ed Findell, and I go over each measurement, discussing everything that is in any way different from expected. As we talk, I make notes on my spacecraft schematics and in the mission rules. SimSup has taught the controllers many lessons about data integrity. At one time or another, every controller has been faked out by his data and has made the wrong call. The mission progresses without a glitch, and shift rotations go smoothly. By the time of my third shift rotation, my white team is well into the groove and, for the first time, my lunar module people have something to do other than sit and fret. Except for a brief communications check on the fourth day, there is no power margin to allow us to look at lunar module data until the final checkout for landing. This makes it tough on my LM team and support staff rooms. The first time they will see data is when they are giving their go-no-goes at LM power-up, six hours before the lunar landing attempt. Their learning curve has to be near vertical, and I expect surprises as we go along. The third shift is a welcome break for my controllers as the crew pressurizes the LM and, during the middle of the shift, climbs into it to make the first in-flight visit for a visual inspection. For the next hour and a half, the crew takes the world. On a TV tour of the spacecraft, describing displays and providing a stark view of the cockpit. It's an obvious tight fit for two crewmen. Although the LM controllers do not see data, at least they know that their spacecraft has arrived in space okay. They are finally getting a piece of the action. This is our last shift prior to landing. After finishing with the post-shift press conference, I go over to the singing wheel to have a beer with the team before going home. Mission events never fall into neat, equally spaced increments of 8 hours. My team must take 32 hours off to synchronize with the lunar trajectory for landing. During this 32-hour period Charlesworth will get the spacecraft into lunar orbit, then Milt Windler, the maroon team flight director, will have the crew trim the orbit and then perform another interior inspection of the LM. For flight control teams are being used for the lunar phase of the mission to provide flexibility and, once the LM is on the lunar surface, to support the CSM solo orbital operations. Lunny will come in for the shift preceding mine, presiding over the crew sleep and, with the assistance of the trench, nailing down the final trajectory for landing. This whiffadil, as we call it, sets up the shift sequence for my shift for landing. 
A wifadil is the controller's term for an adjustment to a shift schedule in order to accommodate events that are going to take place in the lunar phase. The pre-mission flight plan has the crew in the LM going to sleep after landing, but no one believes it will happen. During the wifadil Charlesworth moves into a shifting position so we can give a go and be ready for an EVA shortly after the stay-no-stay no stay decisions. Wifadils happen every mission and are pretty messy. Sometimes. You come on shift with only an 8-hour gap with the previous one, other times the adjustment is as much as 32 hours. You just have to tell your body to ignore how it feels and get on with the job. The few patrons in the singing wheel are watching the TV news as my team orders a couple of pitchers of beer. I glance up as I hear my voice coming from the TV in the bar. The commentator quotes me saying, the lunar mission is on schedule, there are no problems impacting the planned landing. When the pitchers of beer are drained, I bid a muted farewell to my teammates and then drive home. I read the newspapers, watch television, and try to force myself onto my new shift schedule. It does not work, and I fall asleep on the sofa. When I wake up, and face the extra 16-hour gap, I finally come to terms with the realization that the next shift is the real one. I go to Saturday evening mass. Blessed by my mother with strong faith, during almost every mission, I find a way to get to church and pray for wise. Judgment and courage, and pray also for my team and the crew. Our pastor, Father Eugene Cargill, knows the risks and the difficulties of our work and the need for extra guidance. He knows that tomorrow is a special day, and he says a few words about it in his sermon. After Mass, he talks with me briefly, finishing with a thumbs up. Then I go home, have a great supper and a couple of beers, and Marta keeps the kids quiet when I go to bed early. I sleep well. July 20th 1969 I wake up feeling refreshed and have a quick breakfast. The eastern horizon is just starting to show a bit of light as I hit the road. I arrive at the control center without any memory of passing through League City and Webster, small towns along the way. In an instant, it seems, I am pulling my 67 Cougar into my parking space on the north side of the building, just as I have done hundreds of times before. Today a guard approaches me and instantly recognizes me. He says, we gonna land today, Mr. Kranz. His teeth flash. And I see the gold cap on his tooth. It is Moody. I don't know his first name. He is ageless, always standing proud in a crisply pressed uniform at the MCC entrance. The name on his badge just reads Moody. His cheerfulness makes him as effervescent as usual, a favorite of the controllers. Moody's greeting snaps me back to reality. I smile, give a thumbs up, and respond, today's the day. We are go. Additional guards are present on mission days to patrol the building and limit access to the control room. They learn to mirror our feelings, and we feel a closeness, a kinship with the MCC guards. ACI walk to the MCC. I note the egg crate facade over the entrance. It always sticks out as an anomaly in the four-story, featureless, windowless, boxy, pea gravel and concrete structure. To the left is our office area, its windows well lit and filled with engineers moving deliberately between offices. Approaching the MCC lobby. Voices echo like in a canyon as a small group moves past me to the cafeteria for breakfast. We've come a long way since the roach coach back at the Cape. The guard at the entrance nods as I pass through the lobby. He checks my badge and waves me through. The elevators are hydraulic, like a car lift, and have a habit of getting stuck between floors. Today is not the day to get stuck in an elevator so I take the stairs to the third floor, passing controllers wishing me good luck. Other than that simple statement, everyone avoids unnecessary conversation and does not intrude on my privacy. Usually there is a lot of chatter and kidding among controllers. My footsteps echo as I walk down the high, narrow grey hallway to the control room. I have the same feeling every time I walk into the MCC. It is a place where history is being made, day by day. 
It is the home base, the control center for our explorers. As I continue down the hall, I get my usual vague feeling that somehow, my entire life has been shaped by a power greater than me to bring me to this place at this time. Our target today is the moon, traveling 2,287 miles per hour in its orbit. Mountainous, pelted by micrometeorites, and with craters 180 miles across, it is about one-fourth the size of Earth, with only one-sixth of Earth's gravity, it has no air, no moisture. The temperatures range from plus to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit during the two-week-long lunar days and nights. This heavenly body has never seen an earthling, never felt a footstep. But, as the scientific evidence from Apollo will help confirm, Luna is our geophysical sibling, separated from us in the violent formation of spaceship Earth. The mission operations control room door is heavy, and entering the room, I again realize how small it really is considering the magnitude of operations that take place in it. My eyes have difficulty adjusting to the heavy gray blue. cast by the world map and the dimmed lights over the trench. I listen to the ambient voice level of the room. It is always the first indication of what is going on. Today it is quiet. Lani's team is busy closing out its shift, and a lot of messages are being read by the Capcom. I glance at the TV of the flight plan to the right of the room, the astronauts are awake and well into post-sleep activities. Many of my white team controllers are on the console and already starting handover. Jerry Bostick, chief of the flight dynamics branch, is standing behind the trench, listening to his controllers. He is tall, thin, wears a coat, and has allowed his black hair to grow long, he used to have a crew cut like mine. He is in the process of taking a pulse check on his people. Bostick is like some permanent fixture in the MCC. I wonder if he ever sleeps because he is always there, standing behind his controllers, head cocked, coaching his people. The coat rack is overly full. It swings like a pendulum and it threatens to tip over as I hang up my sport coat. The trip to the flight director console is like walking through a minefield, dodging books, lunches, and the spaghetti of headset cords, the room smells of cigarettes, with an overlay of pizza, stale sandwiches, full waste baskets, and coffee that has burned onto the hot plates. The smell has never changed since we opened the control center four years ago. A bouquet of roses glows red against the gray wall of the mission control room. The bouquet always arrives as we near launch day for the Apollo missions. The accompanying card simply states Froman Admirer. Initially they came from Dallas, subsequently from various Canadian cities, and then the eastern United States. The sender became known among the controllers simply as the Flower Lady. First they were a tangible link with someone who represented the hopes and good wishes of the millions who cheered us on as we pushed deeper into space. We would not know the name of this anonymous supporter until the end of the Apollo mission, when we received, for the first time, a card signed with only the sender's first name, Cindy. It became almost a talisman, the launch flight director always wanted to know that the flowers had arrived, and they always had every time. We placed the flowers in a vase on a small table to the right and beneath the operation room's 10 by 10 foot TV screen. This was in the area where we normally congregated to celebrate the successful mission. We knew that the TV cameras would pick up the roses sitting there in the background, thus showing our appreciation to the unknown well-wisher. I talked briefly to each of the controllers, touch them on the back, and say, how's it going? I snag a brownie to go with my coffee as I pass by the procedures console. I hang my silver and white brocade vest behind. The flight director console, deposit my lunch in a drawer, place my cokes in the refrigerator, and continue across to the exit, to the spacecraft analysis room, the span room log tells me what the engineers are working on and today it indicates that everything is normal. Mission control during critical events is like a magnet, drawing controllers and astronauts close to the action. Every person not working a shift tries to find a place to plug in his headset. 
Each console has four communications outlets and as the landing time approaches, every outlet is filled. Since the astronaut observers do not have support staff rooms to hang out in, they burrow into obscure corners to find a place to plug in. Today, a bunch of them have found their home in the span area. I do not blame them, today, we will watch Armstrong and Aldrin open a new chapter in the history of exploration. Once we start the descent, we will have very little time to avoid disaster if things go wrong. We have a ringside seat, the only better one is in the spacecraft. My final stop is the simulation control area. I want to say thanks to Simsup Dick Coos and his team. To my surprise, he is not there. Having finished my circuit of the control and support areas, I return to the flight director console. Lunny would never be awarded the Good Housekeeping Award for the condition in which leaves the console, so I set about to clean up the debris and make room for my flight books. Lunny and Windler are not cigarette smokers, so I dig around to find an ashtray. Lighting a cigarette, I pull my headset from the pouch and plug in on the left side of the console, punching up the intercom loops to listen to my team as they conclude handover. Everything is going smoothly, so I start reading the logs for all the shifts since I was last on console. Kraft arrives, and as he passes behind me, he pats me on the shoulder and says, Good luck, young man. He does not have to say more. He occupied this chair from Mercury to the Apollo 1 fire. I wonder how his stomach is today and whether his customary supply of milk is safely tucked away in the refrigerator. The last person to wish me good luck as he leaves the control room is John Hodge, who, like Kraft, has closed out his era in mission control and moved into the ranks of management. A new generation of controllers, many mentored by him, are now on the consoles. Lunny finishes updating the log and indicates the crew has been ahead of schedule all morning. He, Bostick, and the Fido have been trying to resolve a 500-pound weight discrepancy during much of the shift and have fine-tuned the maneuver times to an exquisite level. Lunny ends his log with the comment that much of the work is trivial. All peanuts. Preoccupied, I put on my vest and move my gear to the right side of the console. I notice that the space artist. Bob McCall is seated on the console step to my right. NASA had run a competition to select artists to document the program. McCall was one of those chosen. Looking over his shoulder briefly, I marvel at his work as he rapidly makes a series of pencil sketches of people in the room. I select me TV displays, bring up my intercom loops on the panel, and make the first entry in the flight log. 95 hours and 41 minutes met white team, descent, crew in LM, pressurizing preps, all looks good. I adjust the intercom foot switch and call the controllers to give me an amber and check in. A small status light panel is at the top of my console. Each controller can signal with the colored light to give his status. A green light signals I'm go. Amber has several connotations, among them console handover is in progress or I'm currently away from the console or I've got a problem, call me when you have time. A red controller status gets a flight director's immediate attention. It indicates that the controller has a serious problem or is preparing to call an abort. The panel status lights at the top of my console instantly change from green to amber. Even the surgeon is listening into the communications loop today. I advise them to go green if their handover is complete. One by one the status board returns to green. Andrew Patneski, the NASA photographer at MCC, walks by and bends over. I rub his bald head for good luck, saying, we go, Pat. He croaks, good luck. Then he moves to sit behind the Capcoms. Pat and I established this ritual way back in Gemini, and it seems to work. Today is not the day to omit it. One spacecraft revolution in lunar orbit takes about two hours. During the front side pass, we receive data for about one hour and 15 minutes, followed by four to five minutes when the spacecraft is out of sight behind the moon. At spacecraft acquisition of signal on Revolution 11, the crew is still ahead of the timeline by about 30 minutes, and controllers scramble to check displays to make.
Sure they didn't miss any checklist items while the spacecraft was behind the moon. Spencer Gardner, my flight planner, brings everyone to the correct page, identifying checklist items the crew is currently performing. I like his crisp, business-like call. Spence is on top of his job today. The crew works with the ground on voice checks, navigation updates, computer memory dumps, and docked alignments. Revolution 11 passes quickly, and at loss of signal the crew is working smoothly, still about 30 minutes ahead of the timeline. The next revolution is equally smooth as the crew continues with LM landing gear deployment, autopilot checkout, and communications testing. They power up the steerable antenna, and for the first time we see the complete set of telemetry from the LM. The controllers quickly assess the data and happily give their go. The trench is scrambling to keep up with the crew, provide navigation. Updates, synchronize clocks and board the spacecraft, and, finally, give maneuver data to the crew. The exquisite ballet of flight crew and ground controllers continues. Each participant is in perfect harmony with the other, moving to a cadence dictated by the laws of physics and the clock. I reference my workbook, note all items completed, and at 99,24 met poll the controllers. Okay, all flight controllers, go amber and stand by for go no go for undocking. The poll ends quickly with all controllers echoing, go. Charlie Duke passes the go to the crew. From now on, there is no getting ahead of the timeline. The CSM and LM are now flying in tandem around the moon. Over the air path in the control room I hear the voice of public affairs officer Doug Ward. He comments on the flight plan for the coming revolution. Ward is the youngest of the public affairs officers, does his homework thoroughly, and has what it takes to be a great flight controller if he wants. During press conferences, he is always ahead of the game and knows when to run interference for the flight director. He will pick up the ball and run with it if he thinks his flight director is about to get hung out to dry by the media. Unknown to the MCC, Armstrong and Aldrin have not completely vented the pressure in the tunnel between the CSM and LM. When they undock, the pressure in the tunnel, like the cork in a champagne bottler in a pop gun, gives a slight thrust to the LM spacecraft. It is as if the crew had performed a very small maneuver with the rocket engines. When we acquire telemetry and voice on Revolution 13, the final revolution before CSM separation, the lunar module performs a pirouette while Collins, in the command module, makes a visual inspection. The two spacecraft continue flying formation, and the ballet enters its second act. Charlie Duke rattles off the long string of maneuver data for the landing and the abort and rescue. Options The voice readbacks of the data by Aldrin and Collins are confirmed by the MCC team after separation, the flight control team splits into two elements, each working with its own communications links and data stream to the two spacecraft. This is the busiest time of my shift. I now have to keep logs on two spacecraft, each with its own plan, procedures, and timeline. The common link between the spacecraft is provided by Spencer Gardner's flight plan. I keep the separate groups in harmony as the intensity in the room increases, then poll the controllers for the separation go-no-go. No go. We have met all of the criteria, are on the timeline, and both spacecraft look good. We take a deep breath and give a go for the separation maneuver. Duke passes to the lunar module the go for the maneuver that will bring it to a point 50,000 feet above the moon. I become aware that each of the controllers has reduced the crowding around his console. Duke and Slayton have cleaned who seat the Capcom console. Astronauts Pete Conrad, Fred Hayes, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders have relocated two the parts of the room. Tyndall maneuvers into the chair next to me, and I motion him to move closer to the console, where he can see the TV displays. This is his day and, I think, one of the happiest of his life. Of all our lives. Collins acknowledges the go for separation and, thrusting upward, performs a small radial separation maneuver. 
As the CSM moves away from the lunar module, Armstrong and Aldrin power up the radar and check it out by tracking Collins's departing CSM. I wonder when I will start to see signs of pressure in my team. So far, the reports are crisp, their voices almost the same as they were in training, the controllers are in a groove. I marvel at how well they are holding up, for no matter how hard they try to appear relaxed and cool, I know the pressure has to be building in them. As the clocks continue their relentless progress, I can finally feel the tension mixed with excitement in the room, the air starts to crackle as we anticipate coming events. I notice that the paper in my logbook is damp from my palms, and the paper is curling in a tight roll as I engrave each word with my ballpoint pen. Although I am not really aware of it, I'm close to maximum stress at this point, even though mentally I am as cool as a cucumber. When both spacecraft go over the hill and we lose telemetry and voice, I advise the controllers to take five. The rush for the restrooms, led by the people in the trench, is the first indication of the pressure the controllers are feeling. I thought that nervous kidneys were exclusively my problem. I follow the stampede and listen to their voices. The race no loud talk and no joking. Their faces reveal a level of concentration and preoccupation that I have never seen before. I do not. I want to look at my face in the mirror for fear that I might let my own feelings show. As we re-enter the control room, I am inspired by the controller's metal, for it takes courage to step up to our work. They are mostly in their mid-twenties. By comparison, I feel old at 35. As I look around, it becomes real for me, in the next 40 minutes, this team will try to take two Americans to the surface of the moon. It will all be on the line. We will land, crash, or abort. I in 40 minutes, we will know which. The emotion I feel in these final few minutes takes over. I have to talk to my team. I call on the loop, okay, all flight controllers, go to assistant flight director conference. The AFD conference loop is a private communications channel used principally for debriefings or for soul-searching discussions with an errant controller, and it is used exclusively by flight or the AFD. No one outside the control room can listen in. After controllers complete their checking, I begin to speak from my heart. Okay, all flight controllers, listen up. Today is our day and the hopes and the dreams of the entire world are with us. This is our time and our place, and we will remember this day and what we will do here always. In the next hour we will do something that has never been done before. We will land an American on the moon. The risks are high, that is the nature of our work. We worked long hours and had some tough times but we have mastered our work. Now we are going to make this work pay off. You are a hell of a good team point one that I feel privileged to lead. Whatever happens, I will stand behind every call that you will make. Good luck and God bless us today. I pause briefly, then resume, okay, all flight controllers, return to the flight director's loop. I think my phrasing was a bit more emotional than this, but since there is no recording of this private moment we shared. I have put down my best recollection of what I said. I did something I thought was important, something the team had earned, in the good times as well as the bad, an expression of my esteem, my confidence. We were a band of brothers. I am sure the people in the viewing room and the press call wondered what in the hell I said. Those who are still around will know now. I note the time in the log, and call, ground control, lock the control room doors. I pause briefly, then say, take mission control to battle short. From now on, no controller can leave or enter the room, the main circuit breakers in the MCC are blocked and closed. We count the few minutes to acquisition and I light up another Kent, inhale deeply, and say a prayer. Behind the moon and out of contact with mission. Control, Armstrong performed a maneuver slowing the LM orbital velocity allowing the lunar gravity to pull the spacecraft toward the surface. The LM is now silently coasting to an altitude of 50,000 feet. The final landing phase will take about 12 minutes.
Bill Tyndall stirs in the seat next to me. The race an air of expectancy in the room. The clock hits zero and the ground controller says, flight, with he had acquisition. I do not know what the controllers are thinking at this moment, but it hits me, this is it landing day. We are too busy now to think about this being the first landing. We do not have to look for problems because they come right at us, like flies drawn to a picnic lunch. Voice communications are broken, and LM telemetry is unable to lock up. The noise on the air-to-ground communications loop is deafening. Every controller punches the loop off so he can hear communications among the flight control team. Don Puddy instantly swings into action with his back room and his Capcom to select an alternate antenna. Fido J. Green asks for a report on the descent orbit injection maneuver that the crew has performed behind the moon. The maneuver sets up the conditions for landing, so the report is critical to Jay's evaluation of the tracking data. The lunar module is now coasting toward the point for descent engine ignition. While the LM is descending, Mission Control is checking the spacecraft system's telemetry, and Armstrong and Aldrin are performing landmark tracking to make sure they are in the landing corridor. We get communications with the LM briefly, just long enough to get the crew's maneuver report. The communications problem has bit us, and I am hard pressed to keep my frustration from surfacing in my voice. We have only two chances to get to the moon, and I sure as hell don't want to blow off one of them every. Member of the white team is ready for the race. Now we're dead in the water. I have only five more minutes and then it's go or no go. I say a brief prayer, please God, give us com the mission rests now on Puddy's back. Charlie Duke works with Puddy to maintain voice communications with Armstrong and Aldrin in the LM so we can continue with the final preparation to start descent. Duke has to work around the com outages and remember the controller's instructions. He watches comm signal strength indications and suggests an LM attitude change to try to improve the voice comm Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin continue to roll through their checklists, while we try to sort out the problems. We get a burst of telemetry data at the time for the go-no-go -no -go for powered descent, and I poll my controllers. The controllers make a rapid go assessment, and then we lose data again, since Duke cannot communicate with the LM, he relays the go-through comm in CSM Columbia, who passes the go to the LM Eagle. The intensity of the effort is coming in waves, centering on go-no-go -no -go points. Puddy has seen enough data to recommend a switch to the aft antenna, and Duke again relays the message to Collins. A minor attitude change of the LM helps clear up some of the communications, but we still have signal breakups to contend with. This is not going the way it should, and I remember the mission rule on data needed for landing. It is up to me to decide if we have enough to continue. I am thankful that I swung the rule change to allow making the final call much later in the descent. Communications and data improve momentarily, and we listen to the final checklist items as the crew prepares to start the descent engine. All checklist items are complete both. On the ground and in the air then the mission smooths out in the 60 seconds prior to starting down. The intercom crackles, the voices diced and chopped, staccato. I listen for any hint of concern or confusion. The voices have the steady, cool response of a well-tuned aircraft engine on a sunny day aloft. We are now engaged, the battle has been joined. The communications problem is the opening salvo. I am sure there will be more as I listen for the word flight, to trigger me into the action chain. On a couple of occasions I have to order everyone to keep the level of chatter down in the control room because I have to be able to hear all the controllers, sometimes two or more of them speaking at once on the comm loop. As we approach the start of the burn, the noise on the airground voice comm starts to sound like bacon sizzling in the skillet, indicating another imminent loss of communications. As the wall clock hits zero, the crew calls out. Engine start. 10% thrust. The lunar. Module uses a low thrust level to settle the propellants in the rear of the tank before going to full throttle. As the 
crew continues to throttle up, data is again lost. The team reacts swiftly to recover communications. Puddy requests the LM aft antenna. Duke relays the request, and Collins calls Aldrin to switch antennas. While communications are being restored, Bales indicates he now has a problem. The landing target is in the center of a 10-mile-long and 3-mile-wide oval area, the footprint. To hit the landing point the LM descent engine must be started at a precise velocity 260 miles before the target. The pressure in the tunnel at separation changed the planned velocity at the ignition point. Flight, this is, guidance. We're out in the radial component of velocity. I'm halfway to my abort limit. I'll watch it, and if it doesn't grow, I think we'll make it. Bales's concern is that the navigation system may be in error and that it will affect the trajectory during landing or if we abort late in the descent. I am also becoming concerned over the trajectory because Steve's words confirm Fido's call that the altitude is a bit low. Like a bolt of lightning, the data is suddenly restored. The controllers make a quick assessment and all systems are go. Radar data continues to be ratty and is frequently lost. We have just enough to provide the needed data comparisons between the ground indications and those on the Eagle, Bales continues his assessment. The downrange error is not increasing, so he determines that the navigation is good. With data steady for the moment, we verify proper thrust levels. Aldrin calls from the Eagle, I'm seeing some fluctuation in the AC voltages. We quickly confirm that the electrical system is looking good on the ground, and Aldrin concludes that the hitch is in the meter on board. Everything is go, and for the moment, the energy level of the room has settled down. We are running by the clock and are a quarter of the way to the surface. Bales again reports the downrange error is not increasing, and... Again, states that he thinks we will make it through his mission rule gate. I have the fleeting impression that if it is close, he will bias his call on the go side. After a visual position check against lunar landmarks, the crew indicates they also think they are a little long. I add up the pieces. Three data sources now say we are not going to hit the planned landing point. We are going to be long. I dig into my memory for the description of the landing site near the toe of the footprint. I know it is rough, full of craters and boulders. I hope Armstrong can find a landing site. I relax prematurely, and once again the data gets ratty. I tell the controllers to make their go-no-go -no -go decision based on the last data they think is valid. I trust enough in their judgment and the spacecraft to keep descending without data for a while. I go rapidly around the horn, and all controllers are go, especially Bales. His go resounds clearly through the room like a symbol. He does not need a voice loop today. I chuckle as I continue polling the controllers. Duke advises the Eagle that they are go to continue powered descent, communications are noisy but usable, making it tough for me to pull the voices out of the background noise. It is the kind of workload that SimSup routinely put us through, and his training is paying off with my team today. Tyndall must have been holding his breath, for he exhales noisily and he knocks a book to the floor as he stirs in his chair. Data returns just as the LM radar locks onto the lunar surface. Bales reports, radar, flight, and his voice briefly quivers, betraying his true feelings. Steve has passed another of his go-no-go -no -go milestones. Then, Aldrin reports, program alarm. It's a 1202. Controllers are still studying radar quality prior to incorporating the data into the computers and do not immediately pick up the alarm call. Seconds later, activity at the guidance console comes to an abrupt halt. As the implications of the alarm sink in, Bales calls, standby, flight, when his backroom support, Jack Garman, brings the alarm to his attention. Duke repeats, it's a 12.02 alarm, in a questioning voice. It's a 12.02 alarm echoes across the loops for several seconds. Aldrin requests a reading. 
It is like coming to a fork in the road where you're uncertain which direction to take. Many of the controllers are oblivious to the alarm and are continuing the decision processes related to accepting the descent radar. Bales, Duke, and I start work to resolve the program alarm. I don't think anyone outside the flight control team understands the real significance of the alarm, in the midst of the rapid-fire exchange of communications. Duke Mies is allowed on the flight director loop, it's the same one we had in training. He audibly expresses our collective feeling, almost wonderment. These were the same exact alarms that brought us to the wrong conclusion, an abort command, in the Final training run when Simsup won the last round. This time we won't be stampeded. The significance of this is not lost on any of us. The alarm tells us that the computer is behind in its work. If the alarms continue, the guidance, navigation, and crew display updates will become unreliable. If the alarms are sustained, the computer could grind to a halt, possibly aborting the mission. Each alarm must be accounted for. They have the capacity to create doubt and distraction, two of a pilot's deadliest enemies. Prompted by Gibson in the back room, Bale says, we go on that alarm. If it doesn't recur, we are go. Then, in the blink of an eye, he swerves back to the nominal mission and says, here's, Aldrin, taking in the radar data. We pass the throttle down times, continue the routine assessments, and a backroom controller inadvertently comes on the loop, saying, this is just like a simulation. I smile and agree. The race nothing. Like working out a problem to relieve the tension on. A team of controllers always work best under pressure, and they are doing well during today's final exam. The radar data smoothly corrects the altitude difference in the computer, and as we watch, we see another program alarm. Aldrin calls, same alarm, and it appears to come when we have a 1668 up. 1668 is the LM computer display of time, landing site range, and altitude. Bales quickly responds, we are go. Tell him, Aldrin. We will monitor his altitude data. I think that is why he is getting the alarm. This information is quickly passed to the crew. Above all, we have to prevent a rapid string of these alarms, which will cause the computer to go into an idle mode and abort the landing with pressure mounting on the team, I get on the loop, okay, all flight controllers, hang tight. We should be throttling down soon. Today we are gobbling up the alarms as they occur. I mentally thank Simsup for the final training run on program alarms. Throttle down comes uneventfully. LM systems and trajectory are good, and Duke advises the crew they are looking great. As the crew continue to pitch over to the vertical for the start of the landing phase, they select the steerable antenna to assure continued communications. We seem to gain strength as the problems mount. Again, I repeat, okay, everybody, hang tight. Seven and one half minutes. I run out of breath. With that statement, Bales comes on the loop. The landing. Radar has fixed everything, the LM velocity is beautiful. Carlton, the LM control, has been watching the fuel gauging system, and he selects the fuel quantity measuring probe that will be used for giving the crew and control team voice callouts on seconds of fuel remaining. The voice loop calls are now back to the expected traffic levels, and eight minutes after checking with Bales that the landing radar has updated the computers, I start to close out my final mission rules for landing. We have met all of the mission rule requirements. It is time to make the final landing go no go decision. After the LM pitches toward the landing attitude, the computer automatically completes the braking phase and switches to the final approach program. I know we are long, and the crew is now able to verify that the automatic system approach will take them into a large crater. My console telemetry display indicates the LM is about 7,000 feet above the surface, with a descent rate of 125 feet per second. 
Armstrong now selects a new landing point in the computer to overfly the crater, and Carlton reports that Armstrong has checked out the manual attitude control. I start around the loop for the landing go no go. I have met all of my rule criteria, and I am sure that controllers have, too. We are about to hand over the control for the final for Sato Armstrong and Aldrin. Soon, we will be spectators just like the rest of the world. The Controllers respond crisply and again Bales gives a go, that rings through the room. I continue with my final polling. All controllers are go. With deliberate emphasis, I say, Capcom, we are go for landing. The voice exchanges become furious as Duke gives the go to the crew, now busy trying to find a landing site. The race a brief pause, then Aldrin responds, Roger, understand. Go for landing, and then continues, 3,000 feet, program alarm. 12.01, Duke acknowledges, 12.01, and it echoes through the intercom loops with Bales advising, go, same type. We're go. As it gets tougher, the team gets tighter. I am about to bust a gut with pride for my people. The intensity increases and all calls become even swifter. They are emotional but crisp and shorn of excess verbiage. Controllers now report what they are seeing, and Duke starts to choose data from the controllers to send up to the crew. As the LM passes through 2,000 feet, Duke picks up another alarm, this time a 1202, and he advises the crew we copy. Throughout the descent so far we have not seen any discernible effect off the alarms on LM computer performance. Aldrin does not bother to respond. The control team has gone to a negative reporting mod a seconds become even more precious. Normal reporting stops and controllers report only no-go conditions, with the exception of Carlton's few remaining calls. The room is silent, expectant, listening intently to the crew calls, 700 feet, down, descending, at 21. 540 feet, down at 15. During the descent, Buzz Aldrin, the LM pilot, selected landing data from the computer display and called out the critical data to Neil Armstrong, who was piloting the LM. The reports normally consisted of altitude, rate of descent, and forward velocity, although in many cases only the single most critical element was reported. Carlton calls out in hushed tones, attitude hold. I acknowledge, ATT hold, then silence. The crew is searching. For a landing site. Duke, in even more hushed tones. States, I think we better be quiet from here on, flight. I respond, Rog, the only call outs from now on will be fuel. My voice loops become silent, the atmosphere electric as we hang on to each of the crew's words and wait for Carlton's call. We are within 500 feet of the surface and continuing the descent. We watch displays that the crew cannot see and listen for sounds yet to be uttered. If anyone so much as clears his throat, 20 other voices shush him. Reflexively, I reach out and grip the handle on the TV monitor with my left hand and think, damn close. I continue to keep up with my notations in the log. Again, I feel Tyndall stir in his chair as he leans forward to look at the displays. It must be hell to be a spectator today. I have to break through the tension. I run a quick status check, Fido, are you happy? Go, flight. Guidance, how about you? Are you happy? Go, flight. tempo picks up, the crew callouts of altitude and descent rate increase in frequency. You can almost feel the crew in eagle reaching for the surface. I look at my displays. The descent rate is almost zero. They are hovering now, and I try some body English in my chair to help them find a place to land. I look at the clock and my log. It is more than 11 minutes since we started descent. In every training run, we would have put it down by now. It is going to be close, damn close, closer than we ever trained for. The voice loops are silent. Then someone unconsciously keys his mic, and for a few seconds you can hear him breathing, 
then he unkeys. It is quiet, no discussion at all, and in these last few seconds, I feel that every controller, our instructors, program management, and those in the viewing room are mentally on board the LM, feeling for the surface along with Eagle's crew and aware fuel is almost gone. The crew reports, 250 feet, down at two and a half. 19 forward. Still near hovering, I think, but moving. Forward pretty rapidly. They are over a boulder field trying to find a landing spot. I write in my log, here we go, and advise Carlton, okay, Bob, standing by for your call outs shortly. The crew continues, 200 feet, then, 160 feet, 5 down, 9 forward. Low level, exclaims Carlton on the flight director Luke. Propellant in the tanks is now below the point where we can measure it. It is like driving your car on empty. Controllers turn their mental clock on. We have 120 seconds or less to land or abort. Carlton's backroom controller, Bob Nance, using a paper chart recorder, is mentally integrating throttle usage by the crew and giving Carlton his best guesstimate of the hover time remaining before the fuel runs out. During training, he got pretty good at it and could hit the empty point within plus or minus 10 seconds, but I never dreamed. We would still be flying this close to empty and depending on Nance's eyeballs. I wait for Carlton's next call. Armstrong is flying and Aldrin is reporting, 100, 3 and a half down, 9 forward. As the crew passes 7 to 5 feet, another call comes from Carlton, 60 seconds. I marvel at his calm voice and wonder if he feels the turmoil I am starting to feel. I mentally integrate the time. At 7 to 5 feet of altitude with a descent rate of 2 and a half feet per second, we will have about 30 seconds of fuel remaining at touchdown assuming Nance's integration is good. It could be a lot closer. Duke repeats Carlton's call on the uplink, 60 seconds. The race no response from the crew. They are too busy. I get the feeling they are going to go for broke. I have had this feeling since they took over manual control. They are the right ones for the job. I cross myself and say, please, God. Carlton's voice again penetrates, stand by for 30. Seconds, 30 seconds. Duke echoes the time on the. Uplink. The whole mission is now down to the last 30 seconds, assuming we guessed right on fuel. It is quiet, damn quiet, the silence so great you could hear a feather hit the floor. All the air seems to have been suddenly sucked out of the control room as each controller gasps and then swallows a gulp of air, then holds it for Carlton's next call. The crew report almost brings us to our feet, 40 feet, picking up some dust, 30 feet, seeing a shadow. They are going to make it. It is like watching Christopher Columbus wade ashore in the new world. Carlton calls, 15 sec, then stops. There is a lengthy pause in all crew communications, then, contact light, engine stop. ACA out of detent. It takes me a second to realize the crew is going through the engine shutdown checklist, just as they did in training. It really sinks in when. Carlton, in a droll, almost bored voice says, flight. We've had shut down. Duke responds, We copy you down, Eagle. Spectators in the viewing room and our instructors are drumming their feet on the floor, standing and cheering. We remain rooted in our chairs, but the sound seeps into the room. I experience a chill unlike any in my life. I am totally unprepared for the flood of emotion. This is the one thing that we never trained for the instant of the actual landing. I am choked up, speechless and I have to get going with the stay no stay. The race not one second to spare, and I just cannot speak. While the world waits, Neil Armstrong sends goosebumps around the globe with the words, Houston, tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Frustrated at my lack of emotional control, I slam my forearm against the console. My pen flips into the air, startling Tyndall and Charlesworth. In a voice that cracks, I say, everybody stand by for stay no stay. Stand.
by for t1 time 1 dot Charlie Duke, equally unsteady and in an emotion-filled voice, closes out this phase with a statement that expresses our feelings. Roger, tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again, thanks a lot. In case of an emergency after the lunar landing, three LM liftoff times were selected that would permit a CSM rendezvous within the electrical power lifetime of the LM. The T1 time was 2 minutes after landing, T2 was 8 minutes after landing, and T3 coincided with the CSM orbital pass 2 hours after landing. While the world is celebrating, each of the controllers overcomes his own emotional overload and proceeds to swiftly assess spacecraft systems. They start the process to check for an acceptable surface attitude, then verify the primary computer configuration and LM system status for a possible immediate liftoff. Within 30 seconds of landing, I start polling controllers to commit to a surface stay. Of at least 8 minutes. If I receive a no stay we must lift off in the next 60 seconds. All controllers crisply state they are stay for T1, which Duke promptly relays to the crew. Without a break, the white team rapidly recycles and, minutes later, gives the crew the stay for T2. We then hunker down for the final stay-no-stay stay decision. 16 minutes after the T2 stay, Carlton jolts me with the call, flight, the descent engine helium tank pressure is rising rapidly. The back room expects the burst disc to rupture. We want the crew to vent the system. My team doesn't have the opportunity to savor even a few seconds of the euphoria after the landing, as we watch the descent engine helium pressure rise, stabilize, then plummet. Carlton hovers over his telemetry display, anxiety coloring his drawl, then with a deep sigh he says, flight, we're now okay. The pressure has dropped and the system is stable. From that point on, the stay decision is a piece of cake, Duke giving the crew the final, eagle. You have a go for extended surface operations. Windler and Charlesworth come to the console during the T3 stay-no-stay -stay processes and prepare to step in if the crew requests an early EVA. The race controlled confusion as elements of two teams circle the consoles, unsure of which team is in charge until I hand over. Tyndall walks over, his eyes moist, offers a handshake and says, Damn, Gino, good show. The lunar landing techniques were his. I made no proprietary claim on whose show it was. It was a victory for the tens of thousands who worked on and believed in Apollo. Before leaving for the press conference, I walked to the simulation control room to thank Coos and the training team. The instructors are unbelieving that the last problem given us in training is the one big problem during the landing. I also learned that Coos, in his haste to get to the MCC for landing, rolled his new red triumph at TR3. I thanked God he came out all right. While walking across to the press conference with Ward, I finally have time to absorb the full reality of it, in a moment of silence when there is no busy chatter on com loops and my mind can move into a reflective, rather than reactive, mode. We have just landed on the moon. In a way, I feel cheated that I didn't have the chance to savor those seconds as deeply as those who watched. I thank God for being an American, and I think of my team and the way they performed during the landing. More than ever, I appreciate the great training, the unrelenting pressure put on us in getting ready for Apollo 11. All I want to do is get the press conference over, so I can get back to mission control. Today we were perfect, devouring each problem and grasping for each opportunity. When I get back to the control room, Milt Windler is in. The process of orchestrating the planning to get the EVA. Preparation started in about three hours. Cliff Charlesworth is already bringing his team online. The world is about to witness an explorer setting foot on a new world. I sit with Charlesworth, awaiting Armstrong's descent from the lunar module to the surface. I am sure of it now, this is the best day of my life. On July 20, 1969, at 9.56 and 20 seconds p.m. Houston time, 
Neil Armstrong steps from the ladder to the surface and, as his boots touch the lunar dust, he declares, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It was worth every sacrifice for this moment. I remember President Kennedy's words, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade, and do other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I was more teary-eyed in the months after Apollo 11 than at any time in my life. Every time I heard the national anthem, or looked at the moon, or thought of my team, I got misty dot on August 13th, just a few days short of my 36th birthday, Marta and I were invited along with program managers, designers, controllers, and astronauts to a presidential dinner at the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles. The Army Drum and Bugle Corps, in their brilliant red jackets, shiny brass, and blue pants kicked off the ceremony with the ruffles and flourishes. If ever I was on a high this was it. After a marvelous evening, a series of awards was presented by President Nixon. Steve Bales, my 26-year-old, bespectacled guidance officer, accepted the Medal of Freedom on behalf of Theenteritium for flight operations. I don't think anyone outside the program ever expected us to succeed on our first attempt at landing on the moon. Now that we had set the standard we were expected to do it again, and soon. With six children, some of the girls playing in the band, some cheerleading, and Mark playing, I spent a lot of time at high school football games every fall. As the harvest moon rose over the stands in the east, I never failed to stare at it with the binoculars, picking out the Apollo 11 landing site, hoping that someday we would continue what we started. I pray that my children will someday feel the triumph, the joy, and the shiver I felt the day we painted the moon with our star-spangled banner. Their day will come when we put men on Mars or accomplish some other feat where the human factor makes it possible to achieve something that technology, no matter how brilliant and advanced, cannot. We have slipped the surly bonds of Earth and our destiny will ultimately lead us to the stars that glow in our deep black night sky, like diamonds scattered on a field of velvet. 17. What the hell was that? Fall 1969. On the moon there was a flag from the Earth, and on Earth there were pieces of rock and soil from the moon. It seemed a fair exchange. The days after a mission, and sometimes the weeks, are tough. The euphoria of the missions, coupled with the emotional intensity of the parties and the debriefing with the crew, is followed by a strange kind of emotional decompression, as if you are a diver who has come up from the pressure of the deep sea and has to gradually adjust to the sudden absence of that pressure. We did not have much time to decompress. We also felt like we had pushed our luck, Solving the Apollo 11 problems and then landing with only seconds of fuel left was a lot tighter than any of us expected. After the string of successes that started with Apollo 7, I had a nagging premonition that we were about to break this lucky streak. When you get this feeling you keep it to yourself and move forward. That kind of feeling has no place in our business. The lunar program now focused on pinpoint landings, extending the duration and complexity of the surface activities, and mapping the moon. There was enough action for everyone. The system's controllers were the crew chiefs for the spacecraft. They were by nature and training tinkerers, mechanics. Living on government pay and raising a family. It was not easy so a lot of us saved money by doing our own auto repair work, swapping tools, and skills as necessary. You could identify the houses of the NASA guys who personally kept their old, but well-maintained, cars and motorcycles humming along by the oil stains on their driveway. Smooth running engines and the harmonic rhythm of the valve train were music to their ears. Whether it was a car or a spacecraft, the system's guys were the experts in diagnosis and providing quick fixes, using the materials and tools at hand. They had a gut knowledge of why things worked and why they broke down. They grew up with the legacy of Aldrich, Brooks, Hannigan, Findell, and Aaron, the taskmasters who learned their trade in Mercury and Gemini. They were the kind of people you liked to have around when things unraveled. They worked like detectives, suspicious of anything that did not seem to fit, 
doggedly tracking down every glitch, relishing the opportunity to explain what was, to the rest of us, inexplicable. They would soon prove themselves the ultimate backup when their own systems let them down. November 14, 1969, Apollo 12 After the successful lunar landing, it did not take the Apollo program office long to establish more, and more demanding, objectives for the next lunar flight. Jerry Griffin was teamed with Pete Frank, Glyn Lunny, and Cliff Charlesworth for the second moon landing. This would be Charlesworth's last mission, he was moving on to a role in management. The lunar module was targeted to set down next to Surveyor 3, an unmanned spacecraft that had landed three years earlier. The craft was sitting in a 700-foot-wide crater in the ocean of storms. Apollo 12 had an all-Navy crew, Pete Conrad, Dick Gordon, and Alan Bean. Conrad and Bean would perform a landing that required a manual guidance update. Landing near the surveyor. Three spacecraft required a high degree of precision. Small errors in navigation or guidance could cause the crew to land beyond walking distance from the surveyor target. The LM computer was not very bright by today's standards, so shortly after starting the lunar descent the trench, using radar tracking data, computed an update to the landing site range for the LM computer. The update was voiced to the LM crew for manual entry into the computer. As usual, Bill Tyndall was in the middle as the developer of the technique, one that I considered pretty fancy for only our second landing. Griffin was the launch flight director for the first time. No matter how much you train, you will never forget a moment of that first launch. As you approach liftoff, you just pray that all goes well. If you have a problem, you hope it is one you have aced before in training. I was plugged into the assistant flight director's console, sitting behind Griffin on the steps to his left. Every Launch, especially a Saturn, was a major, awesome event. They never lost their thrill or their risk, seven and one half million pounds of thrust is a hell of a lot of energy. The weather at the Cape was marginal at best, with heavy rain, but Jerry did not show any strain under the pressure he must have been experiencing. A hold was Keller 22 minutes before launch to review the rules and the weather forecast. A weather decision is a classic risk versus gain trade-off. Griffin listened closely to his controllers, mindful of his launch window and recycle options. Walt Caprian, one of the members of the original Mercury team, moved into launch operations and, like Griffin, was in the hot seat for the first time. Cappy had moved up a notch into the launch test conductor chain when the previous launch director moved to headquarters. AC I listened to the weather briefing I could clearly visualize the conditions, low ceilings and intermittent cloud cover were the bad news, the good news was that the winds were light at all altitude. There were no thunderstorm or lightning reports. During the hold, the public affairs officers commented that President Nixon was in the VIP area, his first and only visit to the Cape to view a launch. There were few black and white decisions in launch control and I did not envy Caprian. We had had a near-perfect countdown, every scrub and recycle takes its toll in flight hardware and in people, increasing the chance that we will have a hardware failure, or slip into the next monthly launch window. Cappy gave the go to continue the count. The test conductors started their polling, the clock started its countdown through the final 20 minutes. I had been there before and thought, well done. Cappy. At times it takes more guts to say go than no go. Griffin's controllers had purged their kidneys during the weather briefing hold, the enormous front screen displays. Were called up, glowing brilliantly against their black background. After the traditional command to lock the control room doors the team settled in, intently scanning the displays during the final seconds as Griffin called recorders to flight speed. Caprian had committed Apollo 12 to launch. Within seconds, Pete Conrad's crew and the command module, Yankee Clipper, would be in the hands-off mission control. At 10.22 a.m. in Houston, 
Apollo 12 began its journey to the moon's ocean as Procellarum, the ocean of storms, thundering from the launch pad into an overcast sky. Conrad could not restrain his glee at once again leaving the Earth, reporting, this baby's really moving. Within seconds, the Saturn disappeared into the overcast. The clouds muted the sound and glowed for a few seconds with a red-orange fire. The tempo of the airground communications indicated the Yankee Clipper was off to a good start. Dick Gordon reported, looking good. The sky is getting brighter. This message was followed by a brief, oh. At that instant, the controllers saw a brief glitch on their TV displays. In the command module, glaring amber lights in the upper right quadrant of the caution and warning panel flashed on. Conrad Yeletto Gordon and Bean, what the hell was that? We didn't hear this exclamation in the ground because the crew had an internal intercom that allowed them to talk to one another without Houston listening in. We only heard this later when we reviewed the tapes that recorded those onboard exchanges. We lost a bunch of stuff, Gordon responded on the closed loop of the internal intercom. We had a whole bunch of the buses drop off. Electrical power is provided by the CSM batteries and fuel cells to a bus or distribution point, there are two main buses and ten secondary buses for power distribution to the CSM equipment. 36 seconds after launch, observers saw a brilliant flash of lightning in the vicinity of the launch complex. Initially, they did not report it to us because we were just too busy. On the mission control systems row, John Aaron was seated at the console in front of Griffin, monitoring the cabin pressure as the Saturn continued its ascent. Rapidly scanning his displays and event lights, John was about to advise Griffin on the cabin pressure status when his displays stopped updating. Data dropouts were not uncommon during launch, but when the data returned a few seconds later many of his electrical measurements were scrambled. Aaron had seen this unique pattern only once before in his life. During a pad test a year earlier a technician inadvertently switched off a power supply, which scrambled the data. Intrigued by the data funny, John traced it to a power supply operated by a little used switch. The switch had two positions, primary and auxiliary, and ultimately provided power to 51 CSM telemetry measurements. Griffin needed answers. Nearly everyone was scrambling to nail down the source of the data loss. 60 seconds after launch, and 24 scones after the data dropout, Conrad said, with surprising calm, we got a bunch of alarms. We've lost our platform. I don't know what happened. A platform is a set of gyroscopes that provide a reference for navigation. The platform is aligned using reference stars and is essential to determining spacecraft orientation and velocity, and in performing maneuvers. Platform loss during launch phase is a serious problem. The master alarm and caution and warning reports from the crew indicated big troubles on board the Yankee Clipper. With the navigation system unusable, the crew was down to the backup system in case of an abort, the only thing keeping the launch phase going was the Saturn guidance and computer system at the booster's forward end. The CSM gyros were tumbling, useless as a reference for. Either the crew or the guidance system. The crew was literally flying blind, without instruments they could trust. Jerry Carr, the Capcom, relayed the reassuring news that the Saturn was still accelerating in the proper trajectory toward orbit. This was the only piece of good luck so far. In the command module, every electrical warning light was glowing. As the seconds clicked by, time was not on Aaron's side. The backup batteries had taken over and Aaron prayed that whatever happened had not shut off the flow of the oxygen and hydrogen to the fuel cells. If the fuel cell valves had closed, the lunar mission was over unless the fuel cell flow could be restored within 120 seconds. John Aaron likened his role that day to that of a medical intern treating a gunshot victim in an emergency room at midnight, plugging the hole in a man's heart with his finger to stop the hemorrhaging as his emergency room team sprang into action. 
John's next call made him a legend in mission control. As Conrad's voice reports continued, Aaron suddenly remembered the instrumentation funny from a year earlier. John now translated this single obscure event into a train of actions that would save the Apollo 12 mission. Griffin was no longer writing in the log. His hand was now clenching a black government ballpoint pen. Like Aaron, he knew he had little time to make a decision. How is it looking? Econ, what do you see? Aaron paused in the middle of an exchange with his support staff, stared at his displays, then made the decisive call, flight, have the crew take the SCE to auxiliary. Asterisk the words tumbling over the loop from Aaron were alien to Griffin, alien to the entire team. Taken aback Griffin stated, say again, SCE to auxiliary, ending his statement with a question mark. This time more firmly and slowly, Aaron repeated himself. When the Capcom, Jerry Carr, passed on Aaron's recommendation, it made little sense to Conrad, who blurted. Out, what the hell is that? Asterisk the signal conditioning equipment, SCE, is a small redundant power supply that provided voltage to four to six critical instrumentation points in the electrical, booster, control, fuel cell, and cryogenic systems. If the normal power supply fails, an auxiliary supply can be switched on. Carr repeated the instruction, emphasizing SCE to auxiliary. During powered flight, the command module switches and controls are allocated to the crewman who can see and reach them, this switch was Olbean's responsibility. Reaching forward, Ol firmly toggled the switch down, and confirmed, SCE is in auxiliary. Moments later, Aaron announced, I got valid data, flight. It is looking good. Interspersed with the discussion, the trench continued to rock through the abort mode calls. For a few seconds, Griffin worried that Aaron might give him an abort call, but when none came, Griffin exhaled a loud sigh. Of relief. In less than 60 seconds, the fuel cells were back online and Griffin had a go from all his controllers to keep pressing onto orbit. Aboard the command module, Conrad reported, we're pretty well straightened out now. Not sure what happened. I think we got hit by lightning. Conrad's suspicion was soon proved to be correct. The CSM power was back, but with the status of the spacecraft uncertain, Griffin's team gave a sigh of relief when the third stage of the rocket pushed Apollo 12 into orbit. That may be one of the better sims, was Conrad's appraisal after achieving orbit. We were chuckling about it up here. We had so many lights we couldn't read them all. The Saturn guidance and propulsion had done a fantastic job. Griffin's team settled down and started a meticulous checkout of the spacecraft. The question now was, could we muster enough confidence in the spacecraft to fire up the engines and shoot for the moon? As the spacecraft flew toward Carnarvon, Australia, the trench got the next shock. Radar tracking was minutes earlier than expected at Carnarvon. This was not good news, since it could occur only if the command module was in a much lower orbit than expected. With a sinking feeling, Jay Green conferred briefly with Dieterich, trying to resolve two incompatible pieces of data. Griffin had enough problems, so they decided to keep their concern to themselves while they anxiously waited for more tracking data, finally grunting a sigh of relief when they had confirmation that the Yankee Clipper was in the correct orbit. They trusted their gut instincts and they were right. An atmospheric anomaly had bent the tracking data, faking the radar into believing the command module had crossed the horizon early. During a brief conversation over Carnarvon, Conrad left no doubt that they had been hit by lightning. At the time of the event, about 30 seconds into flight, and again at about 50 seconds, I saw some illumination out the window. In inside the spaceship, everything went dark. At least one of the two flashes of lightning seen by observers at the Cape had hit the spacecraft. Jim McDivitt, who stepped in as Apollo program manager when George Lowe moved to headquarters, had seen a ground lightning strike near the launch pad. The strike's path went from a cloud to the Yankee Clipper and then via the rocket's exhaust to the ground around the pad. 
This was the strike that took place 30 seconds into launch. It was not clear if the illumination that took place at 50 seconds was also a strike. Reports of the strikes had been withheld until after the critical launch phase was over. SIG Schoberg, Kraft's deputy and a gifted and intuitive design engineer, was deeply concerned over the report, visualizing the havoc that a lightning strike could cause in the Apollo spacecraft. Concerned over the inability to make a complete checkout of the CSM and booster prior to the translunar injection, he walked down to the system's row of controllers, talking briefly with the GNC, then with Ecom John Aaron. Moving into the trench, SIG approached Bostic, Jerry, if you feel uncomfortable in any way about the TLI, translunar injection, speak out. Fidgeting a bit, he continued, I will support you if you give a no-go today. He then left and moved to the booster controllers, giving them the same speech. Kraft, standing next to Griffin, offered the same advice. Young man, we don't have to go to the moon today. It's your call. The input of Kraft and Schoberg immediately removed all political pressure from the decision. Griffin knew all he had to do was make the right technical call. There could be no other way. It was impossible to check out the entire spacecraft, that can be done only on the ground. In the short time available Griffin's team ran a pre-maneuver checklist realigned the CSM platform, and then, after much discussion with the crew, gave Conrad, Bean, and Gordon their translunar injection go over. Carnivon Throughout the mission the MCC and North American, the CSM contractor, continued to analyze the lightning strike, assessing any critical circuitry that might have been damaged or would prematurely fail. The pyrotechnic systems were the principal systems that could not be checked out. Since they were needed only for normal entry, their status had no bearing on the decision to go to the moon. Conrad and Bin made their pinpoint landing on the moon next to the surveyor, establishing a new set of space records, increasing the duration of the lunar surface activity and surviving two lightning strikes. Aaron's SCE to auxiliary call became legendary and Griffin survived his first launch. All in all, it was a damn good mission. Christmas 1969 For tough missions, the first lunar landing, and the Apollo 12 save yes, 1969 had been good to us. A year of world-class performance under pressure and a perfect track record. We were Super Bowl champs and it was time to party. After the long and irregular hours, the controllers were at a disadvantage when it came to the splashdown parties after the Apollo missions. After the congratulatory handshake, and puffing the traditional cigar, we secured the MCC consoles and called our wives. Exhausted by the demands of the mission but still pumped up by the adrenaline rush that comes from getting another crew home safely, everyone elected to attend the splashdown parties after the Apollo missions. The controller's splashdown parties normally started at the officer's club at Ellington Air Force Base, about a 10-minute drive from the MCC. Occasionally the Air Force Reserve Squadron would fly up to Maine for crew navigation training purposes. Stopping long enough to get a bunch of live lobsters. And have them cooked and waiting for the splashdown. Aldrich, a properly raised New Englander, provided instructions on the correct way to eat this delicacy. After finishing at Ellington, we moved to either the Singing Wheel or the Flintlock, both located in the small city of Webster, about a three-minute drive from MCC. I think the Flintlock was in cahoots with the Webster cops. The bartenders would keep shoving us the drinks, then when we left for another party, the Webster police were waiting as we pulled onto the highway. Controllers contributed a bunch of bucks to the Webster Municipal Treasury. The debriefing parties were a more private, males-only affair restricted to crews and controllers. Women engineers inspired by the space program joined the ranks starting in 1971 and now make up about 40% of the MCC teams. Four women have become flight directors, three of whom are currently active. The Hofbrogotten in Dickinson, 10 miles south of the control center, was the rallying point. The remote Dickinson location got us away from the crowd.
crowd, and the Galveston County Sheriff's Department often looked the other way. The restaurant had a large open-air beer garden, a bakery, and a butcher shop. The formal mission debriefings were not for the thin-skinned, so a few liters of beer softened the edge as we cooked sausages, drank, and continued into the informal debrief. Awarding the Dumb Shit Medals, DSM, was the focus of the festivity. Flight directors, controllers, and crew compiled a list of errors, both perceived and actual, during the course of the mission. In an elaborate and holographic fashion, we stepped forward to make a speech or accept our honors. The Hofbrogotten Imper band often joined in, playing a dirge as the stories got longer and wilder. The awards took many forms, elaborate certificates, dented and broken equipment, photographs, and multicolored ribbons to be worn around the neck. By the end of Gemini, I had enough awards that the controllers presented me a set formatted. Like the bars of military campaign ribbons. One of the highest order dumpshit medals passed out at the debriefing party was for anyone who missed a pre-sleep checklist item and then had to wake the crew to correct a switch position or pump up the pressures in the tanks. My awards ranged from triggering a fire alarm during a mission when I emptied my ashtray into the waste basket to locking the control room doors for launch before all my team members had returned to the room. A common DSM among the flight directors was awarded for leaving the console log behind at the press conference, or for a poor selection of crew wake-up music. The festivities often included a chug a log contest or some old-fashioned Indian arm wrestling. The controllers and crews put forward their own champions. The parties reminded me of the fighter pilot hijinks back at the officers' club in Ozen, Korea. Emulating the traditions of a fighter squadron, I decided that flight control needed to fashion a beer mug. Maureen Bowen, secretary and den mother to Mel Brooks. And the experiment systems branch was recruited to work with the Balfour Mug Company to design a mug for the flight control team. In a typical engineering fashion we provided some specifications. The mug must hold one and a half liters of beer, be decorated with a copy of the crew's mission patch, and contain the controller's name and MCC console position. By the time we finished, the beer mug had become grand and unique, containing crew signatures and Armstrong swords from the moon landing. Maureen started collecting the money, and within weeks she had over $5,000. We had moved beyond the normal coffee pot finances into the big time. She did not want to keep the money around the office so she opened a checking account in the Nassau Bay Bank across from NASA. Everything was going nicely. The mugs were ordered and we had raised enough money so that we could afford to throw a party at the Hofbrogotten to christen the mugs when they arrived. Then the roof fell in. The NASA Inspector General, located in the Manned Spacecraft Center, and two members of the Regional Inspector's Office entered Maureen's office quoting the fines and jail time for violation of NASA directives on the use of the Apollo 11 astronaut badge. It looked as though Maureen, a young secretary, would be terribly old and poor by the time she got out of jail. By the time the bureaucrats were done, Maureen and I were charged with violation of many NASA directives. The NASA SEAL, insignia, logo, program, and astronaut and mission operations badges are protected from commercial use or sale. Maureen was more concerned that the NASA inspectors had confiscated her checkbook, and a lot of bills for the mugs were coming due. Neil Armstrong asked Mike Collins to refer all of the mug data to headquarters, confirming that the Apollo 11 crew endorsed the design and gave us permission to use their Patch. Once he saw the guns aligned on him, the inspector who started the flap backed off. He even purchased a mug for himself. The lesson, as with any mission, was well learned. Over the years, we in the flight control division managed to build the biggest party fund in NASA, and when it grew too big, we donated a lot of money to charity. We sold mugs, lapel pins, and sweatshirts and threw good-sized parties at fancy places. Although the NASA legal folks watched us, we never had any further problems with the Inspector General. In 1999, on the 30th anniversary of the first lunar landing, we cast the mug for the final time, then broke the mold.
18. The Agioff Aquarius. April 1970. A Aquarius let the sun shine in, a song from the rock musical Hair, boomed from the stereo speakers of my Cougar Daily as I pulled into the parking lot behind Mission Control. The song had temporarily replaced the stars and stripes forever as my going to work music. The version sung by the group called The Fifth Dimension was picked up by the Apollo 13 crew and controllers as symbolic of the energy and momentum of the Apollo Lunar Program. The song's signature words, This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, symbolized the first mission of the new decade as well as the challenge and excitement of the increasingly difficult and risky lunar missions. When the Apollo 13 crew named their LM Aquarius, the song moved to the top of the pops for the controllers. The CSM was dubbed Odyssey. Lunar exploration began in earnest after the pinpoint landing of Apollo 12. Mission targeting moved to more difficult and hazardous landing areas, the landing point 4. Apollo 13 was a target 3,000 feet in diameter, located north of a large crater dubbed F.I. Moro. The crater was located in a geologic formation south of the Imbrian Basin. The basin, one of the largest on the moon, had been formed by a gigantic cosmic collision. Scientists hoped that samples of the material ejected during the collision would establish the date of the Imbrium event. Veteran astronaut Jim Lovell commanded the mission. His experience on Gemini 7 and 12, as well as his being one of the first humans to orbit the moon on Apollo 8, made him a logical candidate to lead a rookie crew. The LM pilot was Fredo, Fred, Hayes, a member of the fifth class of astronauts, who had graduated from test pilot school in 1954. Fred knew the LM, especially the software, like the back of his hand. Ken Mattingly, the command module pilot, was a favorite among the controllers for his in-depth knowledge of every aspect of the business. But two days prior to the launch Ken was scrubbed from the mission because he had been exposed to measles. He was replaced by Jack Swigert, a member of the backup crew. During the pre-mission meetings and in training we had spent a lot of time with the backup crews. So Jack was no stranger to the MCC teams. After two days. Of. Refresher training he was ready to go. I was the lead flight director on Apollo 13, a transition mission in many ways. The new flight directors, Griffin, Frank, and Windler, were pulling more weight, preparing to alternate the lead responsibility for the final four missions. Charlesworth had flown his last mission on Apollo 12 and was forming the Earth Resources Project to fish as part of a plan to apply space technology to Earth's problems. Operations was my business and I liked teaching the young controllers, watching them grow during their four-year training period as they progressed from the back room to the MCC main control room. Every new controller was assigned a mentor to test his knowledge, build his confidence, and prepare him for the painful and necessary lessons he would learn from SimSup. When controllers make it to the ranks of the front room and meet the flight director, they fully understand that the price of their admission is excellence, and that a Spartan set of standards will govern their conduct. Most of all they understand that suddenly and unexpectedly we may find ourselves in a role where our performance has ultimate consequences. From the foundations of mission control, a one-page statement summarizing the values essential to a controller attaining excellence. The text was written by flight director Pete Frank. See page 393. Failure does not exist in the lexicon of a flight controller. The universal characteristic of a controller is that he will never give up until he has an answer or another option. By the time someone graduated to the front room consoles either he was ready or he was gone before he got there. The Apollo 13 flight director chemistry was unique. Windler and I were jet fighter pilots, Griffin flew as a radar operator. For the first time we were working together on a mission. Lunny, the fourth flight director, was the last of the original flight dynamics officers, the master of his craft. April 11, 1970, Apollo 13.
Bilt Windler, a veteran of three Apollo missions, drew the launch flight director's assignment. He had earned his spurs as a test director in Kraft's recovery division and not in mission control. His transition was smooth. Absolutely unruffled at the console, Milt emulated Charlesworth's low key and patient demeanor. He was fully in command of his team when the moment came to light the fire on Apollo 13. The liftoff occurred at 1313 Central Daylight Time and proceeded uneventfully through first stage flight. The five engines of the second stage of the Saturn V ignited and burned smoothly for five and a half minutes. Then the center engine unexpectedly shut down. Milt's team quickly reviewed the status of the remaining four engines, ran the computations for the new engine cutoff times, and passed them to the crew. When the second stage engines shut down, the SIVB stage ignited and got the spacecraft to orbit. After the CSM orbital checkout and updating of the trajectory parameters, Windler gave the go for translunar injection. We heaved sighs of relief, thinking we had gotten through what probably would be the one major glitch in the mission. The crew and control teams rapidly settled into the routine. During the early shifts, we watched and worked with Jack Swigert, calibrating his performance and finding him a very capable standing for Ken Mattingly. During the translunar coast period both crew and controllers prepared for the events scheduled for lunar orbit when things would get quite busy. As the meticulous checkout of spacecraft and trajectory systems continued, the controllers settled into a state of relaxed alertness. The easy banter among flight director, team, and crew would leave a bystander thinking that none of these guys had a care. In the world, when in fact they were maintaining Gimletide. Focus on the job at hand while gathering their reserves for what lay ahead. With the exception of the live TV broadcast from Apollo 13, my second shift of the mission was also uneventful. Mattingly had been pestering us for access to the MCC, his medical status still indefinite. I decided that if he was showing symptoms of measles at the time of the EVA, we would put him at the network console on the floor of the control room that was not being used on the mission, directly below us, giving him a chance to listen in but not exposing people to contagion. As the crew concluded its onboard TV broadcast just before 8 o'clock p.m. Houston time I glanced up to the viewing room and could see Lovells and Hayes' wives and families leaving. Swigert was a bachelor. Lunny's black team was arriving in the control room and there was a rising hum of conversation as the shift handover process began. After talking to his controllers. In the tr trench, Lunny moved into the seat next to me, reading the flight director log for all events since his last shift. I began preparing my handover summary for him while we were getting the crew and spacecraft configured for the sleep period. We zipped through the pre-sleep checklist, verifying that each system was set up to enable us to watch over the crew while they slept, monitoring the switch positions and dumping the telemetry records, making sure that once the crew members were asleep we did not have to awaken them. The flight activities officer got a verbal confirmation from the crew for the completion of each checklist page. With little else to do, I was following the checklist closely. Earlier on the shift we had a worrisome but minor communications glitch. For a brief period, the CSM high-gain antenna did not work in either of two automatic modes and had to be positioned manually. Then when a spacecraft roll maneuver was performed the antenna abruptly locked. Up. Now, all of a sudden, it was working properly. There was insufficient time to troubleshoot this glitch prior to the crew's going to sleep. I had Ted to leave this as an open item for Lonnie. The crew continued the closeout, terminating the command module battery charge. During the previous sleep period, an alarm monitoring pressure in a hydrogen tank had awakened the crew. After considerable debate in the MCC, we did not reset the alarm out of concern that it might inadvertently trigger again and wake up the crew. As a result, a Creo pressure warning indication was illuminated in the spacecraft and also on Cy Liebergott's console. During the translunar for Sue were in continuous voice and data communications, so Cy intended to stand watch over the pressures from the ground during crew sleep. 
Liebergott was my ecom, having moved up to the front line during Apollo 8. Now, after a year's experience, he was considered a veteran controller. He had a second glitch he was working. The telemetry gauge in oxygen tank. Two had been reading normal at 80% through the mission, then during our shift the gauge went through for rapid up and down cycles, finally failing Gan sticking at a constant reading of 100%. We no longer had a valid reading from the sensor. Cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen mixed and reacted in the three fuel cells in the service module to provide electrical power. The reaction also provided pure water used for drinking and for cooling the CSM systems. The only other source of power to the command module was the three reentry batteries, normally used only for the final two hours of the mission. The oxygen and hydrogen, maintained in a liquid state at temperatures below 300 degrees Fahrenheit, were stored as liquids in spherical tanks insulated by a vacuum between the outer and inner walls. As the mission progressed, the oxygen and hydrogen went through a progressive change from a liquid to a gas. At the time of launch the cryogenics in the service. Module tanks were a dense supercold liquid, but now, too. Days into Apollo 13, the cryos were a thick soupy vapor, part liquid and part gas. Fans were located internal to the cryogenic hydrogen and oxygen tanks, the fans were periodically activated by the crew, at the request of the MCC, to stir up the mixture and allow precise tank quantity measurements. Heaters were located in the tanks to raise the tank. Pressure. The heaters could be activated either automatically or manually by the crew. Cy Liebergott, wrestling with the oxygen pressure management problem and hoping to avoid an alarm during the sleep period, decided to request a cryo tank stir prior to sleep. The stir request was passed to the crew, with Swigert acknowledging the request. As Swigert started the stir at 55 53, Liebergott focused his attention on the TV monitors displaying the fuel cell currents to nail down the exact time the stir started. What we could not know at this time was that a design flaw existed in the heater circuit of the cryogenic tanks. During pre-launch testing, the heater thermostat switch closed and, due to the design flaw, the Teflon insulation on the wiring internal to the tank was damaged. When the tank was serviced for the mission, the bare copper wires in the tank electrical system were submerged in liquid oxygen. Two days after liftoff two of the three conditions for an explosion existed, gaseous oxygen and damaged tank insulation. All that was required to initiate an explosion was a spark. Nothing happened for 16 seconds after Swigert started the cryo stir. Then, inside tank 2, a spark jumped between the wires of the heater circuit. The pressure in the tank rose rapidly. Preoccupied with Moni touring fuel cell currents, Cy Liebergott did not notice the oxygen flow measurements on all three fuel cells fluctuating slowly for 18 seconds. Then the pressure in oxygen tank 2 began to rise rapidly, but failed to set off a high pressure alarm in the command module or at Liebergott's console because the cryo pressure alarm had been disabled for the crew's sleep, the tank pressure continued its upward climb, then dropped rapidly. The temperatures in the spherical tanks began to rise rapidly. One minute and 53 seconds after the stir began, there was a three-second telemetry data loss. When the data returned, the tank 2 pressure read 19 psi, temperature plus 84 degrees Fahrenheit. The normal pressure reading is 865 to 935 psi. The time was now 55 hours 55 minutes and 4 seconds from launch. Like rolling thunder, my voice loops came alive, flight, Wivy had a computer restart. Then in the blink of an eye, Swigert said, we have a problem. Then other controllers chimed in with bad news. At this point Lovell uttered the ominous words, okay, Houston, we have a problem. In both the MCC and on board the spacecraft, Voices were normal, but heart rates had picked up. Seconds later Hayes reported. Right now, Houston, the voltage is, is looking good. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the caution and warning. 
In the MCC, you can't see, smell, or touch a crisis except through the telemetry and the crew's voice reports. But you can feel some instinct kicking in when something very wrong is going on. By the time I heard Lovell's report, three controllers had related problems. I was wondering which problem Lovell was reporting, as he started relaying the long list of warning indications from the spacecraft displays. The reports and our experience indicated an electrical glitch. I believed we would quickly nail the problem and get back on track. I was wrong. A crisis had begun. Events followed in rapid succession, escalating and complicating the problems as the crew's situation became increasingly perilous. It was 15 minutes before we began to comprehend the full scope of the crisis. Once we understood it, we realized that there was not going to be a lunar mission. The mission had become one of survival. The reports continued, but nothing made sense. Each controller stared incredulously at his display and reported new pieces to add to the puzzle. It took extra seconds sorting out what was real and credible. It appeared we were losing our oxygen and with it the fuel cells, the major source of power. When that happened we would lose control of the main propulsion system. Nothing remotely like this had ever happened in simulation. Asway watched the command module's life-sustaining resources disappearing, like blood draining from a body, the voices of the crew were unbelievably calm and restrained. It was as if they were reporting something that was no big deal. From all sides of the cockpit, Hayes, Swigert, and Lovell were continuing the dialogue, giving us the cockpit meter readings and warning light indications. I had heard about fog of battle, but I had never experienced it until now. The early minutes were confusing, all reports and data were suspect. Small firefights occurred as individual problems were corrected, but we had no sense of the big picture. With both electrical buses in an undervoltage condition, the crew was working independently of the control team to restore power to the craft. We were seconds behind them, slowly responding. I remembered the call from INCO, Instrumentation and Communications, Gary Scott's call, that the antenna had switched beam width at the exact time of the power problem. I became convinced that we had an electrical short caused by another antenna glitch, again I took the wrong fork in the road, believing we would be back on track shortly. Five minutes after the event, the significance of the crew's words, we had a pretty large bang. Hit me. GNC Buck Willoughby, unflappable, started speaking to me slowly, evenly, and without a hint of emotion. Flight, have the crew verify that the quad D helium valves are open. I suspect that the Big Bang shocked the valves shut, cutting off fuel to the attitude thrusters. Buck's call started me down a different path. On Apollo 9, I was flight director when the pyrotechnic shock occasioned while separating the CSM from the Saturn SIVB booster closed the fuel valves. That gave us a few bad moments then. The bang heard by the 13 crew must have been awfully solid to do the same, closing the propellant valves. From this moment on, I proceeded more deliberately and methodically. We were five minutes into the crisis. Capcom Jack Lusma, frustrated, came up on the loop. Flight, is there any kind of lead we can give them? Is it instrumentation or have we got real problems or what? Lusma echoed everyone's feelings. We were making no progress, virtually every controller still had problems, but no one could see a pattern in all this. It was like living a bad dream, with every event taking place. In, in slow motion, the frustration of the crew and controllers was starting to creep into their voices. Everything we knew about our spacecraft, all that we had learned about design, precluded the kind of massive failures we were seeing. The data told us we were looking at multiple simultaneous failures. Two, possibly three fuel cells were down, both oxygen tanks depleted, and we had an undetermined attitude control problem that was pushing the two spacecraft around. Soon we would lose power. When that happened, we would lose everything. 
the teamwork in the MCC Indira crisis is spectacular. While Liebergott, Lusma, and I worked the electrical options with the crew, the remaining controllers were making their inputs to the Capcom, correcting their smaller problems. While sensing the urgency of the electrical problems, they tended their own business, protecting their systems and giving crisp, brief reports so as not to disturb or aggravate the resolution of the main problem, whatever it was. INCO Gary Scott watched the antenna signal strengths like a hawk. He knew that the crew did not have time to point and select antennas. Gary recommended a fallback to the less powerful but adequate Omni antennas. There are four Omni antennas on the spacecraft. Through the critical first hour, until help arrived, he called out each antenna switch, protecting this vital link as the docked CSM and LM drifted out of control and were pushed around by some force we couldn't identify. If he had missed once, we would have lost communications, diverting the attention of crew and control team from critical tasks. Scott, like many others, made hero category by his patient, timely, undistracted management of the data stream while everything else was falling down about me team. It was now 10 minutes into the crisis, all the bosses had gone home after the crew's TV show. I needed to notify top management that we had a hell of a problem on our hands and that we didn't fully understand what it was. Turning to Lunny, I asked him to call Kraft. Glynn handed me the phone as Chris's wife, Betty Ann, answered. In response to my request she explained that he was in the shower. I said, Betty Ann, get him out, I need to talk to him. Weena still dripping Kraft got on the phone, I told him that we had a major electrical problem and that I believed we had lost one or more fuel cells. I concluded on a somewhat desperate note, Chris, you better get out here quick, I think we've had it. GNC and Guido, Willoughby and Wolfena, had been quietly watching the crew struggle to control the spacecraft attitude and avoid gimbal lock. This grave problem would come about if the rings that support the whirling wheels of Thegroscope all aligned in the same position. We would then no longer have a usable reading from the gyroscopic platform. In gimbal lock we would be unable to maneuver or point the spacecraft. We would be literally adrift in space until the crew took a fix on. Saturn stars to realign the gyros, much in the way a 19th century sailing ship figured out its position. Every time the crew got close to the danger point, Willoughby, in a hushed but forceful voice, would call, flight, they are getting close to gimbal lock. Lusma would advise the crew, who then used the CSM hand controller and attitude jets to maneuver away from disaster. The team was now functioning well, we were 14 minutes into the crisis, fighting a delaying action until we figured out what was going on and what to do about it. Most of the problems seemed to rest on Liebergott's shoulders. He was responsible for the systems needed to sustain life, power, water, oxygen, and pressure. But no matter what we tried, we were unable to staunch the hemorrhage of the fuel cell oxygen reactants. Then, abruptly, all the pieces of the puzzle came together. Lovell reported, it looks to me, looking out the window, that we are venting something. Then with emphasis he said, we are venting something out into the into space it looks like a gas. A shock rippled through the room as we recognized that an explosion somewhere in the service module had taken out our cryogenics and fuel cells. The controllers felt they were toppling into an abyss. Needless to say, the lunar mission was now a no-go. The only thought on my mind was survival, how to buy the seconds and minutes to give the crew a chance to return to Earth. Now I was damn angry that I had wasted 15 precious minutes by not assembling the pieces earlier. I should have seen it. Somewhere, somehow, an oxygen tank exploded and it caused a lot of collateral damage. The feeling of self-reproach passed quickly, I became icy cold, my mind reaching out for options as my training kicked in. Our objective from here on was survival. The crew's only hope was mission control. My team had to start the turnaround with two flight controller teams in the room, the level of chatter was distracting. My team needed to get back. On the voice com and get focused. I finally took.
Charge. Standing up I yelled across the top of the consoles, okay, all flight controllers, cut the chatter. I want every member of the white team to settle down and get back on the voice loops, the rest of you shut up. Now, let's everybody keep cool. The LM is still attached, the spacecraft is good. So if we need to get back home, we have the LM to do a good portion of it with. Let's make sure that we don't blow the, remaining, command module electrical power with the batteries, or do anything that would cause us to lose fuel cell too. We have to keep the oxygen working and would like to save the attitude control propellants. We are in good shape to get home. Let's solve the problem, team, let's not make it any worse be guessing. The team focused on keeping the crew alive and finding a way to get them home. Our determination was evident as we calculated the limited resources available in the damaged spacecraft. For the moment the power and the oxygen in the CSM could keep the crew alive but the LM was ultimately the only safe haven, even though it had been designed to accommodate only two men for two days. I knew I had to move quickly to stabilize the situation and then hand over the remnants of the mission to Lunny's team. I wanted time to review all the data. I had the absolutely chilling fear that I had missed something important. I hoped that some fresh minds might pick up on it. I wanted to get the white team offline, get them together in a quiet corner, nail down the cause, and then start on a plan to rescue the crew. We were the lead team. It was our responsibility to take over management of the crisis. My console was a mess, littered with schematics. Procedures, the console log, and cigarette butts. Lunny's team was scurrying around the room preparing for handover. Clint Burton, Liebergott's replacement, nervously awaited his turn in what had become the hot seat. Ed Findell, who managed communications, joined Gary Scott at the console. Together they would keep up the communications, the key to an orderly transfer to the lunar module. Findell had been at home and had just happened to have the radio on. He heard the news, jumped in his car, and came in. Racing his Corvette through the back streets of Clear Lake, Fendel arrived in a cloud of dust and parked in the middle of the exit lane. He joined in the battle with Scott, making sure that communication with the crew would be maintained without interruption throughout the crisis. I was glad to see him. I did not know how much longer Scott could continue running solo and pitching a perfect game with the communications. Craft arrived as we were starting the second phase of the power down of the CSM. Liebergott signaled the next phase off the withdrawal with a simple suggestion. Flight, I think we better get going and powering up the LM. We're running out of time. He then gave Luzma the call to have the crew secure the command module entry oxygen system, a small oxygen bottle used during the final two hours of the mission. We were putting together a lifeboat, what did we need to make it work? Craft plugged into my console. I glanced up momentarily and said, Chris, we're in deep shit. Moments later, Liebergott began to lay out the bad news, the whole nine yards, flight, I hate to tell you this, but I think we've elost fuel cells one and three. I nodded, still thinking that maybe fuel cell two and one of the oxygen tanks might be salvageable and could be added to our get home resources. Lunny had been down in the trench reviewing the get home options. At the time of the explosion, Apollo 13 was 200,000 miles from Earth, 45,000 miles from the surface of the Moon. We were entering the phase of the mission where lunar gravity becomes stronger than Earth's gravity, we call it entering the lunar sphere of influence. When Lunny came back up to the console, Kraft stepped down from his position behind me. In a hushed tone, Glynn said, I had the trench look at maneuvers with ignition about three hours from now. We have two basic options, a direct abort and one going around the moon. The fastest direct abort gets us home in 34 hours. We fly in front of the moon but we have to jettison the LM and use all the main engine fuel. We have several options that fly around the moon. The best one takes two days longer, but we don't use the main engine and we can keep the LM. 
We rapidly went through the mathematics, the lunar module was good for two crewmen for two days. A quick estimate using the LM powered down checklists and taking the path around the moon left us at least 36 hours short on battery power. Windler, the leader of the maroon team, now joined us at the console. He believed the shortest and fastest path back to Earth was the best. He seemed to favor the direct abort, Lunny and I disagreed. I said, I don't want to jettison the lunar module. We haven't nailed down the exact cause of the explosion or the extent of the damage. The main engine or its control systems may have been damaged. We need more time to work out the procedures for the return. Lunny chimed in, keeping the LM buys time. We don't have a second chance and if we jettison the LM we cut off a lot of options. Whatever we do, we damned well better do it right. I wrapped up the discussion, we should hold on to the lunar module and go around the moon and take our chances with the LM power. I believe we will come up with a plan that gets us home. Debates among flight directors are not uncommon. We all arrived at the flight director position along different paths. Given a few minutes, the rapid pooling of experience is often the quickest way to firm up our direction. The discussion was brief, intense, and conclusive. I wanted to get every option and opinion out on the table before we selected the return path. The trench was nervous about pulling off a direct abort so close to the moon. I knew Lunny would fight to the death for the long return after talking to the troops in the trench. Controllers clustered about the console as we talked recognizing a decision was imminent. Bostick and Dieterich were joined by my Fido, Bill Stovall, from the trench. Luce crowded in, representing the crews. I vividly remembered the EVA flap from Gemini 9, when I left instructions on the console about what to do only to have top management intervene, thus putting this on. A risky course. With that in mind I was not about to leave the trajectory plan undefined. We had all the players at the console and I did not want to open the subject to further debate. I looked directly at Kraft. Chris, I don't trust the CSM service propulsion system. It's in the back end, where we had the explosion, and we won't know if it is good until we try it. Then it may be too late. We need to buy some time to think and to build the come home procedures. I believe we can find the power. Our only real option is to go around the moon. Kraft had been listening, he looked at Lunny and then nodded. Lunny said, I agree. The direct abort closes out our options. We should keep the lunar module. The trench had been standing by, faces grim, hoping they would not be told to pull off a direct abort at this late time. When they saw the decision coming down in favor of their preferred option, they smiled for the first time in a long while, nodding in agreement and relief. Through some miracle, a burst of intuition, something we had all seen, heard, or felt now told us, don't use the main engine. To this day I still can't explain why I felt so strongly about this option. We did not have much time to debate, and I was glad that there had been immediate agreement. Many people were unaware of the options, but I believed that the systems controllers thought I had made the wrong decision. They favored the fastest way home, a direct abort. Missions run on trust. Trust allows the crew and team to make the minutes and seconds count in a crisis. In the scramble to secure the command module, we didn't have a chance to brief the crew or even get their opinion on the return path. I, in my mind, I knew the crew would fight to hang on to the lunar module. I felt Lusma, as their representative, would speak out if needed. Kraft went up to brief the NASA brass who had congregated in the viewing room on our plan to get Apollo 13 home. The trench returned to their consoles to start developing the return trajectory plan and brief their back room. The systems guys would have to find a way back with what we had. 53 minutes after the explosion, the plan was becoming clear. The retreat to the LM was proceeding, the trajectory path chosen, and the handover to Lunny was accomplished. 
I signed off in the log at 57.05 mission elapsed time, 1 hour and 10 minutes after the explosion. It had been the longest hour in my life. When I left the control room the remaining cryo-oxygen tank pressure was down to 100 pounds per square inch. Time was running out. In less than two hours the command module would die. The situation was not yet stable, but the direction was clear. Lani presided over the retreat to the LM, saving as many of the CSM resources as we could. After transferring the navigation. Data to the lunar module computer, Glynn, with a resigned shudder, told the crew to turn off the CSM systems and the computer. Walking down to the data room to meet my team, I thought of the work ahead. We had to put together in a few hours a set of procedures that normally would take weeks to work out. We would operate outside all known design and test boundaries of the space systems. The white team, called the Tiger team by the media, assembled at 10.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time in the data room on the second floor. The room was large, about 30 by 30 feet and essentially bare. The only furniture was grey government tables, two overhead TV monitors, and a single intercom panel. The controllers used the room occasionally for team meetings, systems troubleshooting, and working sessions with design engineers. When I walked into the data room I was greeted by my augmented flight control team, the controller's arms were filled with orange-colored recorder paper. They were kneeling. On the floor, the paper strewn all over the place. In pairs, controllers marked the time annotation, measuring the squiggly traces and rapidly scanning for anything that could pinpoint the cause of the explosion. The room was noisy and smoky, the tension in the air palpable. Engineers and program office personnel, as well as key managers from Grumman, the LM designer, and North American, the CSM designer, were sitting on the tables, since there weren't many chairs. It was a working room, used principally when there was trouble. Since we had no shortage of trouble, everybody knew it was the place to be. There were three pieces to the puzzle of the return journey. The command module was the Reentry vessel. It had the heat shield but very limited electrical power. The lunar module, which would be used as the lifeboat, was designed to support two crewmen for two days on the lunar surface and was our source for power, life support, and propulsion. The third piece was the damaged service module, the true extent of the damage still unknown. With these pieces we had to fly around the moon, perform maneuvers, support three crewmen for more than four days, and then, at the very last moment, evacuate the crew into the command module. Then we had to separate the pieces so they would follow different trajectories for reentry. Electrical power, water, and oxygen were critical. There was no way to stretch the power unless the trench came up with options to speed up the return after we passed the moon. The return plan split into two phases. In less than 18 hours we needed a maneuver plan and procedures to speed up the return journey. Once this was completed we needed the entry plan 60 hours later. Everything else had to fit in between these two critical events. So far all we had done was to buy the time to give the crew a chance, now we had to deliver. I said a prayer for the crew and the teams that had to do the work. Walking to the front I motioned to three of my controllers saying, Aldrich, Bill Peters, and Aaron, come on up front where everyone can see you. The rest of you knock it off and find a place to sit. I had worked many missions with Aldrich and Aaron and knew their capabilities. Peters, the Telmu on Griffin's gold team, I knew as one of the best analytic minds in flight control if you gave him a bit of coaching. Some of the controllers rolled up their recorder paper and moved to sit on the table surrounding the room, others curled up cross-legged and sat on the floor and still others continued to roll out the records, reading the timing marks and placing notations on the edges. The room was getting crowded and noisy as even more people tried to force their way inside. Quickly scanning the crowd, and then motioning to my white team controllers, I said, we have to cut this team down to size and get some order, the race plenty to do in this room. Is too full to get anything done. I want the white team. To, 
To look around the room and if you see anyone that you don't need, send them back to their consoles. Several of the controllers, program managers, and spectators left voluntarily, gingerly stepping around the recorder paper strewn on the floor. I turned to Chuckstorf, my trusted flight planner. Chuck, you're the recorder. I want you to get with the trench and the flight planners and build me a work plan on every decision we need and when we need to do it. Then I addressed the people remaining in the room. Okay, team, we have a hell of a problem. There has been some type of explosion and board the spacecraft. We still don't know what happened. We are on the long return around the moon and it is our job to figure out how to get them home. From now on the white team is offline. Lunny, Griffin, and Windler will sit the console shifts. We will return only for two major events. The first will be a maneuver, if we decide to do one, after we have passed the moon. The second will be the final reentry. The odds are damned long, but we're damned good. My three leads will be Aldrich, Peters, and Aaron. Make sure everyone, and I mean everyone, knows the mandate I'm giving them, Aldrich will be the master of the integrated checklist for the reentry phase. He will build the checklist for the CSM from the time we start power up until the crew is on the water. John Aaron will develop the checklist strategy and has the spacecraft resources. He will build and control the budgets for the electrical, water, life support, and any other resources to get us home. Whatever he says goes. He has absolute veto authority over any use of our consumables. Bill Peters will focus on the lunar module lifeboat. There are probably a lot of things we have not considered and he will lead the effort on how to turn a two-man, two-day spacecraft into one that will last for four days with three men. Whatever any of these three ask of you, you will do. Now, I'm addressing myself to the program office and design engineers in the room, Aldrich, Aaron, and Peter's need numbers, answers to questions, and unlimited access to your resources. They will ask for things you never thought you would be kayed on to do and to answer questions you never expected to be asked. I want nothing held back, no margins, no reserves. If you don't have an answer, they need your best judgment and they need it now. Whatever happens we will not second guess you. Everything goes in the pot. My message to everyone is, rely on your own judgment, update your data as you go along. If you are not the right person, step aside and send me someone who is. When you leave this room you will pass no uncertainty to our people. They must become believers if we are to succeed. I move to the blackboard. Okay. Now let's get down to work and come up with our initial shopping list. Then I want Aldrich, Aaron, and Peters to select a work area and pull their pieces of the job together. In real time I used the same brainstorming techniques used in mission rules or training debriefings thinking out loud so that everyone understood the options, alternatives, risks, and uncertainties of every path. The controllers, engineers, and support team chipped in, correcting me, bringing up new alternatives, and challenging my intended direction. This approach had been perfected over years, but it had to be disciplined, not a free-for-all. The lead controllers and I acted as moderators, sometimes brusquely terminating discussions with close it, or it'll take too much, or we've tried it before, it didn't work. Often the response was simply, save it for our last ditch try. With a team working in this fashion, not concerned with voicing their opinions freely and without worrying about hurting anyone's feelings, we save time. Everyone became a part of the solution. For the next 15 minutes, we brainstormed out loud. Astronauts and engineers were assigned to teams, rooms selected, and working schedules arranged. The session concluded with a brief update from the trench on the trajectory options. Then I took a deep breath and concluded the meeting. Okay, listen up. When you leave this room, you must leave believing that this crew is coming home. I don't give a damn about the odds and I don't give a damn that we've never done anything like this before. Flight control will never lose an American in space. 
You've got to believe, your people have got to believe, that this crew is coming home. Now let's get going. In the control room upstairs, Lunny had completed the evacuation of the crew to the LM and was preparing for a small maneuver that would place the spacecraft on a path to return to Earth after completing the Tiger team. Meeting, I went back to the control room to get a status update from Lunny. Glynn was now concerned about powering down the navigation system. He had been advised by astronauts Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan, in the simulators, about the difficulties of performing an alignment while docked, using the LM optics. The navigation platform, Gyros, is aligned using stars and a sextant-like device. Sunlight reflecting off the CSM made it difficult to recognize the navigation stars. The crews report that they could not recognize stars due to the cloud of debris surrounding the spacecraft further convinced Lunny that we needed to keep the LM computer and display system powered up until we completed the get-home maneuver. Then we could power down and coast back to Earth, the risk was high, trading electrical power to keep the computer and navigation system in line against the possibility that we might be unable to realign the navigation platform. Without a navigation platform we could not perform the maneuver to accelerate. The return to Earth. If we ran out of power, we could not get into position for reentry. We were playing showdown poker, we needed to G to better hand. I tracked Aaron down and gave him this new complication, telling him that he should make it his number one priority. Aaron said, I don't have to run the numbers all out, but I can tell you that if you take this approach, you will have to power down to a survival level, limited telemetry, a very late power up for entry, and the possibility that some of the systems may fail due to the cold. It is going to be tough in the crew. Some of the systems may freeze up. John, the best judgment we have, I replied, says that we cannot realign the navigation system. I think this is our only option. Get on it. Aaron's problem just got a lot tougher. His group set up their camp in the support rooms adjacent to my home base in the data room. John Aaron would not return to the console until the final shift four days later. The next set of estimates were grim. We were 20 hours short in electrical power and 36 hours short in water for the return trip. I kicked myself for overlooking what here is the most critical resource. Water is used for cooling LM equipment, for drinking, and for food preparation. I dug rapidly into a how goes it sheet Peters had made for me. We had water for about 60 hours available in the LM descent stage and 14 hours in the ascent. We weren't even close. I was now grateful for the time we had spent before the mission in the mission rules, flight planning, and procedures meetings developing options and workarounds for all conceivable spacecraft failures. We knew when the chips were down we could use the command module survival water, condensed sweat, and even the crew's urine in place of the LM water to cool the systems. There is no such thing as a first team in mission control. All teams must be balanced, equally competent, equally capable of sustaining the effort. Over the next four days the flight control teams would routinely shift every eight hours, with Lunny, Griffin, and Windler steering the return course. But at this moment the battle for the return of Apollo 13 shifted to the back. Rooms and factories where the components were assembled and tested. We needed their data and we needed it fast. We needed tests in the laboratories and crews in the simulators to prove the procedures we were writing. Engineers hastily recalled from sleep and still rubbing their eyes were given the challenge to get the tests running, dig out the data, bring up the simulators. My immediate job now centered on developing the procedures for the get-home maneuver using the engine designed for the lunar landing. The maneuver would have to take place two hours after the CSM and LM passed the lowest point of the orbit around the moon. Perisynthian. My ne next set of decisions involved determining how aggressively to pursue a rapid return to Earth. The most aggressive option would cut 24 hours off the return journey and require jettisoning the damaged service module and using all of the LM descent propellants. Several other options were available and there were advocates of each option. Glynn and I kept our powder dry, abstaining from the debate 
knowing Kraft would ultimately turn to us for the final decision. Griffin strongly pushed for any option that would get the splashdown point moved from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific, where we had full recovery capability. We vetoed two faster return options as too time critical, leaving no downstream options. Some folks lobbied to jettison the service module, but since we had not worked out jettison techniques, that was a moot point. Almost since the instant of the explosion Glynn and I were pretty much in agreement on not using the main. Engine. We seem to be running with some intuitive. Link that surprised our team members. When we needed to synchronize our thinking we would pass messages via runners or a brief phone call or meeting. Kraft was running interference for the flight directors and we agreed to let the NASA managers play with the options and alternatives. During a crisis every boss wants to get in on the act. Letting them think like flight directors for a few hours kept them out of our hair and prepared them for when. We laid the real plan on the table. The flight directors would get together privately, generally in the second floor viewing room over a cup of coffee, and discuss our positions before we went to management meetings. The last thing we wanted to do was let the brass think there was any real disagreement in our group or uncertainty about our recommendations. We were ten hours into the crisis when Lunny handed over to Griffin. I joined them at the console, reviewing the maneuver options in preparation for Kraft's meeting in the viewing room on the second floor, where the shift. Change briefings for management were held. By now Glynn and I had settled on the maneuver option that got us back to a landing in the Pacific at 142 hours met. This was a middle-of-the-road option, cutting only 12 hours off the return journey. Because we had doubts about our ability to check the LM navigation with crew fixes on stars, we chose this approach, which gave us a greater margin for error in maneuvers and reserved some propellant for correction maneuvers on the return. The road to safety would prove to be long and cold and dark. 19. Coming home. April 14, 1970. ACI arrived with the white team at 3 p.m. Houston time for the get home maneuver. I glanced up at the viewing room and chuckled. Two members off press, one print and one TV, and their public affairs escort were now firmly compressed in a small glass booth about the size of a large desk at the far corner of a viewing room. The reporters, their noses pressed to the glass, were listening to our communications. Headsets, reference data, pencils and paper, and all kinds of the tools of their trade were visible on the desktop. Jack Riley was the PAO chaperoning this duo in the viewing room. I had no doubt they would have preferred to be on the floor. I just hoped they were pumping air into the room or we might have another emergency to deal with. From now on we were living in a fishbowl. Everything we said and did was going directly into the homes of America and the world. Griffin had set us up well for the maneuver and, after a brief handover, the white team was back on console. As the spacecraft passed the moon, the lunar gravity pulled it in an arc toward a rendezvous point with Earth, our job was to hasten the rendezvous. We briefed the crew on the maneuver procedures, mission rules, consumables, and the return strategy on the remote chance we would lose communications during the return. Throughout the briefings I continually stressed to the controllers and to the crew that the burn start time was not critical. We were already on a return path and if anything did not look right we could no-go the burn until everyone was confident about proceeding with it. I had a high degree of confidence in this maneuver, since it was a variation of an LM engine burn we had executed on Apollo 9. There was an air of expectancy in the room as the maneuver time approached. The viewing and control rooms were filled to the brim. The ma maneuver was a turning point in the struggle to get our guys home, anchoring the return time and placing many tough decisions behind us. Two hours after Apollo 13 passed behind the moon, the crew ignited the small descent engine designed for the moon landing, burning for four and a half minutes and increasing the return velocity by almost 1,000 feet per second. The execution by the crew was perfect, fixing the landing time for 142 hours and moving the landing point from the Indian Ocean to the Pacific near Samoa. 
the aircraft carrier Iwo Jima was dispatched to the landing point to recover the crew and spacecraft. Getting back on the console with my team felt good. By the process of elimination, we were whittling down the work yet to be done and improving the crew's chance of survival. I had one more thing to do before finishing the shift. The system's controllers had been watching the temperatures at various locations on Thelem and by. Inference the CSM, since we had started using the LM as a lifeboat. We initially believed that a random drift would keep the temperatures in limits, and conserve power, water, and propellant. The designers disagreed. Prior to the return maneuver I spent some time in the spacecraft analysis room reviewing their data. I left the meeting convinced that we had to execute a passive thermal control, PTC, maneuver before we powered down and sent the crew to sleep. The PTC is a kind of rotisserie maneuver that slowly spins the spacecraft on its long axis so the sun can heat all sides. The maneuver is used routinely to ensure equal heating of all surfaces and the systems under the skin of the spacecraft. Setting up this roll maneuver is not easy. After getting properly oriented the spacecraft must become perfectly motionless, then the small control jets are briefly fired, setting up the spin. If the procedure is not done perfectly, the spin will rapidly turn into a wobble and diverge from the sun line. This procedure had never been done. In a docked configuration using the LM jets, which were not favorably located for this procedure. ACI was discussing the procedure with the white team, Slayton and Kraft approached the console. When Slayton growled a horse gene, it was obvious they had something on their minds, so I stood and turned to talk to them Slayton didn't was T-second. Jabbing me with his finger, he said, I want you to get my crew to sleep, they are too damn tired, they are going to make a mistake. I, too, was tired as I looked into Slayton's grizzled face, his heavy black beard stubble was starting to show dot we glowered for a few seconds, but before I could respond, Kraft started in. I want you to get the spacecraft powered down. You're calling it too damn close on the batteries. My team was approaching our 34th hour, we also were running out of gas. I turned to Slayton and snapped, crew sleep and power down are. Gonna have to wait. We won't get them homey if we let everything freeze up. I'm gonna do the PTC. Slayton and Kraft were not used to being shouted at. Before they could respond further, I motioned them away and returned to my seat at the console. Capcom, read the crew the PTC procedures, I ordered. Slowly, Kraft and Slayton retreated to a position at the console above me. Max Faget, the chief of engineering, sat down next to Kraft. I think spacecraft analysis had sent him out to lobby on behalf of our plan if the argument got too heated. Faget's earnest Cajun voice carried. Chris, that's the right thing to do, he said. There is no use getting the spacecraft back if the systems don't work when we re-enter. I envisioned Max patting Kraft on the hand, telling him to settle down. Every second of delay stole time, power, and badly needed sleep for the crew. The spin-up maneuver had to be perfectly set up, very deliberate. Doing it using the LM. Jets was like trying to thread a needle with bad. I sight. After about 40 minutes the crew fired the thruster to start the roll. We watched the resultant motion, and within minutes it started wobbling. To head off a repeat visit from Kraft and Slayton, I roared, OK, Capcom, tell the crew we're gonna have to do it again. I could hear Kraft and Slayton grumbling on the console above me, probably muttering in my direction, we told you the crew was too damn tired. This was a good test of the flight director's mandate. I respected both Kraft and Slayton for not second-guessing me and letting me get on with my job. The second spin-up attempt worked, and we initiated the complete power down off the spacecraft. It was now 26 hours after the explosion. The crew and my team could finally get to sleep. I tried not to think about how cold it was going to get for the crew, but I knew we had decided on the right option, staying powered up until we went around the moon.
With the shift over, I call Ede a brief meeting of the white team in room 210. Aaron's battle plan had the crew powering down to a 12-amp load, about a quarter of the power consumed by a household vacuum cleaner, for the return journey. It would be an ordeal for the crew. It would get cold, damned cold, but there was nothing we could do. Crew comfort was our last priority, they would have to tough it out. The power numbers had improved as a result of the work of Peters and Aaron, but we were still too tight on water. When we ran out of LM water we planned to use wastewater and urine for cooling, if needed. Engineering gave a status report indicating that they were close to a solution on another problem. The crew's breathing was slowly poisoning the cabin atmosphere with carbon dioxide. We had run out of the cylindrical air scrubbers used in the lunar module, and engineering was testing an adapter for the square command module. Canister that was being fabricated from cardboard, a plastic bag, a sock, and a hose from one of the crew's pressure suits. You have to picture a plasticized flight plan cover, to funnel airflow, curved over the top of a lithium hydroxide air scrubber, for removing CO2, and a hose attached to the scrubber's bottom which in turn ran down to a small fan, which pulled air through the scrubber and sent it through the sock, which served as a filter. The device was all held together by duct tape, a commodity which, fortunately, was always carried in the spacecraft. By the time we arrived at this rather bizarre but functional contraption, we had been awake for a day and a half, so I told the white team to get six hours sleep. Then we would start working out the final set of procedures for the reentry phase. I had developed a habit on previous missions of resting in the viewing room when we had problems. The room was as cold. As a meat locker, quiet except for the crew and flight. Direct to voice loops and with few occupants except during major events. I staked out the upper corner of the viewing room as my home base when I wanted to rest, and after a 30 to 45 minute catnap generally got back on track quickly. Since there were a lot of people in the third floor room, I went down to the second floor viewing room. It was also close to the action if someone needed me. The final phase of the struggle to return the crew now began. Flight control had fought a delaying action. We had stabilized the situation and protected the options. We had a pretty good idea of the resources available in both spacecraft. The show now belonged to Aldrich, Peters, and Aaron. Their job was to manage the resources, trade off the options, build margins wherever possible, and finalize the detailed procedures for the final entry phase of the mission. If ever there was a trio prepared for Batlight was this one. The ebb and flow among the design, test, and operations communities provided answers to the questions we had yet to ask, problems we had yet to identify. Aaron Cohen and Owen Morris, the NASA spacecraft program chiefs, rolled up their sleeves and joined with their counterparts Del Myers from North American and Tom Kelly from Grumman. Together they directed a superb effort to solve a complex technical problem in a very tight time frame. These four engineers were the highly respected generals who commanded the engineers in the factories, laboratories, and test facilities. I believed that this team could move mountains. The flight directors had worked with all of them during the spacecraft redesign after the Apollo fire and subsequently in preparation for the missions. The trust among program manager, designer, and mission control was absolute. Added to this respected group were two other great engineers, Don Arabian and Scott Simpkinson, whose pedigrees traced back to the early days in Mercury control. They were well versed in real time troubleshooting and were fully aware of the high. stakes poker we were playing. Above all, they knew that you had to have answers before the clock ran out. This task force worked in the span, spacecraft analysis, room, focusing on only one thing how to get the crew home. They provided the missing pieces we needed. The handovers between engineering and operations were smoother than on an Olympic relay team and we did it repeatedly for almost four days. There were a lot of heroes but the SPAN team never got the gold medal and the recognition it deserved. Aldrich was the scribe, watching the clock, assembling the pieces, listening to the debates, 
then deciding when enough was enough and it was time to put the plans on paper. Aaron was the accountant, keeping a meticulous balance sheet on the precious resources. Aaron became critical for power, Peter's critical for water. Aaron checked every procedure entry exercising his soul and absolute power of veto, often sending the controllers back to square one, telling them, your input was not good enough. Give it another shot and be back to me in an hour with your bottom line. Aaron, with his veto authority, soon became the dominant player in the return planning. The LM water available for cooling dictated an extremely low power level during the return journey. As a result it soon became clear that we could make it home with the LM battery power. When Aaron recognized we would now have some power to spare he wanted to recharge the command module batteries. The 3 cm batteries would be the sole power source for the final hours of Reentry. Since the batteries had provided the CSM power in the minutes after the explosion, they were no longer fully charged. Aaron wanted to find a way to charge them to maximum capacity. When the two spacecraft were designed, it was never envisioned that we would need to charge the command module batteries from the LM. But now the controllers started looking at ways to use the LM heater cable in the reverse direction to charge the batteries for the final entry phase. Aaron and Aldrich now started buttering with Peters for the excess power in the LM batteries. The controllers were intensely debating the risks to both systems, trading off options but keeping an eye on the clock. Aaron finally resolved the issue, we're going to charge the CSM batteries. I can't see leaving any power in the LM when we jettison it. I want a test rig set up to verify the procedures and to measure the power loss during charging. With the decision made, he turned to the SPAN team to set up a test rig to prove the procedure. While we labored in mission control, SPAN continued to dig out the answers and give us their best judgments about tough, critical questions that would lead to irrevocable decisions. How cold can the thrusters get and still fire? How many amp hours are really in the battery beyond the spec? Values. We don't want to chance skipping off the Earth's atmosphere because our trajectory is too shallow, how critical is the reentry angle? These questions triggered other questions, discussions of alternatives abounded, engineers wanted priorities. The engineers needed to know how their piece of data fit into that of other engineers working on related problems. A 100% correct answer, too late to be of use, was worthless. The white team needed answers quickly to develop the procedures, integrate them in the simulators, and voice them up to the crew. Personally, I wanted a few hours to sit and think before the white team and crew started the final eight hours of entry. I don't think Aaron got any sleep in the last 48 hours. He had delegated well, but he knew where the buck stopped. His intuition was incredible. He kept turning up at the place where the log jams were building. With a few words he cleared the jam, then moved to another room, another debate. His prescience was almost mystical. Throughout this period, astronauts in simulators tested the entry procedures, looking for traps that could endanger a near-freezing, deadly tired, and dehydrated crew. We all knew that cold and dehydration impair cognitive and motor responses, and it was now damn cold in the spacecraft. In the final 36 hours the white team came together at four-hour intervals with Aldrich, Aaron, and Peters to review the progress. Buck Willoughby, my GNC officer, was concerned about his thrusters. The LM would provide attitude control until jettisoned, then control would switch to the CM. Without heat since the explosion, the CM thrusters were dangerously cold, the propellant valves sluggish. Willoughby wanted a hot fire test to make sure they were all working before separating from the LM. The trench joined in supporting the request. Slayton lobbied to power up early, using excess power to warm the spacecraft and his crew. I vetoed most departures from the agreed procedures, stating that we had to keep them simple, and I wanted to be able to function in case of an LM battery failure. 
I intended keeping everything possible in reserve until I knew we had it made. Then and only then would I consider other options. The flight planner started a shopping list to be used when power became available. The hot fire and early power up were put at the top. Since the white team would handle the final shift for Reentry, my deadline to Aaron and Aldrich to complete the procedures was landing minus 24 hours. As the deadline approached, the crews in the simulators wanted more time to check out the final final set of procedures which were in the 10th revision. 39 pages in length and containing more than 400 entries, they were the ticket home for our crew. The astronauts in the simulator were bothered by the continual changes and the frequent updates. They wanted a run-through with the final set of procedures. I froze further changes to the procedures and agreed to give the simulator crew six more hours to give me their okay. With this delay, Lovell finally showed his exasperation with the entire process. The crew had been living in an icebox that was hurtling toward the Earth. Other than a brief overview of the intended sequence of the final eight hours, mission control had given them nothing but the Reassurances that the procedures are coming along. Lovell wanted specifics, not vague reassurances. Aldrich kept the master copy of the procedures in his personal possession, identifying each update by a revision number. He guarded them as if they were the tablets Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Others may have had markups, but his procedures were the ones that would be executed. His great fear was that he would misplace them as he moved between the meeting areas. At the time of Lovell's prodding, Aldrich was working on the third revision for Thursday, April 16th. We were less than 24 hours from entry. In the final hours, the flight planners, John O'Neill and Tommy Holloway, became the last link in the chain to get the crew back to Earth. They established a loop between the crews in the simulators, the controllers, and the work being done by Aldrich and Aaron. They tracked the instructions voiced by the Capcom to the crew. Their checks and balances virtually guaranteed that in the rush to brief the crews nothing would be overlooked. They were the guardian angels, always hovering near and making sure that we gave the crew the right information at the right time. April 16, 1970 Shortly after 5 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the white team took their positions next to Griffin's gold team members. By now my guys had been working almost continuously for about 80 hours. We had had a brief rest for about 4 to 6 hours after we passed the moon and then snatched rest when we could. I remember their eyes, dull with fatigue and shadowed by anxiety. But their confidence and focus never wavered. As controllers plugged in their headsets, they shifted the papers and notebooks on the consoles. It was tough to find a place to work. As soon as Capcom Vance brand started the entry checklist read-up, I was bombarded by calls from the controllers. Then I realized that in the rush to start the read-up to the crew, we had not made copies of the procedures for every team member. I told Branto stop while we went out for copies. This was a vexing time for the crew. Time was becoming the most critical element, and with exasperation, frustration, and exhaustion gnawing at all of us, we had to wait for another half hour while copies were made for the controllers. Aldrich took this brief opportunity to incorporate two minor revisions into the final procedures. Slayton, standing by in the MCC, had sensed the pressure and came online to the crew. With just the right tone, his reassuring presence calmed our deadly tired crew. Deke was a pilot's pilot, an operator's operator, a straight shooter. Deke reassured Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes that all was well with the procedures, and he kept up the chit-chat as the minutes passed with agonizing slowness. Coffee was the substance that kept us going, our surgeons had offered us something stronger, but we were all concerned about our performance deteriorating when the stimulants wore off. Most of us decided to make it on caffeine and cigarettes. Brand began the final read-ups 18 hours prior to entry, continuing into windless maroon team shift. Although I was concerned that something might get lost with three teams vying for the console, we had no option but to continue. 
A single slip anywhere could be fatal. We were out of time and out of options. This was our last shot. Ken. Mattingly and Joe Cowen, aces among aces as astronauts. And my Capcoms for the final shift, stood behind Vance Brand and Charlie Duke at their console during the read-up. They listened to the astronauts' questions, their voices, and inflections, making sure that they fully comprehended every step and the rationale behind it. The read-up to the crew was concluded six and a half hours before the final entry procedures were to begin, not enough time for any of us to get any rest, just time to back off a bit before the final charge. I went to the viewing room downstairs for a brief nap. Now, with a surplus of power, Windler gave the order to start power up two hours early to try to get some heat into the spacecraft to give the crew a brief respite from the cold. Throughout the entire mission I had believed in my heart that we would get the crew home, now it was becoming a reality. Generating options was our business, and options remained as long as there was power, water, oxygen, and propellant. My controllers kept. Finding Options April 17, 1970, Apollo 13 Reentry. Three hours before dawn, the white team took its place next to windless maroon team controllers. The 80 hours of uncertainty were now past and we were down to the final shift. During the return we had twice fought a shallowing trajectory, a glitch in a lifeboat battery, and a brush with Typhoon Helen at the landing site. A last-minute maneuver returned us to the reentry trajectory. But we maintained our course as our by our we closed in on our objective, Earth. The most chilling discussion came a few hours before entry, as the crew jettisoned the damaged service module and then maneuvered to observe the damage. Lovell, okay, I've got her, Houston, there is one whole side of the spacecraft missing. Right by the. Look out there, will you? Right by the. Gain antenna, the whole panel is blown off, almost from the base of the engine. Capcom, Joe Cohen copy that. Hayes, yes, it looks like it got the SPS, main engine, bell, too. That's the way it looks, unless that's just a dark brown streak. It's really a mess. Lovell, and, Joe, looks like a lot of debris is just hanging out the side near the antenna. Since the time of the explosion, I had deliberately avoided any discussion of damage to the command module, the Reentry spacecraft. Briefly my thoughts focused on our decision not to trust the engine. Was it just a lucky guess or was there some gut instinct that craft, Lunny, and I shared? The heat shield's care with John Glenn's Mercury mission was never far from my mind, but I gave this no further consideration. If there had been any damage to the command module heat shield, there was nothing we could do about it now. At a certain point the human factor has accomplished all it can. Then things rest in the hands. Of a higher power. ACI went around the horn for the final go-no-go -no -go check for entry, I felt a sense of loneliness in the room. We were getting ready to turn the crew loose. Once in blackout they were on their own, no more help from the team, no one watching over their shoulder. During the last 24 hours. I could vividly imagine how desperate the atmosphere must have been in the spacecraft, how cold and how close to the edge the crew must have been. Joe Cohen, my entry Capcom, was an astronaut and medical doctor. His bedside manner with the crew during the final hours was spectacular. He was coach, mentor, doctor, friend, and partner to the crew. At times I felt he was virtually on board the spacecraft, nudging the crew through its checklist. With my final status check and the go for entry, a feeling of melancholy filled the air in the control room, this crew was special. We just could not lose them. Once again, failure was not an option. It, it was tough to express feelings on the air ground loop with the whole world listening. On this loop both the ground and the crew tried to maintain a professional, almost unemotional tone and demeanor. Because we must be, we're conditioned to be hard on the outside, show no emotions in our response, and never betray any uncertainty. 
But at times the emotional charge passes among team members like a ray of sun breaking through the clouds, then it is gone again, Wiener mission is over and the crew is safe, my feelings of relief and pride make me choke back tears. This was not yet the time, we had a way to go, but we were close. In less than 30 minutes, the saga of Apollo 13 would be concluded. On board the spacecraft, Jack Swigert, a rookie, finally broke the silence. You could feel the emotion in his voice as he said, I know all of us here want to thank all you guys down there for the very fine job you did. Lovell chimed in, that's a firm, Joe. Cohen's response indicated how close it was, I'll tell you. We had a good time doing it. Pause. Just for your information, battery C will fail about the time your parachutes come out. You have enough in the other two for landing. Moments later, after a brief burst of static, we were in blackout. As IVE indicated, the blackout is the toughest time in a mission for the teams. Every member does his soul searching, reviewing the decisions and the data, knowing we had to be damn near perfect and knowing how tough perfection is. Every member of our team on the ground, whether at the consoles, in the back rooms, or seated with sims up, shared this common agony. Lovell's description of the damage to the service module made this agony particularly acute. Controllers were trained not to worry about things over which we have no control. We were now in the hands of God and a deadly tired crew, executing a set of procedures written on scraps of paper in the command module, procedures that had not existed 18 hours ago. The, the teams knew the fragile hold we had on the many variables, the many decisions we had made in the four days since the explosion. But this is the nature of our business, to live with risk. Everything now was irreversible. As the spacecraft and crew went through the final breaking in the lowest part of the atmosphere, the heat was intense, preventing communications. The aerodynamic braking slowed the command module from 5 miles a second to less than 100 miles per hour when the chutes opened. The glow of the ionized atmosphere surrounded the crew in brilliant fire orange as the temperatures soared outside the spacecraft. The control room was absolutely silent, the only noises were the hum of the electronics, the buzz of the air conditioning, and the occasional click of a Zippo lighter snapping open, followed by the rasp of the lighter wheel against flint. No one moved, as if everyone were chained to his console. Cigarette smoke filled the room creating a blue haze as we watched the track on the big world map tracing the path of the spacecraft to Earth, all eyes were on the clocks counting down to the end of blackout. Blackout was an eternity. I always said a prayer for the crew at this time. We were pretty good at computing the blackout times, nailing the start and stop to within seconds. I worked it out in my mind, the beginning of blackout occurred over Australia, as Retro had predicted, so the end of the blackout time should be on the nose. As the minutes passed, all eyes turned with a thousand-yard stare to the wall clocks as they counted down the final few seconds. When it hit all zeros, I told Cohen, Joe, give them a call. Cohen responded immediately, Odyssey, Houston standing by. There was no response, only static, more seconds passed and we called again, there was only static. Controllers pressed their earpieces farther into their ears, listening for the faintest signal. Cohen called again. We were now almost. A minute past the expected signal acquisition time. Still no response. Seconds turned into minutes and minutes into infinity. A sinking feeling, almost a dread, filled the room. When the wall clock rolled past one minute, we wondered what the hell had gone wrong. I wanted to smash something, hold on to something. Was there some scroop in the communication setup or relay? I told myself, they are there, we just are not hearing them. There was one irrevocable piece of data yet to come. There would be a sonic boom as the command module re-entered the atmosphere. When we received the report we would know the crew was coming back to Earth quietly, in hushed tones I called Dieterich, my retro, Chuck, were the clocks good? In a whisper he responded, they're good, flight. We waited. The world waited. 
We were 1.28 past the expected acquisition time when a crackly report from a downrange aircraft broke the tension. ARIA 4 has acquisition. I pounded the edge of the console, the room erupted, then quieted down quickly. In the movies, the controllers always stand up and cheer each mission event, but if a controller ever did that before the mission was over and the crew was on the carrier, that would be the last time he sat at a console. There was only one thought now on our minds, all we need now are the parachutes, just the parachutes. The crew was almost home. Cohen called again and a few seconds later we heard, okay, Joe. Just two words, but the intensity of the relief was overwhelming. The viewing room, the back rooms, and our instructors erupted again as they saw the shoots blossom on the TV. In the control room each controller has his moment of emotional climax. I find myself crying unabashedly, then I try to suck it in, realizing this is inappropriate. But it doesn't work, it only gets worse. I was standing at the console crying. When the crew hits the water we once again sit at our consoles. Our job is over only when the crew is on the carrier and we have. Handed our responsibility to the aircraft carrier task force commander. When this happened on Apollo 13 we finally realized that flight control and the people in the back rooms, factories, and laboratories had won the day. Our crew was home. We crew, contractors, controllers, had done the impossible. The human factor had carried the day. I was totally unprepared for the events of the next two weeks. The day following landing the flight directors and I stood on a platform with the wives and families of our crew as we received the Presidential Medal of Freedom on behalf of the mission operations teams. The cheers of our teammates, NASA engineers, and our families rose in crescendo as President Nixon concluded reading the award citation, three brave astronauts are alive and on Earth because of their, the mission operations teams, dedication, and because at the critical moments the people of that team were wise enough and self-possessed enough to make the right decisions. Their extraordinary feat is a tribute to man's ingenuity, to his resourcefulness and to his courage. When our glittering technology failed us, our resourcefulness and courage, as well as every bit of the experience gained since the abortive 4-inch Mercury launch, had carried the day. Two weeks later on May 1, 1970, the flight directors and our wives flew to Chicago on the NASA administrator's private aircraft for a luncheon and ticker tape parade. As the aircraft pulled to a stop, the throbbing pulsing tempo of Aquarius played by City High School bands filled the air on the tarmac. The tempo matched my heartbeat as we waved to the airport crowd and were greeted by the city council. During a luncheon at Chicago's Palmer House, Lovell was awarded the city's Medal of Merit and we were each given the key to Chicago by Mayor Richard Daly. After lunch Marta and the wives took their place in the reviewing stand as we were escorted to the parade automobiles. Jim Lovell and Jack Swigert took the lead in a Lincoln convertible. SIG Schoberg took the second while the flight directors were paired in Cadillac convertibles. Milt Windler and I rode in the third car and were followed by Lunny and Griffin. Fred Hayes did not attend as he was still recovering from the flight. The convertibles were flanked by three layers of police, plainclothes men next to the convertible, a second row in crisp uniforms with white gloves, and a third row of police motorcycle escort. Screaming sirens and flashing red lights of the police outriders added to the cacophony. As we passed around the Chicago Loop, fireboats in the Chicago River sent streams of water into the air. The cheers of the crowd made it impossible to talk. Chicago will always remain in my memory as a class city, and I thank them for the moments they gave us to bask in the eye of the public. When we returned to the airplane after the exhausting day, a box containing a silver punch bowl was on each of the wives' seats. Upon return we each had to submit paperwork to the NASA legal folks to determine whether we could keep the gift from Mayor Daly and the city of Chicago. Since the punch bowls were engraved, the lawyers decided we could keep them. I think everyone, once in his life, should be given a ticker tape parade. 
The Apollo 13 debriefing had few surprises. We learned that the tank failure was due to a combination of a design flaw, mishandling during changeout, a draining procedure after a test that damaged the heater circuit, and a poor selection of the telemetry measurement range for the heater temperatures. The debriefing party at the Hofbrogotten was merciless, beginning with a parody of the mission. The tape prepared by the Apollo 13 backup crew and the Capcoms was not for the thin-skinned. The parody began and ended with the immortal words Liebergott and I exchanged early in the crisis. Kranz, I don't understand that, sigh. Liebergott, I think we may have had an instrumentation problem, flight. The clips of the voice tapes from the mission and the press conferences were interwoven with a Spike Jones record, gospel music, and various sound effects. No one was spared. As the tape continued, the crews and controllers roared and poured more beer. The tape took a shot at every flight director and crew member, as well as Slayton, Kraft, and even President Nixon. By the time the evening was over the words I don't understand that, Sai were forever embedded in memory. There were no more missions in 1970. After we snatched victory from the jaws of defeat on Apollo 13, the rest of the year was a time of change, hard work, and frustration as further cuts were ordered in the flight schedule. Winners, however, persevere. We had a job to do and we sure as hell were going to do it. We had four more lunar missions, we had to get the Crusto the moon, attain our objectives, and get those crews back. 20. Shepard's Return The downtime needed for redesign of the service module gave us an opportunity to take a breath and look around. The world was a mess and so was our country. White adults were attacking black children being bused to school. Black panthers were shooting it out with police in our cities. For students were killed by the National Guard on the campus at Kent State University. Egypt and Israel were at war, airliners were being bombed or hijacked, and civil wars were erupting around the world. I was frustrated by the lack of national leadership, the absence of individuals capable of rallying the many voices, putting the pieces back together. I had my own doubts about the war in Vietnam and the course set by the president and political leaders but I refused to dump the blame for the way the war was going on the military. The space program was also suffering. The lunar program was coming to an end. With the cancellations of the last Apollo missions 18, 19, and 20 I felt betrayed. It was as if Congress was ripping our heart out, gutting. The program we had fought so hard to build. Leadership. fragile. It is more a matter of mind and heart than resources, and it seemed that we no longer had the heart for those things that demanded discipline, commitment, and risk. The future of our space program after Apollo was a small Earth-orbiting space station dubbed Skylab. Its mission included astronomy, life sciences, Earth studies, and a grab bag of other experiments. The Skylab space station would use the leftover hardware from the cancelled Apollo missions. During the period after the Apollo 13 mission, a small team of controllers continued to follow the redesign of the oxygen system, while others were reassigned to the developing Skylab program. John Llewellyn was one of the controllers reassigned. I believed his trajectory skills could be put to good use in the Skylab Earth studies. John initially was not happy with the reassignment, but I was convinced that he would eventually come around. Two programs, the computing services, not to mention our budget, were tight, and all computer runs were prioritized based on need and schedule. One afternoon I got a call from a computer operator asking if I had authorized some runs by Llewellyn. My response was short. Not that I know of, but it is possible they are for his Earth Resources project. The operator said, Gene, you better look at these. They are for a lunar trajectory that lands on the back side of the moon. There aren't any sites on the back side, I said, and I don't know what in the hell John is doing. Send the computer run requests up to the office. In short order, John was standing at attention in front of my desk. 
he was never one who stammered or tried to mince words. He came right at you, and you better be ready for every emotion except regret. John never apologized. He believed that offense was the best defense. I found it hard to keep a straight face as my judo partner. Proceeded to explain why he was studying landings on the back side of the moon. As he talked he paced the room, gesturing wildly in patriotic fervor. We think the program is pretty well fucked up. This cancellation of the rest of the Apollo missions is a bunch of shit, and we're trying to do something about it. John both challenged me and piqued my curiosity. We stood nose to nose. John, just who the hell is we? He ignored my question and continued, Jean, can't you see what the hell is going on? The pokes, John's favorite word for bureaucrats, are taking over and pretty damn soon there won't be anything left of the space program. I know you had to put someone in this crappy job you gave me, but you better be aware that I am a retro first, and the section chief for Earth Resources second. John then stormed out. My office echoed from his shouting, and I still did not know what had set him off and what he was thinking. An hour later, I received a visit from our geologist astronaut, Jack Schmidt. He knocked on the door, politely walking into the office. I understand you just had a talk with Llewellyn, he said. Now I was really confused, but I was starting to suspect that I had uncovered something that Schmidt probably had started. My suspicion was confirmed when he said, I've got a small study group going on alternate lunar missions. We meet after work in my apartment. I provide the refreshments. Jack Schmidt was the astronaut most like a member of the flight control team. He was a geologist, and the son of a geologist, who had explored Indian reservations in his native New Mexico as a boy. Jack had assembled some of the early composite lunar photographs while he was working in Flagstaff, Arizona. Accepted as a scientist astronaut in 1965, he finished second in his class of 50 in Air Force flight school. At NASA, Jack helped develop the scoops, shovels, and other tools that were used to dig samples from the lunar crust. Jack was unique, an intellectual with degrees from the California Institute of Technology and Harvard but with the soul of an adventurer. He was at every flight control party, celebrating each victory, big or small dot a favorite of the controllers, he was one of the few astronauts who really put a few away at our parties, the others nursed their drinks. He was loud, effervescent, brash, not quite my image of the typical scientist. Schmidt seemed to have no limit to his interests, no end to his enthusiasms. He was an instigator who dropped a few well-chosen words in receptive ears and then let events roll on to what he knew would be stormy, noisy, and wild conclusion. Currently without a mission assignment, Jack wanted to make sure that he got to the moon, and the more missions on the schedule, the better his chances. I went to Jack's next study session and was not surprised at finding Llewellyn and a handful of my flight controllers. And flight designers. As I watched them work, I had the impression they were a bunch of Boy Scouts setting up tents and starting campfires. It was the same impression I had had of a similar bunch when I joined the space task group. It was crowded in the apartment and the crosstalk was lively. Point one moment they were busily sketching out mission options, and then debating the pros and cons of missions to the back side of the moon for the final Apollo flights. The team believed that if we could pull off something spectacular, something that had never been done before, we might recapture the interest of the American public and get the cancelled missions back in the program. After all, the space hardware was already bought and paid for, and the team did not want to let the Saturn boosters and capsules end up as displays in museums. The risks involved in a backside landing might well create compelling drama. The risks would again put the lunar program on the front page of the newspapers, and for a few days we would capture the public's interest. During a backside landing, mission control could not give the crew any help. The crew would be on their own in a virtually uncharted world and, like the early explorers, living by courage and ingenuity alone. We would not even know whether they landed or crashed until the CSM relayed the status a half hour later. 
These would be explorers like Bird, Scott, Perry, and Cook. Schmidt's team continued its work, Llewellyn got his computer time, and when I had a chance, I joined the discussions. I wondered if meetings like this had happened before the master mariner Christopher Columbus decided to find the Indies be sailing west. The plan never had a chance, never got to the attention of NASA management, but Llewellyn, Schmidt, and their team members believed it was better to go down fighting than to meekly accept defeat. Schmidt wasn't going to let the Apollo program come to an end without making sure that a real geologist set foot on the moon. Mission Control, and the small group that worked in his apartment, cheered Schmidt the day he got his assignment to Apollo 17, the mission that would close the era of lunar exploration. January 31, 1971, Apollo 14 Mission Control was a world bounded by math and physics, a world of statistics and probabilities. We were not superstitious, but we knew that every time we flew we were rolling the dice. We had beaten the odds on the last three missions. Probability said that someday we would run out of luck as we almost did with Apollo 13. So we treated every mission as if it were our very first one. I was out of the flight director rotation again, Frank, Griffin, Lunny, and Windler led the Apollo 14 teams. With a nod to the Wright brothers, the crew of Apollo 14 had named the spaceship the Kitty Hawk. Apollo 14 lifted off on the last day in January, headed for the Apollo 13 landing site, F.I. Morrow. Alan Shepard, the first American in space, was the mission commander. Shepard had been scheduled to lead one of the first Gemini missions, but had been grounded by a rare inner ear disorder that caused severe vertigo. Like Slayton, he had been looking out for the Interests of the Astronaut Corps, then, in the summer of 1968, when he was partially deaf, he took a chance on experimental ear surgery to correct the vertigo and, against the odds, it worked. There wasn't enough time to get sentimental, but all of us shared the pleasure of Shepard's comeback. Ten years earlier, while the nation watched and prayed and wondered, he soared into space in a capsule called Freedom 7. In just 15 minutes the ride was over, but we had opened the door to space just that much wider. Now 4-7, Alan's appearance had changed little. He still resembled the actor Steve McQueen, and had a direct, no. no nonsense, I am what I am kind of air about him. He always looked you right in the eye, and you felt he was looking right through you. He would go on to become an admiral, one of the few who attained that rank without ever commanding a major ship. The list was small but distinguished, and two of the other names on it were the explorer Richard Byrd and Hyman Rickover, the pioneer of the nuclear submarine program. Shepard's compatriot in Apollo 14's lunar module, the Antares, was Ed Mitchell, a naval aviator flying his first mission and a virtual unknown to most of the controllers. Mitchell dabbled in psychic phenomena and for once I was sorry that I had moved Llewellyn out of the retro job. I would have liked to see if they could pull off a retro fire data exchange via mental telepathy. Stu Rusa, the command module pilot, had been my Capcom on Apollo 9 and had won the most valuable player award. At mission completion, when we light up the cigars, an 18-inch replica of the crew's Mission patch is hung on the wall of the control room. The flight directors, by consensus, select the single controller considered most valuable to hang the patch. Like many of my controllers, Rusa came from Oklahoma, bringing with him the cheerful exuberance of a farm boy. You might say we had a mixed bag of characters playing in this one. Rusa faced the first challenge when the docking system malfunctioned. In spite of Rusa's precise maneuvering, Three docking attempts in two hours failed to dock the CSM with the LM. Even the tiniest debris lodged in the mechanism would account for the latches failing to engage. Running out of time, fuel, and options, MCC decided to advise him to come in fast and dock with a bang. Rusa would ram the lunar module, in effect, doing a ring-to-ring -ring docking. Shepard turned to Rusa and said, Stu, just forget about trying to conserve fuel. This time, juice it. 
While Ruza thrusted against the docking ring, Shepard manually fired the latches. The technique worked, and after some hair-raising moments, the mission was back on track. Spaceflight rarely gives you a second chance, but Apollo 14 was the exception. Crisis management textbooks use the term prodrome to define a warning or intimation of an impending crisis. I define it as the signal that causes the hair on the back of your neck to rise. With luck, someone picks up the signal, recognizes something is wrong, and starts an action that short-circuits the crisis. The mission had gone well, and Shepard and Mitchell were in the LM, setting up the switches and computer for the descent to F.I. Moro. The timeline had been followed almost perfectly, the crew and ground were in sync. It was the way we like it when we are getting ready to land on the moon. Bordered with black and yellow tape and centered in the LM control panel was a round, red push-button switch. The white letters abort on the in button distinguished this switch as the one that started an irreversible process to terminate a mission. It was used. Only when there was no other alternative. The switch had electrical contacts to issue signals to the LM engines, computer, and abort electronics. When the abort switch for Apollo 14's LM had been manufactured, a small piece of metal had been left in the switch. Now, in zero gravity, and with both crew and ground oblivious, this piece of metal was floating among the contacts of the switch, randomly making intermittent connections. Dick Thorson was the LM control engineer for the descent and landing. Using his console television display, he was tracking the crew's progress through the checklist. The CSM had undocked and separated from the LM. Shepard and Mitchell in the LM were passing on the front side of the moon on the final orbit, one hour before starting the lunar descent. All was looking good in both spacecraft and in the MCC. After Apollo 13, the controller's console warning light logic had been reversed to aid the controller in rapidly recognizing a changing status in critical systems. Of the hundreds of event lights on Thorson's panel, only a few were now illuminated, the earlier problems with the docking system were long forgotten, the focus now was keeping to the precise timing for the landing trajectory. Out of the corner of his eye, Dick not eat a change in his status panel. He glanced up quickly to see a red light at his console that indicated the crew had pushed the LM abort switch. This did not make sense. Thinking there might be telemetry patching error to the light panel at his console. He selected a TV display that let him look into the guts of the computer. Rapidly scanning down the list he saw that computer channel 30, bit 1, abort, had been set on. He kept his call and called the back room to get a reading directly from the data stream. The technician confirmed, channel 30, bit 1 is set. There was no doubt now, this was a valid indication. If the LM engine had been running, the abort bit would have signaled the computer to change operating modes from the landing mode to the ascent rendezvous mode. When this occurred, the descent engine would automatically throttle up. If the LM was close to the lunar surface and near fuel exhaustion, the computer would command a fire in the whole staging. This staging sequence would shut down the descent engine, fire the explosive bolts to separate the ascent and descent stages, and ignite the ascent engine, while simultaneously changing computer programs and switching electrical power and control to the ascent stage, when you started the ascent engine, which was buried in a cavity and to death descent stage, under these conditions, you had a fire in the whole situation. All events occurred in fractions of a second. The sequence had to work perfectly. If the crew was near the surface and the abort bit set, it would, at best, eliminate the possibility of landing. Coupled with other malfunctions, it could lead to a lunar crash. The abort bit now illuminated on Thorson's console quickly got his full attention. In the span room, two of Thorson's counterparts, Hal Loden and Bob Carlton, also noticed that the abort bit had been set. Without hesitation Carlton, the silver fox, leaned over Loden's shoulder. In a laconic drawl he said, we should get the crew to knock on the panel. 
Great controllers seem to have a prodigious memory and the gift of excellent recall. Carlton remembered a NASA alert bulletin that cited problems with internal switch contamination. Loden concurred with Carlton's rather unusual troubleshooting and told Thorson on the intercom, Dick, have the crew knock on the panel by the switch and let's see if the abort indication goes away. We may have a contaminated switch. Thorson momentarily wondered if this wasn't a crazy idea, but he didn't save any alternative to offer. He stood up, stretching his headset cord, and walked to the side of flight director Jerry Griffin's console. In the high-tech age of Apollo, he was embarrassed to resort to shade tree mechanic fixes in front of the whole world. Leaning toward Griffin, Dick puffed on his cigarette and hoarsely muttered, Jerry, I'm seeing an abort indication. In the lunar module. Have the crew verify that the button is not depressed. Thorson now had Griffin's attention as he continued, if they say negative, have them knock on the panel while we watch it. The Capcom, Fred Hayes, passed the instruction to the crew. The crew, unaware of the potential gravity of the situation, acknowledged the call. Mitchell reached over and tapped on the switch with a flashlight. At Thorson's console the light and TV indication disappeared. Thorson called out, Jerry, I'm no go. I've got some problems here and it is going to take some time to work them out. Griffin waved off the landing attempt, and Apollo 14 had dodged a bullet. The crew and control team received another chance. The crisis was real. But with advance warning the team could develop options to save the mission. The critical element once again was time. We had precious few hours to work on the problem. Thorson's dilemma was a thorny one, to land, we needed to bypass the switch, but if we had problems during landing, we needed the switch to abort. It was a hell of a risk gain trade. While developing the mission rules, the LM controllers studied every switch and circuit breaker in the spacecraft, assessing the failure potential of each and options to work around a switch failure. This included the case where a failed switch would set the abort bit in the computer. Thorson's team had developed a set of instructions to tell the computer to ignore the abort switch. Thorson now reached into his bag of tricks, addressing Griffin, Flight, I've got a software patch for the LM computer that will disable channel 30, bit 1, in the computer. It will lock out the abort switch for the landing. Griffin listened intently, then frowned as Thorson. Concluded by saying, there is only one problem. If the crew has to abort, they will have to use the backup system or the computer keyboard to manually enter the abort program for the primary system. Griffin was willing to buy the extra risk, and he knew without asking that Shepard would, too. Dick, dig out the patch, he instructed, and run it through span and get with the simulator people. If it works, I'm going to give it a go. Astronauts were soon clambering into the simulators, with the results to be relayed instantly to Capcom Hayes. Satisfied with the ongoing action, Griffin called his team to attention, resetting the timeline for the landing. The answers were needed in less than two hours. In the Flight Dynamics staff room, Jack Garman listened to the conversation. Garman was the computer expert who had helped Steve Bales out of his hole on Apollo 11. Now he had to come up with the answer to a different problem. Jack was normally excitable and when there was an option to use his software to save a mission, he leaped into action. Garmin talked with every part of his body, eyes, and hands constantly in motion. Within seconds, he was on the voice loop to the software team at MIT. Like Griffin, he was worried about the time it would take the crew to make the computer entries if they had to abort. Garmin felt that the crew needed a software patch to protect against the switch failure that would still give them the ability to use the abort button. He didn't know whether such a patch could be developed, but he sure as hell was going to give it a try. Mitt was listening to the astronaut voice loops and had heard the discussion about the software patch to bypass the abort switch. They had already cranked into action. MIT's Draper Laboratory developed the guidance and navigation systems for Apollo. To assist in rapid troubleshooting during a mission, the MCC was in direct communications with the lab. 
Within an hour the Draper lab came up with a procedure that gave us an option to bypass the abort switch at engine start and then renable the switch. The procedure was complex and time critical. Sight unseen, Griffin elected to give the new procedure a shot. Communications were a mess during the final frontside pass. Static crackled and punctuated Hayes' instruction Stone Mitchell. The procedure required the crew to start the engine at a low power, using the acceleration to move the contaminating piece of metal away from the switch contacts. Once the engine was started, Mitchell would insert a string of 16 computer commands to enable guidance and provide steering. When this was completed, another string of 16 commands would disable the abort program, and another 14 commands would lock into the landing radar and the descent software. This entire sequence would occur as the crew was descending to the moon. The mission now rested on an emergency patch to the flight software that was less than two hours old, had been simulated only once, and was being performed by a crew that had never practiced it. Every step had to be executed precisely on time and in sequence. Sitting on the step behind Griffin, I looked into the viewing room. I could see the spectators buzzing. Our words and procedures were gibberish to them. I and the mission operations control room, it was just another day, another final exam, as the controllers calmly chipped away at the final procedures and counted the seconds until engine start. The controllers' ability to focus at times like this was nothing short of a miracle, a miracle of ingenuity, discipline, and training. Shepard sounded just as he had all those years ago when he first went into space. Marvelously calm, his voice was flat and emotionless as Mitchell read the checklist, verified the switches, and entered data to the computer. With split second. Teamwork, we started down to the moon. Mitchell. Announced, engine start. Thorson, staring at the abort switch display. Added, 10% thrust. Throttle up. I see no abort indications. Mitchell quickly entered the first string of commands to bypass the abort bit. With the successful entry of the data, you could hear the relief in Shepard's voice. Thank you, Houston, nice job down there. Just another day at mission control. Thorson's eyeballs, which had been locked onto the abort bit, now swung over to his engine systems. Jerry, I'm go, he confirmed. All of the data is incorrectly. The abort program is bypassed. Fred Hayes, the Apollo 13 LM pilot, then talked Mitchell through the rest of the workaround procedure. With a lyrical comment from Alan Shepard it's a beautiful day to land at F.I. Moro, the LM and Terry's was on its way to the moon. We had skated across thin ice and reached the other side. But the battle was not over. The team would be challenged once more. Prior to starting the descent the guidance officer provided the navigation and target data to the lunar module computer for landing. The computer then developed the guidance commands to reach the target during descent. In the final phase of the landing, the LM computer needed more accurate data than that provided by mission control. There might be an error of several thousand feet between the altitude data provided by the MCC and the true altitude provided by the LM radar. Mission rules required an abort if the radar data was not obtained before descending to 10,000 feet. Landing without a good hack at the altitude would be worse than landing on a carrier on the ocean on a dark night. There was no good way to judge height. LM landing fuel was tight, so that a grope and feel approach would deplete fuel prior to touchdown leaving the crew in a low-down fire in the hull abort, not a good situation. Passing through 32,000 feet, Mitchell started looking for the landing radar data. In mission control, guidance officer Will Presley queued up his displays. He had about 90 seconds to make a judgment to accept the data or, if it was not in limits, abort the mission. The radar data did not show up when expected, and Presley in the MCC and Shepard in the LM both had to be thinking, where the hell is the radar? In a voice lacking conviction, Presley gave Griffin a go to continue descent at five minutes, knowing that in the next 60 seconds he would have to call an abort if he didn't get radar. I knew his stomach had to be churning. 
The LM radar was Thorson's responsibility. He and Griffin were also watching for the indications that the radar was tracking the surface. Griffin was the first to move. Dick, you got anything you want to try? Thorson reached into his bag for the only thing that could be done in a few seconds, flight, have them cycle the circuit breaker. Quickly, Shepard acknowledged, cycled. Seconds later, a jubilant Will Presley shouted, flight, we got radar lockup. Every controller had been holding his breath. For a few seconds the voice comm was noisy as all exhaled, some even whistled. Presley's next words were virtually shouted, tripping over each other as he blurted, altitude data is go, except the radar. From there on, the landing was a piece of cake. Of course, Alan Shepard walked on the moon and left behind two souvenirs for some future explorers to find. Somewhere in the craters of the moon are two golf balls, the first ever hit in outer space. He attached the head of a Spalding 6 iron to a tool used to scoop up lunar soil. This was done for the highly scientific purpose of seeing how far a golf ball would travel in gravity that was one-sixth the Earth's. Actually, he duffed his first shot. It got more dirt than ball, he confessed to our controllers. That looked like a slice to me, oh, came the reply. His second shot travelled, by his estimate, miles and miles. The experiment did not appear on anyone's manifest, but Shepard had cleared it with Deke Slayton. The agreement was that he would do it only if the landing had gone well, and it had. Years later, Ol would reflect, I'm probably a lot more famous for being the guy who hit the golf ball on the moon, than I am for being the first American in space. After the post-mission debriefing, Mitchell invited. Thorson and several members of the trench to dinner. Mitchell, the astronaut who believed in psychic phenomena, said that he knew moments before the call that Thorson was going to have the crew cycle the landing radar circuit breaker. Griffin and Thorson were never sure whether Ed was kidding them or not. They were just happy it all worked out. After the debriefing, Shepard took Griffin aside and confided, I had come too far to abandon the moon. I would have continued the approach even without the radar. On Apollo 14 the error in the LM computer's knowledge of the actual altitude was almost 4,000 feet before the landing radar data update. With an error this great in the computer, Griffin and the trench were convinced Shepard would have run out of fuel before landing. But everyone who knew all never doubted he would have given it a shot. We also never doubted he would have had to abort. The fuel budget was just too tight. In the three moon landings, the crews and controllers had become masters of improvisation. With three lunar missions to go, we were pretty cocky, feeling that there was no emergency we could not handle and nothing that would defeat us. 21. What do you do after the moon? Spring 1971. One morning in the spring of 1971 Jerry Griffin walked into my office. Briskly, he said, the 15 crew thinks it would be good for you to take a break and get out of this stuffy cell. How would you like to go on the next field geology trip with the crew and myself? I felt my pulse speed up a bit. This was something new, something different, something pure fun. I knew nothing of field geology, but since we had won the race to the moon, the shift to lunar science dominated much of our effort. This trip might provide an opportunity to get smart on a new aspect of the business. Lately, I had spent much of my time with the lunar scientists and, although they were much older than my controllers, they had a similar kind of enthusiasm, energy, and commitment to the future of manned spaceflight. Knowing how important the data collected in the Apollo missions would be to our understanding of unknowns like the formation of the solar system, I made sure that my controllers served them well in the planning and execution of their experiments. So when they asked me to work with and learn from them, I jumped at the chance. The field geology trips provided the practical training ground to complement the astronauts' classroom training. By their nature, astronauts were curious, and many became dedicated to studying the space sciences. Scott, Griffin, and 
I made for a colorful trio, to put it mildly. All three of us had flown jet fighters. Scott could have served as a poster for astronaut recruitment. He and Griffin shared a cheery exuberance, a perpetual optimism, and a zest for their work. The field sites were the laboratories for the astronauts preparing to explore the lunar surface. No terrestrial site could replicate the lunar surface, but there were locations where the rugged terrain could provide conditions similar to those found in the moon. While training the astronauts, the geology instructors used sites that covered the globe, from the volcanic areas of Iceland to the Grand Canyon, from the mountains of New Mexico to the craters of Hawaii. This training would be vital in selecting the materials to be returned to Earth from the Moon and in answering such questions as the Moon's age and composition. I had first met the lunar surface science teams in the conference to set up their operating structure. I got to know more of them when my flight control division inherited. The operation of the experiment packages placed on the moon during each lunar mission. Our scientists didn't pay much attention to bureaucratic structure. They wanted to work directly with the crews and controllers to establish a mutual understanding and supportiveness that would make their work on the moon much more productive. No one among them impressed me more than Lee Silver. He stood out as we were setting up the surface science rooms, and again during the skull sessions at the apartment of Jack Schmidt. Silver had taught Schmidt as a student at Caltech, and it was obvious they shared the same passions. Silver's academic credentials were formidable, but the man was even more impressive. You can tell great teachers by their demeanor, how they talk, how they always seem effortlessly in control. Silver appeared born to roam the deserts and mountains, reading the land. William Muehlberger, from the University of Texas, had the same characteristics. Each geologist approached his work passionately, you felt this passion when you were around them. Schmidt, Silver, and Muehlberger inspired and motivated others much in the same way as my other great teachers like Harry Carroll at McDonnell in St. Louis, Jack Coleman in flight training, Ralph Saylor at Holloman, and Chris Kraft in the MCC, all supremely confident and capable leaders and teachers. Since I had trained in fighters at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada, I was familiar with the general terrain as our helicopter lifted off at dawn for the flight to the north end of Frenchman's Flat, 90 miles northwest of Las Vegas. I had flown over this area en route to the gunnery and bombing ranges but I had never really looked closely at the surface. From the helicopter, I was amazed at the results of the nuclear tests that had pockmarked the desert as far as the eye could see. The craters are myriad of desert colors, the rocks. And boulders arrayed from the blast point, flying low over the area. I imagined this was what the surface of the moon might have looked like, except for the colors, as Armstrong and Aldrin described it during and after the landing. The bond between teacher and student astronaut was clearly evident on the way to the site as Silver and his students engaged in a lively Q&A session. There was not a wasted moment from the time we crossed the snowy mountains and descended to the test site. The Apollo 15 crew, Scott and Irwin, attacked their role as surface geologists with the intensity and enthusiasm they demonstrated in learning to fly a new spacecraft. To them, the surface experiments were just another form of flight test. They were exploring a new world full of riches for the scientists, and were in competition with their predecessors and themselves. Griffin and I were really just along for the ride, but we found out quickly that Silver had other ideas after a brief. S Summary of the training objectives, Lee gave me a quick course in Field Geology 101, then sent me off to find as many different materials as possible within walking distance of our landing site. I had no clue where to start, but I felt obligated to give it my best shot. Griffin tagged along with the crew, listening as Silver laid out their project for the morning. I learned to use my eyes to detect subtle changes in hue, composition, and texture of the land to see the parts and assemble the whole, then to work it in reverse, striving always for the big picture, looking for cause and effect. After Silver's brief training, I could visualize the great collisions as the meteors showered the moon, 
instantly forming the craters and hurtling the rocks and boulders enormous distances in the low gravity of that airless sphere. On the final Apollo missions, a jeep-like vehicle called the Lunar Rover extended the range of operations on the surface. The rover had a television camera mounted on it. One that Ed Findell and his team would control from 240,000 miles away to bring history into the homes and offices of the world. The first priority was to use that camera for studying the lunar surface. We could now see what the astronauts saw, close up and in real time. It was like being able to look over the shoulders of Lewis and Clark as they trekked into the great unknown of their era. Scott and Irwin would be the first humans to walk the vast and incredibly lonely Hadley Apennine region. At the atomic test site, I could visualize what they would see, touch, and do. Back at MCC, the challenge of the final three missions was emotional as much as technical. My controllers, average age now 27, were asking themselves, what do you do after you have been to the moon? They had come to us at the beginning of Apollo, in their early 20s. Now, with NASA limiting the program to only three. More missions, they were taking it the hardest. Mission control was their port alto the stars, they believed we had taken only that first giant step for mankind and could not understand why we were not taking the next leap forward. I knew how they felt. When I won my wings, I believed I would fly fighters forever. When me dream ended, my world folded. So I had to pick myself up and get on with life, and find a new vision. In the process I took a lucky fork in the road that got me first into flight testing and then into the space program. It was that one in a million chance you take in life that pays off. In 1971 a big part of my job was convincing my young controllers that there was a damned interesting and challenging world after Apollo. Together we would take the next fork in the road and blaze a path into the next era of space. I am a dreamer, believing that the mark of a champion is the ability to thrive in tough times. I was convinced that mission control would evolve, adapt, and exploit every opportunity. We can make the future ours if we believe and fight to make it happen. Change was again in the wind. The high visibility of my controllers provided them with opportunities for top-level leadership roles. In 1970 Glyn Lunny had travelled with Robert Gilruth to Moscow to determine the degree of Russia's interest in a joint space mission and the resources the Russians would make available for it. Now after Apollo 15, Lunny joined Hodge and Charlesworth in top management. While I lost extremely capable leaders, I had the opportunity to bring along another new generation of young leaders in the Mission Control Leadership Lab. Every young man or woman coming in at the bottom could take a shot at a flight director, division, or branch slot in the first 10 years of their career. In the final days of Apollo I was fortunate to be knee-deep in mission-ready leaders, most veterans of 20. Or more space missions, including those of Gemini and Apollo. The only fear, with the constant juggling of priorities and people, was the loss of focus on the final three missions. I also knew that any major mission glitch would give those who were nervous about the risk an opportunity to argue that since the moon had been reached there was no need for the remaining missions. I was glad the final flights would be led in mission control by three former aviators, who understood how to live with and manage risk. Maybe it was our fighter aircraft mentality, or maybe it was our confidence in the human factor, but flight directors Jerry Griffin, Pete Frank, and I believe the nation had sacrificed too much to surrender to the increasingly conservative national leadership. As we opened the era of extended lunar operations, we felt fully capable of meeting every challenge that we and our crews would face during the final missions. To extend the range of the lunar expeditions, modifications had been made in the LM to provide stowage. For the battery-powered, jeep-like rover, we shaved our mission rule margins and, with extra oxygen and batteries, we extended the surface duration to almost three days. Extravehicular activity was planned for each day the crew spent on the lunar surface. 
The CSM also received a facelift. A full bay had been filled with instruments to map the lunar surface, study its physical environment, and investigate its gravitational and magnetic properties. The controllers and the new lunar orbital scientists learned from each other about the science and operations of space exploration, developing the rapport needed for successful missions. Approaching the end of Apollo, my frustration often surfaced. No one in America seemed to care that we were giving up, surrendering the future of the next generation of young people with stars in their eyes. Often I sat silently, somewhat moodily in my office, rereading President Kennedy's words, the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look. Behind them, this country was conquered by those who moved forward, and so will space. But what if we had not pushed ahead, exploring and opening the American frontier? What sort of nation would we have been? What were the implications for our decision not to push ahead now? How I wished John F. Kennedy was still alive, challenging us to dare and to dream. I feel the same way today, the boldness and scope of his vision is not to be found today in our space program and in our nation. July 1971 As budgets tightened and public support waned, NASA was resigned to the cancellation of the Apollo 18 and 19 missions. The tough choices prompted the grand old man of lunar science, Harold Huey, to write in the Washington Post, we wish to finish a job which has beautifully begun and now we get stingy. Because of the additional cost of 25 cents per year for each of us, we are dropping the final two flights to the moon. How foolish and short-sighted from the view of history can we be? The final three missions were no easier than the earlier ones. The complexity of the spacecraft systems as well as the objectives for each mission made it unlikely that any mission would be trouble-free. In retrospect I am still amazed that we risked so much, so often, and came through unscathed again and again. At times, I believed Providence watched over us all. Kraft was now preoccupied with the future and his inevitable promotion to Master of Science Director. Seated in Kraft's chair since Apollo 13 was S.I.G. Schoberg. In many ways, I felt vaguely uncomfortable without Kraft in charge, almost as if he were our bearer of good luck, our talisman in mission control. S.I.G., invariably accompanied by Bill Tyndall, was radically different from Kraft. He was a custometto being the deputy, not the sheriff. I could get mad at Kraft, standing face to face, pounding out my position. Chris had a short fuse. His expression would change to the incredulous, then his face would turn red and he would invariably start with, I don't give a damn what you think. Then he would lay out his position. But then Kraft would always listen. It was great having a boss who felt so emotional about the job, and was willing to engage in a brawl if needed to get to the best answer. It was tough, almost impossible, to get mad at Schoberg. He was just too nice. He reminded me of a grandfather with his grandchildren, always giving a kind word of encouragement. Only infrequently did he ever admonish his charges, and then quietly. When I first met SIG, at Langley, my family was growing. One day, he arrived at work and asked me out to his car. When he opened the trunk, I saw a large old tricycle, almost the size of a rickshaw. I had never seen one so large or sturdy. SIG said, we don't need it anymore. I would like your kids to have it. This remarkable man had not only this sweetness of character but real depth and earnestness. SIG Schoberg took over the four divisions of flight operations in 1969 after Kraft became Dr. Gilruther's deputy director. Schoberg and Kraft were born to be together. We were sure that Sig's position as our boss was only temporary and that he would become Kraft's deputy for the Master of Science when Gilruth retired and Chris took over. July 26, 1971, Apollo 15 After a glitchless countdown, the Cape launch team handed Griffin a virtually perfect command module. Named Endeavour. Conscious of the importance of science for their mission, Dave Scott, Jim Irwin, 
An old word and named their craft for the ship commanded by Captain James Cook. That endeavour sailed in 1768 from England to Tahiti to observe the passage of the planet Venus between the Earth and the Sun. The LM was dubbed Falcon, in honour of the Air Force mascot for an all Air Force crew. The launch and orbital checkout of the CSM and booster clocked off in the normally intense timeline. After TLI booster engine cut off, a series of critical events takes place for a half hour, starting with the separation of the CSM from the booster followed by the turnaround and docking with the lunar spacecraft nestled atop the booster. While taking a breather before extracting the LM, Ol Worden looked around the cockpit, casually noting, the main engine thrust light on the entry monitoring system panel is on. I'm not sure when it came on. Instantly, GNC Gary Cohen snapped, flight, panel 8, have the crew pull both pilot valve circuit breakers. Worden replied, OK, they're pulled. Gary continued, flight, the engine is now safe. The thrust light indicated the CSM main rocket engine was armed and ready to fire. An engine start signal triggering actual engine ignition during the critical turnaround, docking, an extraction sequence could have crashed the CSM into the LM or the booster. Pausing briefly, Cohen continued, I think we have an electrical short in the engine start circuit. With MCC's preliminary diagnosis and the rocket engine now safe, the astronauts continued the timeline, firing the pyros to release the LM and firing thrusters to maneuver away from the booster stage. The initial hours on the outward journey of a mission are always busy. There are many housekeeping items, and when they are completed the crew and control. Teams settle into a groove for the three-day transit. To the moon. Every glitch must be closed out so the work is distributed among the teams. Much of the systems and analysis work, like determining the cause and cure of this engine electronics glitch, is assigned to the shift that is on duty when the crew is sleeping. Griffin handed the thrust problem to Windler. After a brief period of troubleshooting, Windler passed the problem to Lunny's team to develop the workaround procedures, the workaround had to have three parts, protecting against an unplanned engine start, keeping the engine running during the maneuver, and cutting the engine off at the correct time. Every system on a spacecraft is critical, but when you had to make up your mind whether or not to go into lunar orbit, the Service Propulsion System, SPS, in the CSM moved to the top of the list. It must work to get into lunar orbit and once in orbit it was the crew's ticket home. The SPS design provided redundant electronics, electrical power, and propellant feed systems, but there was only one engine nozzle and a single set of propellant tanks. So any leaks were cause for rapid mission termination. Mission rules require full redundancy of the engine control electronics systems to enter lunar orbit and to allow LM separation once in lunar orbit. The job fell to Lunny's team to make sure that the SPS was fully operable. By the end of Lunny's first shift, troubleshooting limited the problem to the A engine control circuit. The B control circuit was fully operable. Time is one of the most precious resources of flight directors and, for a change, Time was on our side during the three-day translunar coast. Lunny's team GNC, Joe Dakine, was short, quiet, young, and unassuming. Flying his first mission as GNC, Joe felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. A flight control team develops a keen awareness of situations in which someone needs help. Gary Cohen and Jack Camman were on each side of Dakine's shift. Each extended his shift duties so that they overlapped, giving Joe the coaching and mentoring he needed to survive. His first crisis. After developing the workaround Joe emerged with the confidence that he could do it on his own the next time. Griffin executed the maneuver with the amended procedures and, most importantly, met the criteria for continuing the mission. This uncanny ability at assimilating data making judgments, and balancing risk versus gain reached maturity in Apollo. The Hadley Rule landing site was in a mountainous region of the moon well north of the equator and on the edge of a mile-wide canyon. Scott and Irwin guided the Falcon through the descent, 
surprised to find that the landmarks were less sharply defined than expected. As they continued the descent, they searched for their specific landmarks, redesignating the landing location several times, steering to remain short and north of the one feature they recognized, Hadley Rill, a mile-wide canyon seven miles from 18,000-foot high Mount Hadley. In the final 50 feet, they flew blind through the lunar dust. The round blue lunar contact light triggered Scott to cut off the landing rocket. The LM fell the final feet to the surface and then lurched in an unsettling motion, tilting back and to its right. Two of the landing pads were settled into the edge of a small crater. My white team started its shift work during the lunar orbit phase off the mission. A bay of the service module had been outfitted with a palette of scientific instruments to obtain photographs of the moon's surface and map its chemical composition. I worked the same shift schedule as Jerry Griffin. Griffin's team supported the lunar EVAs, while my team supported astronaut Ol Worden's operation of the service module experiments. The mission continued smoothly through the first EVA period. Scott and Irwin were out to prove that an astronaut was capable of performing in a scientist's arena. They were open to every change, driving to set a standard higher than that of any previous crew, and determined to prove that they were up to the demands of Lee Silver and his team. Griffin, Mission Control, and the lunar scientists were not aware, however, of the price Scott and Irwin were paying to maintain a very heavy workload. By the end of the first EVA, the crew's hands succeeded as if they were arthritic. As they continued, the skin under their nails hemorrhaged and turned black, the fingertips tearing from the constant rubbing against the gloves. Every task on the moon demanded dexterity, this crew was not about to let physical discomfort get in the way of achieving the mission's objectives. After their second EVA Scott and Irwin began an intense timeline in their final 24 hours. After a six and a half hour sleep period, the crew was awakened to begin preparation for the third and final activity. The timeline was already short. As the crew in the LM slept, Lunny had worked with Bill Muehlberger and the science team to wrap land the EVA to get a reasonable duration. The controllers started cutting bits and pieces of margin from the timeline. 15 minutes were taken from sleep, another 15 from the period after eating, and 25 minutes more were snatched from the stowage and ascent preparation to allow a 4-hour and 30-minute EVA and still meet the scheduled lunar liftoff time. Nearing the end of the final EVA Scott and Irwin had one last, sad duty to perform before they lifted off and returned to Endeavour. For weeks before their flight three Russian cosmonauts had died during the reentry of Soyuz 11. They had been in orbit for a record 23 and 3 quarters days, 570 hours, and the spaceship made an apparently flawless landing. The three were found unmarked, reclining in their seats as if asleep, killed almost instantly and silently by an oxygen leak. It was an eerie reminder, as if one were needed, of the unpredictable nature of space voyages. Scott and Erwin left on the Muna Plaque with the names of the three Russian astronauts, adding Thierse to the honor roll of others, the Apollo 1 astronauts, the Soyuz 1 astronaut, and all the rest, who had lost their lives in the quest to explore the universe. Windler launched the crew off the surface, rendezvoused, and then docked before handing over to Lunny on the 51st revolution. The crew was on the timeline and there were few apparent problems for Lunny, the kind of shift you pray for. This was a time to catch a breath, clean up the spacecraft problems, and get ready for the trip home. The crew had been awake for 16 hours, performing physically demanding work, which was followed by the intensity of a lunar liftoff, rendezvous, and docking. The principal activity of Lunny's shift was to jettison the lunar module and then get the crew to sleep. Lunny's problem started during the crew's 17th hour awake. As a precaution for a loss, of pressure during the LM jettison, the crew donned helmets and gloves and performed a suit pressure check. Then, to make sure there were no leaks in the hatch seal, the crew gradually depressurized the tunnel connecting the command module, CM, 
to the lunar module, LM, while the CM pressure was monitored for any decrease. The initial suit integrity check failed due to a pressure suit leak at the fitting where water is fed to the liquid-cooled garment. After both suits were plugged, the suit integrity test was passed satisfactorily. After a brief verbal update on the depressed sequence, the crew continued the preparation for the jettison. During communications with Mission Control, Scott commented on the difference between the pressures in the command module and in the tunnel. The tunnel pressure was at 2.7 a while ago, he said, and now it is down to 2.0. Scott was reading the pressure from a small gauge in the tunnel, one normally used by the crew prior to opening. The hatch, or when separating the spacecraft. Lunny's hairs. Stood on end, many things must be right in space, and cabin pressure is at the top of the list. Lunny, now concerned about the decrease in pressure, ascribed it to a possible hatch seal leak. Given the earlier problems in the suit integrity check, he scrubbed the LM jettison. The crew backed out of the configuration, removed the hatch, and visually inspected the seals. They were then given precise instructions for another command module pressure check. While the astronauts were performing the pressure checks I was in the orbital science backroom talking to the controllers and scientists prior to coming on shift. Dick Coos, my Apollo 11 simsup, now operating in a new role as an experiments engineer, motioned me to his console. As I leaned over he said, Lunny's having a hell of a problem getting the crew through the separation checklist. Something is out of whack. I thanked Dick for his heads up and quickly moved to the control room. At acquisition of the CSM telemetry and voice communications. On orbit 53, Scott had unexpectedly vented the tunnel. Lunny, absolutely unruffled, told the crew to pump the tunnel back up. Glynn was getting frustrated, he knew something was wrong and forcefully reminded his controllers to call out every step of the crew's procedures as they were performed. He wanted his team's eyeballs in the cockpit with the crew. Lunny continued with his usual superb, unbridled confidence, his voice never exposing any emotion, so his people never sensed his frustration. Now satisfied with the suit and cabin pressure check, Glynn gave the go for jettison. I was spooked just listening. Even in the most blood-curdling simulation I had never seen the crew and ground so out of phase. The LM jettison delay changed the orbit geometry for separation. Approaching maneuver time, Scott remarked that the planned maneuver took the CSM toward the LM. After an intense discussion with his team, Lonnie scrubbed the maneuver. Stovall, the Fido, quickly planned a new one. Glynn. Have the crew stay in front of the LM, point at it, and thrust away for 2 feet per second velocity. This will give us enough clearance. When Scott executed the maneuver, Lonnie showed his only emotion, inscribing in the log, Hurrah, I felt I was in one of those bad dreams where you can't wake up and you can't get anything to go right. Even though I had come in only for the last two hours, I had the same creepy feeling. At no time on the console had I ever felt so apprehensive. Throughout the pressure check and maneuver fiasco, DR. Chuck Berry had been standing and talking to Dr. Gilruth and Kraft at the console behind us. With the maneuver completed, Barry approached the flight director's console. I was sitting next to Glynn reading his log and preparing for shift handover when Dr. Barry pulled up a chair. When the surgeon visited the flight director for a powwow, he knew he was unhappy about something. In a hushed voice he said, Glynn, we saw a bunch of heart irregularities. On Erwin. We also saw some on the moon during the third EVA. Those sitting next to the flight director cocked an ear, edging over to hear what was going on. Barry continued his discussion, now using words that were new and strange to us. He talked of a bigeminal rhythm, where both chambers of the heart tried to contract at the same time. Barry said they had also seen PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, probably caused by the crews working to near exhaustion levels. Glynn and I were doing a slow burn, we should have been told about this much sooner. To control the risks of spaceflight, 
The flight director must have all the facts from his team members, and he must get them in a timely fashion. In this case he did not. If Lani had been aware of the medical problems, he would have given the crew a rest period, delayed the jettison, or simply had the crew go to sleep. We were going to remain in lunar orbit for two more days, we could have given the crew some slack if we were given the information in a more timely manner. The surgeon's concerns about medical privacy, and their consequent reluctance to give the flight directors the full story, almost got us into a heap of trouble. Slayton had been previously alerted to the medical problem. After instructing Irwin to downlink the biomed data, Deke got on the air to ground loop, I want the commander and the lunar module pilot to each take a second all and get a good night's sleep. This was the typical Slayton imperative. Irwin said, thanks, Deke. Two hours later, they finally signed off. The crew had been awake for 22 hours. Lunny's handoff to me was brief. Good luck, he said, wearily. My team spent most of the night reviewing the data on the suit and cabin pressure to make sure that the systems were fully operational. We remained in lunar orbit for almost two more days, mapping the surface, assessing the radiation. Environment, deploying a small satellite. Finally, after six days at the moon, I gave the go for trans Earth injection. For the first time in spaceflight, I had been truly rattled. Working with a chronically fatigued crew was bad enough, but when you added disorientation and memory loss the crew could have been experiencing because of dehydration and changes in blood chemistry, especially potassium deficiency, due to exertion, you were skating on very thin ice. I thought of the sign in my office. Aviation in itself is not inherently dangerous. But to an even greater degree than the sea, it is terribly unforgiving of any carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. I now mentally added a word to the text, ignorance. Fall 1971. The work on the final two missions continued unabated, each one more difficult than the last, with landings at more rugged and desolate sites. It seemed to be a can you top this contest among the lunar geologists, with the astronauts cheering them on. Given the focus on science in the Apollo program it was certain that a scientist would soon fly. The controllers, Lou Ellen and I in particular, were ecstatic when Jack Schmidt was selected for the final mission, Apollo 17. In my mind, no one deserved a flight more. The cheering didn't stop there, Ron Evans, the command module pilot, was one of the Capcom's most familiar to the mission control team along with Ken Mattingly, Charlie Duke and Fred Hayes, Evans had been the Capcom for four Apollo missions. The Commander in 17 would be Captain America, Gene Cernan, the Navy's red, white and blue answer to Dave Scott. I thought this was fitting. I had launched Cernan on his first mission on Gemini 9 and now. We would fly our last mission together. Lunny, now in the Apollo program office, borrowed Aldrich for a trip to Russia to set up the joint US and Russian working groups for a planned 1975 rendezvous mission. Aldrich, a pioneer in operations and developer of many great MCC systems engineers, was about to move on. January 1972 The new year got off to a gloomy start. We were told there would be no hiring and no promotions for the entire year. The misery continued as Apollo 16 was delayed for a variety of technical problems related to the LM batteries, pyrotechnics, experiments, and spacesuits. Another reason for the delay was that Charlie Duke, the Apollo 16 lunar module pilot, caught a flu bug and was unable to train for the mission. John Young, Duke, and Ken Mattingly were assigned to Apollo 16, aboard the command ship Casper with a landing target at the edge of the Descartes Mountains. Technically and scientifically, this would rate among our most successful missions, and one of the least remembered. April 16, 1972, Apollo 16 My third Saturn launch was routine, if launching the world's most powerful machine is ever routine. But, after achieving Earth orbit, we had one of those failures that the designer claims will never happen. 
Both regulators on the attitude control system were dumping gas overboard. With One eye on the Saturn IVB Satitude control fuel and the other on the clock we raced through the Earth orbital checkout and briefed the crew on assuming manual attitude control. It was a tight race to get the spacecraft injected to the moon and to extract the lunar module. Once again we lucked out. The mission continued normally through the lunar orbit and the preparation for landing. The white team had the shift preceding Griffin's landing shift and had worked the usual nits. Phil Schaffer, an ex-Fido now training as flight director, had been working with my team throughout the mission, assessing the impact of various anomalies and making sure that there were no modifications to the landing plan. After the mission debriefing with Kraft and Dr. Berry on Apollo 15, the flight directors were once again in the loop on crew status, and crew potassium intake was now the main concern of the surgeons. We hoped to prevent problems off type experienced on Apollo 15, so the Astronauts were provided orange juice spiked with potassium. That added electrolytes to the fluid. The concoction did not. Taste quite like nectar, and John Young was quick to inform us that it made his crew gassy and nauseated, not a good state for a confined cockpit in zero G. The crew began a semicomic rebellion, with sharply reduced fluids and a reluctance to increase the orange juice intake. The crew's orange juice protest was becoming the ditty for the mission press conferences. To better understand the crew's problems, and answer the questions at the press conference, I asked me ever patient white team flight surgeon to get me some of the juice. Within minutes a courier arrived from his back room with the infamous OJ. One dose was enough for me to get the crew's point. It tasted thick, heavy, almost metallic. I offered the remainder to Schaffer, who wisely demurred. I leaned over the console and Yaletto my surgeon, Dr. Zed, John Ziegelschmid, John, it tastes like crap. How about taking some to the press conference and let them take a shot? Fortunately, there was no press conference. Scheduled for the shift and Dr. Zed was not about to add. To the controversy. Schaffer and I concluded the handover to Griffin noting, looks like both spacecraft are clean going into activation and descent. Good luck. The lunar module power-up, undocking, and visual inspection went off without a hiccup. At undocking, we swung into a dual-team operation. Don Puddy, formerly a Telmu, responsible for life support, electrical, mechanical, and EVIA systems on the LM, picked up flight director duties for the command module while Griffin followed the LM. The aerial ballet continued with Puddy giving Mattingly the go for the circular maneuver on the moon's backside during the 12th orbit. On Revolution 13, Jay Green and Chuck Dieterich in the trench were the first to see that something was wrong. Tracking data indicated that Mattingly had not performed the scheduled maneuver. Their suspicion was confirmed. When Mattingly's voice broke through the static. I scrubbed the burn, he said. TVC number 2 was unstable. Thrust vector control, TVC, was the steering system used to keep the spacecraft oriented during the course of a burn. If TVC was lost during a maneuver, the spacecraft would use precious attitude control fuel and in a long burn could start tumbling. Mattingly continued to describe the problem symptoms, his troubleshooting, and the results. Ken was an expert on the CSM spacecraft systems, recognized by both designer and controller as the most knowledgeable of the CSM pilots. In mission control Ken worked well with the teams. As a Capcom he was a natural and intuitive pilot engineer who asked the kind of questions that I wish I had asked. From the tone of Mattingly's voice, you could tell he was feeling embattled. After being scrubbed from Apollo 13, he had finally landed his trip to the moon. Now a malfunction deep in the guts of the CSM engine control system was on the brink of denying his team their lunar landing. He knew the rules and grudgingly accepted the need for redundancy. Ken also knew that the control team would press to find a way out of the current problem. If there was no fix, the controllers would reassess the rules, 
but they would likely arrive at the same position as they had before the mission. For loss of redundancy in the CSM propulsion systems, the CSM would redock with the LM. The lunar landing would be scrubbed and the lunar phase of the mission would be terminated. The TEM maneuver would be performed while docked to the LM, like on Apollo 13, to provide a backup engine to return to Earth. When the burn for the maneuver was scrubbed, Griffin temporarily waved off the LM descent preparation. The LM was already in the correct orbit to begin the descent to the moon, so Green planned A. Maneuver to return the CSM to the vicinity of the LM. If they solved the engine control problem this would give the crew the option to immediately swing into another landing attempt without additional LM maneuvers. The problem hanging up the mission fell into GNC Larry Cannon's lap. It was like giving a piece of raw meat to a hungry tiger. The TVC system was Cannon's flight control specialty. Without waiting for the recorded telemetry from Mattingly's testing to be processed, Cannon informed Griffin, flight, tell Mattingly I want to run another TVC test. Give me a few seconds to get my team online and get Papa in my recorders and then let's get going. Within minutes of Mattingly's initial report the test was in progress. As it went forward, Larry's gut feeling told him that the problem was an open circuit, a broken wire somewhere in the control system. Working with his backroom staff, Cannon set out to develop a test to further isolate the problem. Cannon had worked with me. During the Apollo 9 mission when we had run a series of in-flight tests to determine what would happen under similar malfunction conditions. Two hours after the wave-off, Griffin had powered down the lunar module. Both spacecraft were now flying in close formation. After reviewing the Apollo 9 test data, Cannon moved to Griffin's console for a private one-on-one. -on -one. Jerry, if the problem is in the control circuit, he said, I think we can give the go for the separation and landing. We can electrically drive the engine nozzle into position for the maneuver and then lock it in place with the drive clutch. Listening in, Kraft interrupted, that's not what North American engineers say. Cannon responded, let's get them on the voice loop and go over the test data from Apollo 9. Griffin, feeling better after Cannon's input called his team to order, and reset the landing for Revolution 16. Shortly thereafter, lab testing recreated the problem by cutting the control circuit wires, the designers agreed with. Larry Cannon's proposed solution to use the drive clutch to hold the nozzle stable during the burn. In less than four hours after the alarm, Griffin got everyone marching again. Okay, gold team, settle down, he said, the mission is back on. We're going for the landing at Descartes. Ken Mattingly was ecstatic when he got the word along with the revised procedures. Coming from behind the moon on Revolution 16, after the maneuver, Mattingly reported, Casper, CSM, did it this time. Then he continued in his more customary, casual voice with his standard post-burn report. Happiness reigned in both spacecraft and mission control. Pete Frank took a short shift after landing to get the crew into their sleep period and then handed over to my white team. With the delay in the landing, my job was to lay out the surface plan, establish team schedules, and anchor the lunar liftoff time. Because of the delayed landing, my team's flight. Planners quickly reassessed the mission. We had at least two and a half days on the surface, cutting only slightly into our water reserve. With their input I advised the control team to plan for a 3 EVA mission, and fix the lunar liftoff for Revolution 52. The final step in the process was to post the schedules for the four control teams. My white team would do a whiffadil, performing two shifts on the second EVA day to get my team into the cycle for lunar liftoff. Midway in the shift I woke up the LM crew, started the EVA preparation, and then handed over to Pete Frank's orange team for the EVA. The lunar rover, used on the final three lunar missions, added a new dimension to the surface operations. It was a miracle of engineering, a battery-powered version of an off-road sport utility vehicle. 
The rover deployed from Bay Eye of the Descent stage by a series of cams, pulleys, and cables, unfolding like a collapsible baby carriage. When the moon buggy landed, it carried everything. The, the crew needed. Like the Gold Prospector's Bureau, the rover carried the crew and its equipment to the exploration sites. With wire mesh wheels, four-wheel steering, television and equipment stowage, it was Young and Duke's magic carpet. Surface operations are hard work and the first EVA is the toughest. The high-priority science objectives are taken care of first in case something happens to cut the mission short, there are always glitches, Young and Duke had their share as they plowed through the initial surface operations. Then, to highlight their first EVA, they climbed aboard the rover for the ride of their lives. Their initial targets were named Spook, Buster, and Plum, small craters used as landmarks by the crew. Young and Duke had learned a great deal about pacing themselves and avoiding exhaustion thanks to the Scott and Irwin debriefing. This imperative to conserve energy had been emphasized by the flight surgeons at every opportunity. My ascent team, like the pilots in Korea, remained on strip alert close to the MCC. Throughout the entire lunar surface stay we were at ease, but cocked and ready to get a team in place to plan and execute a lunar liftoff in less than two hours. If a controller could not get from his home to the MCC in less than 30 minutes he was required to stay in the MCC sleeping quarters. If any problems occurred with either spacecraft it was our job to get into mission control, assess the options, and get the crew into lunar orbit. The first EVA went well. Griffin debriefed the crew, and then I picked up the next shift. I was surprised that Griffin's handover notes indicated that instructions had come down from the program office's daily management meeting to shorten the final liftoff by one revolution, and end the mission a day early. My flight planners and the LM backroom team were already in the process of marking up the flight plan and checklists for the early liftoff when I arrived for my shift. I was damn angry and told them to stop. Doing the markups. I intended to stay with the EVA and liftoff plan we had established on our prior shift. There had been a rumor circulating after landing that the mission would be limited to two EVAs as a result of the landing delay but I had paid it little attention. Now someone in the management chain was making decisions normally reserved for the flight directors, and the decisions were contrary to the mission rules. If the mission was cut short, I knew that Young and Duke on the surface and Mattingly in the command module would go for Brocato complete every objective. The crew's drive to get as much done as possible would put us into the kind of exhaustion and resulting physiological problems that we had experienced with Scott and Irwin. I also did not want to compress the preparation for the lunar liftoff. Departing the moon is one thing that you don't want to do in a hurry, one of the times when you proceed with deliberate caution. For the second time in my MCC career, I lost my temper. I turned to Bill Tyndall seated behind me at the flight operations director console, and asked, Bill, do you know where this bullshit plan to lift off early came from? He raised his hands. I think it came down from today's program management meeting. My reply was curt. Does Kraft know this? Bill nodded affirmatively. Glancing into the viewing room I saw Chris, Schoberg, and McDivitt. Let's take a walk, I motioned to Tyndall. This time I was a lot smarter. I sketched out for Kraft the surface plan that led to my selection of the liftoff time. Then citing the crew workload and the Apollo 15 experience, I said that I thought it unsafe to press for an earlier liftoff. I used unsafe about every fifth word, since I had watched Kraft play the safety card at many meetings and now I decided to steal his trump. I finally put it pretty bluntly, Chris, why don't you leave the mission planning to the team? What the hell is the hurry to get off the moon? I, I studied his face, got the feedback I wanted, and then continued. Turning down the emotion, a lunar ascent is the time when everything has to go well. I want two hours of data for the controllers and time for the crew to wind down from the EVA and transition to ascent thinking. We've had a good mission so far, why push it? This plan increases the risk with no payback. 
I had argued often with Kraft before, but seldom had I ever caught him so far off base, agreeing to a change of plan without hearing the other side. After a brief exchange on keeping a reasonable crew workload, Chris nodded, so be it. Kraft's heart was still at the console. He was still flight no matter what his position in management, and while the crew medical status was foremost in the minds of every top-level NASA leader, he gave his team the benefit of the doubt. The experience on Apollo 15, especially the lack of specific knowledge of the hour by our crew status, colored our judgment. Neither crew nor controllers had the experience or the data to know how close we were to the edge. After three days on the surface, the white team gave the go for the lunar liftoff. To the delight of the science team, Young and Duke had performed three EVAs at Descartes. We had waved off the first Apollo 16 landing attempt, worked out the problem, and ultimately achieved our objectives. Two of the young controllers, Don Puddy and Phil Schaffer, members of the new generation, had earned the title flight and would lead the teams into the next era of space. Apollo had one more mission to go. The end was no longer beyond the horizon, for this one, hotel rooms at the Cape and in Houston would be reserved four months ahead. The airlines had a waiting list on flights into every airport in the area. The topless go-go bars on the beach would be so crowded that the cops would not be able to get into them to close them down. 22. The last liftoff. Fall 1972. Apollo 17 was going to be a tough, dramatic, and melancholy mission, the last lunar strike. It would mark the end of an all-too-quick decade in our American history, where we grabbed for the brass ring and got it on our first try. The lunar missions thoroughly absorbed us, and, in our haste, we never took the opportunity to savor the moment. Lunny often said that we were drinking wine before its time. When Apollo ended, so would my life as a flight director. A new generation of flight directors was trained, the top guns of mission control, smarter, quicker, more responsive than we were. I was the last of the initial group of flight directors, an anachronism. I had the experience and the mission judgment, but I could see that I was compromised by events and near misses. There is a saying in aviation, there are old pilots, and there are bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. It is doubly tough when you have to make decisions about another person's life. As flight directors, we had made calls that only by the grace of God turned out right. But that was our life. The new flight directors were in a better position to manage this risk more objectively, balancing the odds and pressing to the objective. Watching Phil Schaffer. Skinny Lewis, Don Puddy, and Neil Hutchinson during their training, I felt old at age 39. The preparation for Apollo 17 kicked in during the first week of September. We began our bittersweet planning for the final mission to the mountains of Taurus, near the giant crater Litro. These sites were named for the constellation Taurus, the Bull, and 19th century astronomer Johann von Lutro. The landing site was a flat floored valley four miles wide, bordered on three sides by high mountains. The valley contained numerous craters that might be volcanic in origin and of great interest to the scientists. It was going to be one hell of a mission, the grand finale to Apollo. I was proud that we would plant a sixth American flag on the moon. But I could only wonder when and where we would plant the next flag. Gene Cernan, the Apollo 17 commander, and Dave Scott, on Apollo 15, were probably the most outspoken in their feelings about our country, patriotism, and commitment. Maybe it was just the times we lived in that we needed reminders of what we stood for. The world around us seemed to be going haywire. With the gradual withdrawal of US ground troops from Vietnam, it was left to the Navy and Air Force pilots to pound North Vietnam, while the South tried to stabilize its defenses. Any military man knew it was a lost cause, and I was ashamed of the way. Our nation hung South Vietnam out to dry. 
the Munich massacre of Israeli athletes during the Summer Olympics, protests at the national political conventions, and the attempted assassination of former Alabama Governor George Wallace were the background for the final Apollo mission. December 6, 1972, Apollo 17. There were the usual notes in the flight director's log when I saddled up on the console at 5.53 p.m. Central Standard Time to launch Apollo 17. This was an Apollo first, a Saturn V launch that would be seen rising. On a pillar of fire in the night sky, before pitching over and starting its thrusting to the east, toward Africa, and carrying Cernan, Jack Schmidt, and Ron Evans on their way, our last ambassadors to the moon. Griffin had left several notes on the countdown funnies. He had reviewed a master alarm with Evans on the phone and closed out a battery problem as acceptable for launch. Trust is key in our business. If someone says a problem is closed, it is closed. In flight control, if you didn't save trust in your fellow controllers you could not get the job done. In the last hour the launch countdown became a nightmare. Data faults began occurring around the world, then the Mission Control Center experienced a series of power glitches and the display system failed while I was conducting my launch status check. The maintenance team swung into action while the controllers dug for the procedures in case they had to move to adjacent working consoles. It was almost as if our ground system were reluctant to send the final Apollo on its last journey to the moon. The problem was fixed by launch minus 7 minutes and the count continued. 16 seconds to launch, a Saturn auto sequence cutoff was issued. The liquid oxygen tank pressurization did not start automatically. Again the team swung into action to provide the launch updates to the CAPE team. During a launch hold, the trajectory ground track changes on a minute-by-minute -minute basis throughout the launch window, due to the Earth's rotation and the changing geometry of the lunar trajectory. As soon as the launch hold is confirmed, the recovery forces and communications relay aircraft start moving southward, perpendicular to the ground track at maximum speed. The countdown went through two recycles before the problems were corrected, finally lifting off almost at the end of the four-hour launch window. We were hard-pressed. To keep every aspect of the system in sync, but finally mission control was go for launch of Apollo 17. At 11.33 p.m. Central Standard Time, the Saturn literally glowed as it left the launch pad. Night became day in a brilliant flash, a beacon for all America, all the world to see as a symbol of the power of a free and open society. The terse, calm controller's reports wiped away my last vestige of sentiment and emotion on the world's final launch of a Saturn V rocket. Only during my final shift as a flight director, during the lunar phase, did emotion creep back in. Launch and translunar injection were flawless. From then on it was a series of farewells for the elite team in mission control. The Saturn booster team, assigned by the Marshall Space Flight Center to my division, signed off for the final time after maneuvering the booster for the lunar impact. This crackerjack team, led by Scott Hamner, Chuck Casey, and Frank Van Rensselaer, had broken through the political and intercenter rivalries that stretched from Alabama to Texas to Florida, welding a partnership with my division and especially the trench. They was us was Llewellyn's simple tribute to the booster team as it left the console for the final time. Cern and Screw was probably the most relaxed of the Apollo crews. The day before the launch, the three of them had left the rules in shambles, violating their isolation to go duck hunting on a nearby farm. A pack of reporters was on their heels, but agreed not to write anything until after the flight, a reflection of the team spirit that sometimes infected even the press, besides, this was the last roundup. Everyone understood that the usual protocol did not apply, the mellow attitudes of the Apollo 17 crew were also due in part to the fact they had no crises in the early going that threatened the mission. Another factor may have been the temperament of Cernan, a Chicago native, Navy captain, and spacewalker, Gemini 9. Gene Hede 
sense of adventure reminiscent of that of the Mercury astronauts. The teamwork between space and ground had peaked at a perfect time. The long interval between missions had given the crew of Apollo 17 full access to the controllers and training resources. Now the crew treated the control teams to the most vivid descriptions Way had ever received of any flight. Even the ultra-quiet Ron Evans joined in broadcasting the account of the night launch. During each staging the fireball overtook us, then when the engine kicked in we once again flew out of the orange-red cloud into darkness. The translunar injection started in darkness, the booster propelling them through sunrise. The description was lyrical. There was no doubt the crew was enjoying the ride. During the coast phase, Jack Schmidt waxed philosophical on the origin of life in the universe and man's efforts to extend his realm. Listening to the crew's narrative, I again felt the magic of the Genesis. Readings of Apollo 8, and of Armstrong School the day the Eagle landed. If there had been a way to stretch the next few days into a lifetime I believe that Pete, Jerry, and I would have done so. We were in the final hours of our careers as flight directors, and for a few final moments. We savoured the wine. Pete Frank conducted the three extravehicular activities, the most productive of the lunar program, benefiting from the lessons learned in every previous hour of spaceflight. The crew, controller, and science teams breezed through the evas. The crew set records for the longest lunar mission, Mass of lunar materials returned, longest lunar EVA time, and greatest lunar surface distance traveled. In this final mission, the crews and controllers all had time to sense the history in our work. As the final hours approached, I found myself mentally reviewing the early years of space, trying to fathom why we succeeded when. But by all rights we should have failed. Chris Craft had pioneered mission control and fought the battles in Mercury and Gemini, serving as the role model of the flight director. He proved the need for real-time leadership. In the second's critical world of mission control, a single individual must assume responsibility to take any actions needed for crew safety and mission success. Craft's legacy had defined the leadership role. As the mission went forward, I felt increasingly frustrated and melancholy. I would often sit in the corner of the viewing room, silently watching the teams at work and realizing that I had started my transition to an entirely new role. But I also thought about the legacy of my generation, trust, values, teamwork. I wanted to be a living connection between the new generation of mission controllers, reminding them of how and where it all started with my generation and where theirs might take us in the future. Bob McCall, in my belief, the premier artist of Space, had been sitting on the step to the right of the flight director console, sketching during the final Apollo Evas. He had designed the Apollo 17 crew patch. When Bob took a break for a cup of coffee, I joined him in the cafeteria. Like Schoberg, McCall's talent shone because of his sincerity and humility. As we talked, I don't think Bob was surprised when I asked him if he would design an emblem for the mission control team. I spoke emotionally, from my heart and gut, about the control teams and crews, and our life in mission control. We fought and won the race in space and listened to the cries of the Apollo 1 crew. With great resolve and personal anger, we picked up the pieces, pounded them together, and went on the attack again. We were the ones in the trenches of space and with only the tools of leadership, trust, and teamwork, we contained the risks and made the conquest of space possible. Over the next six months, McCall developed the emblem worn proudly by every subsequent generation of mission controller. He inscribed his final rendering of the emblem, to mission control, with great respect and admiration, Bob McCall 1973. During the final EVA Cernan and Schmidt unveiled the plaque on the LM landing gear that commemorated the conclusion of the first period of exploration of the moon, voicing the hopes of the astronauts, controllers, designers, factory workers, secretaries, and clerks. Speaking for the Apollo generation, Cernan concluded, this is our commemoration that will remain here until someone like us, until some of you who are out there, who are the promise of the future, will come back to read it again and to further the exploration and the meaning of Apollo.
There was not a dry eye in mission control. ACI accepted the helm of mission control from Griffin for my final time, I put on my traditional white vest. I felt somewhat as I had the last time I strapped myself into an F-86 Sabre, relishing the final moments, touching the canopy and instrument panel, hesitating briefly before putting the helmet on. I knew that one life was about to end and another one about to begin. I finally shrugged and plugged into the console. The time for recalling old memories was over. It was time to get the crew off the lunar surface. After the meeting with McCall, I had the satisfaction that no matter what direction I would take in the future, I, too, had helped to define the legacy of mission control. The white team picked up console duties at 183.00 met for lunar liftoff. My thoughts now were on the business at hand, getting Cernan and Schmidt off the moon and dock to the CSM. There are two times in the mission where the options of the flight directors and crews converge to zero. They are the lunar liftoff, and the subsequent trans-Earth injection. Engine failure in either case is catastrophic. We have options for everything else. A lunar liftoff is unlike any rocket launch from Earth, there are no abort alternatives. The LM checkout prior to liftoff is exquisite in its detail. The liftoff is a single shot and must work perfectly. Liftoff time is critical, since most of the power, oxygen, and water have been used during the surface period. Decisions and actions must be perfect and instantaneous. The trench for the lunar ascent was a curious mixture. My flight dynamics officer was Bill Stovall, a youngster from Casper, Wyoming. Blonde, blue-eyed, and cockier than hell, he was perfect for the job. Bill was typical of the new generation scribbling their names on the Captain Ref's map poster in the hallways. He was matched with Jim Ianson, an older, lanky Texan, who flew the B-17 flying fortresses in the Pacific during World War II. The ascent countdown was a series of escalating events. Stovall colored up the large screen displays as I laid out various contingency procedures, mentally reviewing the mission rules. The countdown hit ascent minus 10 minutes, and the team tightened up as the crew blew the pyrotechnic valves to pressurize the propulsion system. If the tank used to pressurize the ascent propulsion system started to leak, my lunar module team would cry out, emergency liftoff. For a few seconds the suspense held, then I heard the call, flight, ascent helium is go. The system is pressurized, there are no leaks. The countdown continued. I started my final status off the room at liftoff minus 8 colon 30. We passed the white team is go to the crew and I opened my launch timeline, mentally running my personal mission rules going through the final set of options for the final lunar mission. There are no reasons to delay liftoff, I thought. I will switch over for critical program alarms and navigation errors. My ascent status roll calls are at plus one, plus three, and plus five minutes. Communications checks were go. I conducted the final poll at minus two minutes. There were no open items, all mission rules were complied with. The trajectory and data sources were go. The white team was now negative reporting, that is, in a listening mode as the crew called out, 400 plus. Master arm abort stage engine arm ascent. By the clock at 5 seconds, I heard Schmidt call out, proceed, then from several sources in unison in mission control I heard, lift off. Cernan sang out, we're on our way. Houston. I noted in the log, at 188.01.35, the last men left the moon. The ascent in the LM Challenger was a hell of a ride. Stovall's boyish glee rivaled Ianson's drool as they reported events, times, data quality. The loops were crisp, fresh, professional, few wasted words. For 10 seconds, the Challenger rose vertically on the plume of the 3,500-pound thrust engine. In the lesser gravity of the moon, this was the equivalent of 21,000 pounds of thrust on Earth. 
The small ascent stage moved out smartly from the valley of Taurus Lick Row with Cernan and Schmidt and their precious payload of rocks as well as our dreams. The lunar module now pitched forward, gaining velocity as well as altitude in its dash to capture the rendezvous orbit. Ed Findel had done well again, capturing the liftoff in a blaze of sparks, debris, and motion with the Rover TV camera. The images of the lunar liftoff, the faces of my control team and their voices, are forever captured in my memory. The finality of our mission was expressed in a simple plaque left on the surface by Cernan, here man completed his first explorations of the moon, December 1972 AD May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. The rendezvous ended in a good, tight navy formation during the CSM visual inspection. And then at docking there was a brief and joyous exchange with Evans. We were not home free yet, but a lot of critical milestones on Apollo 17 were now behind us. It was traditional since John Glenn's first US manned orbital mission for a message from the president. I had been angry when Kennedy's planned message caught us right at the end of Glenn's first orbit. Kraft's reminder that day, the president is the boss, still rang in my ears as I reviewed the message from President Nixon to be read to the crew. The presidential messages always seemed to come after a critical event, and when the odds radically improved that the crew would come home safely. The crew was busier than ever as they prepared to open the hatch and enter the command module. Immediately after the docking, I passed the president's message to the Capcom. The message began with the customary attaboys, followed by glowing words about the Apollo program's impact on humanity. The message was designed for a spot on the evening news. The concluding words were the bitter wine, this may be the last time in this century that men will walk on the moon. We had started out with John Kennedy's vision and command, get a man on the moon be the end of the decade. Nixon's message was, effectively, Apollo's obituary. Two hours later, I took off my white vest and stowed my headset. My career as a flight director was at an end. Flight directors do not retire to the blast of trumpets or to a roll of drums. There had been no formal change of command ceremony for Kraft, Hodge, Lunny, or Charlesworth. One day they just packed up their headsets and left the console. They were not there on the next mission. Griffin and I decided to do it a bit differently, handing over to the new generation of flight directors in lunar orbit. We felt it was important to pass the torch so that a new generation, born in Apollo, would lead the teams into the future. Griffin's gold team became Neil Hutchinson's silver team for the return journey to Earth. Chuck, Skinny, Lewis, one of five college students in the first class of flight controllers, a graduate of the Zanzibar site and my wingman for many missions, assumed command of my white team, now dubbed the Bronze. Just as Kraft had passed me the baton in real time, I now passed it to Lewis. On occasion, flight directors take over the Capcom's job in selecting the crew wake-up music. For Lewis's first prime shift, bringing the crew home from lunar orbit, Griffin and I selected Light My Fire, by the doors, listed as the lettermen in the flight director's log, to welcome a new generation of flight directors. It was time for Lewis to fly. Solo, so I moved to the viewing room as he gave. His go to bring home the command module, America. For the splashdown, I continued a tradition established in Gemini 9. If my team had done especially well I would wear a celebration vest. Splashy, gaudy, it was me way of saying, thanks, well done. Marta knew how I felt about leaving the console. We both shared the pride in my work, in the mission control teams, and in America. Marta made a surprise vest, my final vest as a flight director, for the Apollo 17 landing. It was a spectacular creation, and the favorite of all my vests, made of a metallic thread with broad red, white, and blue stripes, the colors of our flag and also the colors of the first three flight directors. For me the vest stood for America, President Kennedy, outer space, the many firsts, and the brotherhood of flight control. Proudly displaying my resplendent vest, I said thanks to my bosses and my teams, and, 
Thanks, America, for the privilege of serving you. When the crew's feet hit the deck of the carrier, I lit the traditional cigar and cried like a baby. I cried for hours. Flight director's colors are retired just like numbers on football jerseys. At retirement, a proclamation is read declaring that the color will never be used again. The proclamation is hung on the wall of the control room in which the flight director last served. The words of the proclamations are written by one's peers, the only people who matter in our business. Mine read, Whereas his leadership and inspiration mold the flight control team, which was vital to the first rendezvous, manned lunar exploration, and the study of man, earth, stars, and technology. Be it resolved that on behalf of the personnel of the flight control division, the color white be retired from the list of active flight control teams to forever stand in tribute to white flight, Eugene F. Kranz. My proclamation now joined with those of the pioneer flight directors on the wall of the third floor mission control room at the Johnson Space Center. Over the years other proclamations would be added, including one recognizing the honorary gray flight director, Bill Tyndall. We were all members of the Brotherhood who opened the door to space. Epilogue The success of the early American space program was a tribute to the leadership of a politically adept NSA administrator and a relatively small number of engineers, scientists, and project managers who formed and led NASA in the early years. This team, with the technologies it created, reached for and attained a goal that many of its peers thought impossible. A clear goal, a powerful mandate, and a unified team allowed the United States to move from a distant second in space into a preeminent position during my tenure at Mission Control. Entering the 21st century, we have an unimaginable array of technology and a generation of young Americans schooled in these technologies. With our powerful economy, we can do anything we set our mind to do. Yet we stand with our feet firmly planted on the ground when we could be exploring the universe. Three decades ago, in a top story of the century, Americans placed six flags on the moon. Today we know. Longer try for new and bold space achievements, instead we celebrate the anniversaries of the past. In the 1960s just beyond the midpoint of the 20th century, we were a restless nation when a young president, John F. Kennedy, awakened us to our responsibilities and the opportunities we had to make our nation and our world better. Overnight it seemed we became a nation committed to causes. Young and old marched for civil rights, or journeyed to foreign lands in the newly formed Peace Corps. Pictures of Earth from space gave new emphasis to the environmental movement, and again people marched. Wailu often moved to different cadences, our nation was alive with ideals. We were in motion. Violence was everywhere but so was a conviction that we must somehow make this a better world. Thirty years later I feel a sense of frustration that the causes that advanced us so rapidly in the 1950s and 1960s seem to have vanished from the national consciousness. We have become a nation of spectators, unwilling to take risks or act on strong beliefs. Since I grew up in the world of manned space exploration, I am particularly frustrated that we have abandoned the frontier that was opened in the 1960s. The American space industries and the NASA team that built and operated the spacecraft no longer exist. The proud spacecraft design and manufacturing teams at Grumman, North American, and McDonnell are only a memory. Since my retirement from the space program in 1994 I have spoken to over a hundred thousand Americans in hundreds of business, professional, and civic forums. The story of our early years in space, of tragedy and Ultimate triumph has awakened Americans to the power of a dream and of clear goals. I believe there is a widespread interest in space that can be focused to support a public mandate for space exploration, the four steps needed to return to a visionary space program are, first, put space on the national agenda. Space is not currently deemed a priority. The race no established constituency to lobby on behalf of space exploration. No current candidate for president has taken a strong position on space. 
NASA, its contractors, and the Technical Space Societies represent a sizable asset that with proper leadership and a single voice could bring space back onto the national agenda. As a federal agency, NASA is prohibited from lobbying on its own behalf. It can, however, provide appropriate information and educational materials that its employees and contractors need in order to make the case for a new and long-term effort in space. A large core of NASA and contractor alumni exists in every state in the Union. The Space Technical Societies and the NASA Alumni League must assume the leadership, and they must be supported by the rank and file of NASA and its contractors. We must all move into the public arena, speak at business and civic forums, and go into the schools in order to reach every sector of American society to carry the message of space. Unless every person who has ever worked on or dreamed of probing far into outer space is willing to make this commitment we cannot succeed. Second, revitalize NASA. Lacking a clear goal the team that placed an American on the moon, NASA, has become just another federal bureaucracy beset by competing agendas and unable to establish discipline within its structure. Although NASA has an amazing array of technology and the most talented workforce in history, it lacks top-level vision. It began its retreat from the inherent risks of space exploration after the Challenger accident. During the last decade its retreat has turned into a rout. The NASA administrator is appointed by the president and to a great degree represents the current president's views on space. If space is put on the national agenda for the coming national election, a newly elected president will have the opportunity to select new top-level NASA leadership that is committed and willing to take the steps to rebuild the space agency and get America's space program moving again. Third, develop a long-range plan for space. The last set of clear goals for space was produced in 1986 by a national commission that included Neil Armstrong, Chuck Yeager, Gerard O'Neill, CEO, Geostar Corporation, Gene Kirkpatrick, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., Thomas Paine, former NASA Administrator, and many others. The report, entitled Pioneering the Space Frontier, was developed through a series of 15 public forums held across the country and represented the opinions of a substantial portion of the public and the future of the civilian space program. The Goals defined in 1986 are as good today as they were a decade and a half ago. We do not need to engage in another round of studies. We must establish a plan to meet the goals of the National Commission on Space. The report, which was written shortly after the Challenger accident, projected the next 50 years of the space age and deliberated on NASA's goals for the next 20 years. It articulated a pioneering mission for the 21st century America. To lead the exploration and development of the space frontier, advancing science, technology, and enterprise, and building institutions and systems that make accessible vast new resources and support human settlements beyond Earth orbit, from the highlands of the moon to the plaints of Mars. Fourth, engage Congress in the space program. NASA Administrator Daniel Goldin, responding to a Clinton White House foreign policy initiative, brought Russia into the space station program as a major program element without the support of the U.S. Congress. The subsequent redesign of the space station, abrogation of existing contracts, and program delays cost NASA valuable support within Congress. Reinvigorating the space program entails significant costs and cannot happen without strong congressional leadership and support. NASA needs a new administrator, someone who knows how to represent the space program in the political arena, someone like its second administrator, James Webb, who was a master of the bureaucratic process and a skilled builder of support alliances. A new administrator with a clear set of goals, supported by an energized and vocal space alumni, can build a mandate for space. A long-term national commitment to explore the universe is an essential investment in the future of our nation and in our beautiful but environmentally challenged planet. An American-led program of multinational space exploration is a critical test of our intention to continue as a world leader in the 21st century. 
Only through such commitments will we inspire the youth of the coming century to step forward to preserve and protect the future of our nation and the rest of mankind. Only in this way will we develop new and difficult technologies, and make the scientific discoveries required to sustain our way of life and to make our world better. This book began with the dream given to my generation, but I believe that President John F. Kennedy was addressing all generations Stockholm when he said. The United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them, this country was conquered by those who moved forward, and so will space. Well, space is there and we are going to climb it, and the moon and the planets are there, and as we set sail we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Our work is unfinished. My wish as I close this book is that one day soon, a new generation of Americans will find the national leadership, the spirit, and the courage to go boldly forward and complete what we started. Eugene F. Kranz Dickinson, Texas, December 1999 Where they are The original astronaut class of 59 went their separate ways. For survived to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the first lunar landing in July 1999. Astronauts present at the Cape for two days of commemoration and celebration on July the 16th and 17th included Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, Wally Skira, John Young, Charlie Duke, Ol Worden, and Walt Cunningham, as well our leader, George Mueller. Duke, Young, and Armstrong joined us for the celebrations in Houston. Others were at a funeral that took place the day before the 30th anniversary. Pete Conrad, one of the astronauts from the second group selected, was killed in a motorcycle accident. He was deeply missed, another missing man in the formation, a formation that included gallant men like Alan Shepard and Deke Slayton, who died of brain cancer in 1993, as well as Ted Freeman, Charlie Bassett, C. C. Williams, and Elliot C., who died in aircraft accidents before they could get their chance to reach. For Space and the three others who would live in our collective memories forever, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee. In 1988, after the Challenger accident, we made a change in the mission control emblem, inserting a comet, a symbol of risk and sacrifice that served as a reminder of the individuals who gave their lives for space exploration. We lost astronauts and we lost controllers, among them Cliff Charlesworth, Dick Thorson, Tech Roberts, Carl Haas, Ted White, Scott Hamner, and many others. We also lost Bill Tyndall and many others who, though not flight controllers, made our work possible. Like comets, they all swept through the sky casting brightness in their wake and then they were gone. For those that remained the years were good to us. In 1974, I became Deputy of NASA Mission Operations and in 1983, Director. I continued my work. In mission control with the controllers, flight designers, planners, and instructors and was assigned additional responsibilities for all aspects of shuttle flight operations including design and development of MCC and simulation facilities and preparation of the shuttle flight software. My final hours in mission control came during the December 1993 shuttle mission to repair the Hubble Space Telescope. I retired from NASA in March 1994 and have never returned to the mission control room. In retirement I returned to aviation. I constructed an acrobatic biplane and flew as engineer on a B-17 Flying Fortress. I speak on the space program to at least 60 to 70 professional, civic, and youth groups each year. Chris Kraft retired from NASA in 1982. He served in many corporate and civic roles including as director at large of the Houston Chamber of Commerce, on the board of visitors of Virginia Polytechnic Institute and on the board of the Manned Space Flight Education Foundation. He now serves as a consultant and corporate board member and is currently writing his memoirs of the space program. Glenn Lunny was program manager for the Apollo Soyuz Rendezvous Mission, Space Shuttle Program Manager, and, after NASA retirement, President of Rockwell Space Operations Houston.
John Hodge left NASA in 1970 to study advanced transportation systems while working for the Department of Transportation. Twelve years later he re-entered NASA as director of the Space Station Task Force. He retired in 1987 and founded a high-tech management consulting firm. Jerry Griffin became director of the Johnson Space Center, president of the Houston Chamber of Commerce. Cons consulted on the Apollo 13 movie, and as an actor has appeared in several space-related movies. Jerry Bostick became Space Shuttle Program Deputy Manager, and after an ASA retirement, Vice President of Grumman Space Operations. He consulted on the Apollo 13 movie and the TV miniseries From the Earth to the Moon. Arnie Aldrich was named the NASA Headquarters Director of the Space Shuttle Program after the Challenger accident. He led the efforts to return the shuttle to flight status. He then served as the Associate Administrator for Aeronautics, Exploration, and technology after retirement in 1994, he joined Lockheed's Missile and Space Company as Vice President for Commercial Space Programs. John Llewellyn opened and operates a cattle and sugar cane ranch and a riverboat touring company in Belize. For a while he owned two satellites recovered during a NASA shuttle mission and today works in the telecommunications industry. Acknowledgements Writing this book During my 34 years with NASA I kept notes of meetings, mission logs, voice tapes, and post-mission reports. The materials filled seven file cabinets and numerous boxes and bookshelves. When me agent, George Greenfield, approached me to write a book in the summer of 1995 I was well into the construction of an acrobatic biplane and was reluctant to divert me attention from the effort. George persisted and during a trip to Houston convinced me to commit to writing a book. George kept me moving through some difficult times and introduced me to Jim Wade and Bob Bender, who made this book a reality. Andy Chaikin, author of A Man on the Moon, and Ol Reinhardt, one of the scriptwriters for the Apollo 13 movie, got me started. They coached me on writing a book proposal, developing an outline, and using a storyboard. The completed outline showed me where I needed more information to write a book on the highly complex events that occurred four decades ago. To fill the gaps I began corresponding with the controllers of the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. Ted White and Arnie Aldrich provided Mercury remote site team reports, technical manuals, photos, and copies of mission messages. Dutch von Ehrenfried contributed manning lists and Gemini EVA mission rules. Chuck, Skinny, Lewis contributed Langley and Master of Science phone books that were invaluable in establishing the organization's structure and personnel locations at critical times. Jay Green provided the complete set of Tyndallgrams. Jerry Griffin provided voice tapes that, when combined with mine, covered every Apollo mission. Doug Ward provided press conference transcripts and converted the real Toriel voice tapes to cassette. Glenn Swanson, the NASA JSC historian, provided biographical materials and researched events in the press transcripts. Many other controllers volunteered personal notes, mission rules, console logs, photos, or other memorabilia. Some just answered my questions to help me make complex problems understandable. The photos were acquired from many sources, including Mike Gentry in the NASA JSC Media Resource Center. The controller's personal photos were processed by the One Great Photo Lab in Webster, Texas. The technical content of the story was contained in the voice records, console logs, and mission reports. Individual and group interviews were used principally to develop anecdotal data and to capture the gut feelings of the controllers. The interviews were the most enjoyable part of writing this book. I interviewed controllers in groups to generate the emotional intensity that existed decades ago. I found that the controllers most vividly remembered the best moments, and that time had softened the edge on the bad moments. During the group sessions we sat around a cooler filled with beer, ate pizza, and reminisced. The interview sessions generally lasted about three hours and each involved seven to twelve controllers. I conducted 10 group sessions with remote site teams, 
spacecraft systems engineers, simulation teams, the trench, and mission designers and flight directors. I conducted individual interviews with Harold Miller, Simsup, John Hodge, Arnie Aldrich, and Ed Pavelka. Each interview was recorded on videotape. Writing a book is a team effort and as in mission control, I needed a lot of help to get the job done. Jan Pasek Weed, my NASA secretary for two decades, transcribed numerous voice tapes and typed and updated the manuscript. Jack Riley, my public affairs officer for many missions, helped me shape the original story and reviewed every manuscript draft. My original draft of the book covered over 200,000 words, so Mickey Herskowitz, a Houston Chronicle. Sports writer, helped me to condense the story and better focus my role in the story. Throughout every stage of the book there were dedicated readers and reviewers, among them Ed Findell, Jerry Griffin, Jerry Bostick, Jim Hannigan, Pete Frank, Jack Riley, Chuck Lewis, Glenn Swanson, NASA Johnson Space Center History Office, Rebecca Wright and Carol Butler, NASA Johnson Space Center Oral History Project, Ralph Royce from the Lone Star Flight Museum, and my wife, Marta. Jim Wade, formerly Vice President and Executive Editor of Crown Publishers, accomplished the final structuring and shaping of the book. He is presently a member of the Independent Editors Group. Jim tuned, polished, and structured the manuscript. In the final months, he joined my list of the great mentors. Bob Bender, my editor at Simon & Schuster, believed in the book from the very start and his editorial work helped to make it what it is today. There were, remarkably, few disagreements among interviewees concerning events, actions, and principles. Described in this book On a few occasions while I was using the MCC voice tapes it was difficult for me to identify the controller or crewman involved in the action. When this happened, I used a combination of the MCC access lists, control room photos, and videotapes, if they were available, to determine the individuals involved. The portrayal of events on the final shift between John Hodge and Chris Craft preceding the Apollo 1 fire, Chapter 10, and the specific crewmen involved in the final Apollo 11 mission simulation, Chapter 15, represents my best judgment about these events and individuals. The NASA History Series, particularly the books This New Ocean, Project Mercury, On the Shoulders of Titans, Project Gemini, Chariots of Apolloy, Project Apollo, and Stages of Saturn, Saturn rocket development, were invaluable. References in developing the chronology in the book. I recommend them to my readers. There is no doubt that although four decades have softened many of the emotions, we are still a brotherhood. Any errors in telling this story are soul of mine. Doing the job. The one constant in the 34 years of my career in NASA was the consistent quality of our people, their dedication, and their willingness to do everything ever asked of them. Three great leaders directed flight operations at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston. Chris Craft, SIG Schoberg, and Bill Tyndall gave us our assignments, and when the chips were down trusted us to get it done. The four divisions under their direction were the Mission Planning and Analysis Division, led by John Meyer and Carl Haas, the Landing and Recovery Division, led by Jerry Hammack and Pete Armitage, the Flight Support Division, led by Linwood Dunseith, and my Flight Control Division. Rod Rose filled many roles in flight operations. He was the principal engineer integrating the myriad elements of the telemetry, voice, and trajectory data flow and processing. Each of these divisions and key individuals, along with many others in the Manned Spacecraft Center, played a major role in the success of our early space ventures. My story is about only one of these great manned spaceflight teams. The 400 members of the Flight Control Division staffed many of the Mission Control Center's real-time decision positions. I was able to perform my duties as Flight Director because of a superb division staff who stepped in and ran the division when I was in training or working a mission. I would like to acknowledge the following individuals on the Flight Control Division staff, Assistant for Operations, 
Joe Roach, Assistant for Systems, Mel Brooks, Chief of Flight Directors, Glenn Lunny, MSFC Booster Engineer Office Chief, Scott Hamner, Technical Assistant, Chuck Beers, Business Manager, Harold Miller, Administration Officer, Cecil Dorsey, and his assistant, Joyce Gaddy. Lois Ransdell, Pink Flight, was my boss secretary and was ably supported by the division office secretaries, Suzanne Miller, Flight Directors, Carol Helms, Booster Engineers, Betty DeFerrari, Business Office. The division had seven branches that corresponded to the technical specialties in mission control. The branch chiefs and their deputies worked as controllers while also leading the branch-level organizations. They selected and trained the new controllers in their basic skills, integrated the mission plans and documentation, and supported the spacecraft. De design During simulations they certified their controllers as ready for mission support. The branch chiefs and deputies were Charlie Harlan and Chuck Lewis, Flight Control Operations Branch, Jerry Bostick and Phil Schaffer, Flight Dynamics Branch, Carl Shelley and Gordon Ferguson, Simulation Branch, Richard Hoover and Lou DeLuca, Requirements Branch, Arnie Aldrich, Neil Hutchinson, and Rod Lowe, CSM Systems Branch, Jim Hannigan, Don Puddy, and Bob Carlton, LM Systems Branch, Jim Saltz and Jerry Griffith, Experiment Systems Branch. The branch secretaries also worked in mission control, and their work hours and life were as harried as that of the controllers. They were Sue Irwin, Ada Moon, Lucille Booth, Geraldine Taylor, Pat Garza, Maureen Bowen, Dorothy Hamilton, Kathy Spencer, and Elizabeth Pieberhofer. The section chiefs led groups of five to seven controllers developing the spacecraft handbooks, procedures, and mission rules. They called the cadence, roused their controllers during the long and frustrating hours, and listened to their gripes. The section chiefs were Bill Platt, Ed Findell, Perry Elick, Bill Molnar, John Llewellyn, Ed Pavelka, Charlie Parker, Dick Coos, Jay Honeycutt, Lyle White, George Pettit, Charlie Dumas, John Aaron, Buck Willoughby, Gary Cohen, John Wagoner, Merlin Merritt, Bruce Walton, Harold Loden, Bill Peters, Ted White, Bert Sharp, and Merrill Lowe. Several of the section secretaries directly supported us in mission control. Among them were Joe Coy, Connie Turner, Sandra Lewis, and Donna Doherty. Great contractor teams supported the flight control division. They kept the pipeline of information flowing so the controllers worked with correct and timely design and test data. Learning by doing worked because of the network of design engineers cultivated by these lead engineers. Bill Blaster Blair, North American, Charles Whitmore, Grumman, Stewart, Stu, Davis, Phil Coe, Bill Harris and Ron Tunnicliffe, McDonnell, Richard Freund, AC Electronics, Myron Hayes, IBM, Ron Bradford, Bendix, Jim Elrod, Lockheed, Fred Kuene and Lee Weibel, Hamilton Standard. To the rest of you in the ranks, you are in my heart. Appendix Foundations of Mission Control To instill within ourselves these qualities essential for professional excellence, discipline being able to follow as well as lead, knowing that we must master ourselves before we can master our task. Competence there being no substitute for total preparation and complete dedication, for space will not tolerate the careless or indifferent. Confidence believing in ourselves as well as others, knowing that we must master fear and hesitation before we can succeed. Responsibility realizing that it cannot be shifted to others, for it belongs to each of us, we must answer for what we do, or fail to do. Toughness taking a stand when we must, to try again, and again, even if it means following a more difficult path. Teamwork respecting and utilizing the ability of others, realizing that we work toward a common goal, for success depends on the efforts of all. To always be aware that suddenly and unexpectedly we may find ourselves in a role where our performance has ultimate consequences. To recognize that the greatest error is not to have tried and failed, but that in trying, we did not give it our best effort. Glossary of Terms A 
Abort the time critical termination of an event AFB Air Force Base AFD Assistant Flight Director MCC ALSEP Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package AOS Acquisition of Signal ATDA Augmented Target Docking Adapter, used as a Gemini Rendezvous Target, Capcom Capsule Communicator Cape Cape Canaveral Commander Commander, Senior Astronaut on Apollo Mission CM Command Module, Reentry Portion of the Apollo Spacecraft that contains the crew, CMP Command Module Pilot Control Lunar Module Engineer in the MCC responsible for propulsion, attitude control, and primary and abort guidance and navigation systems, including computer hardware cryo-cryogenic, oxygen and hydrogen fuels stored at very cold temperatures, CSM Command and Service Module Apollo Ecom Gemini or CSM Engineer in MCC responsible for electrical, environmental, communications, cryogenic, fuel cell, pyrotechnic, and structural systems. EVA Extravehicular Activity FCD Flight Control Division provides majority of flight controllers to the MCC FCOB Flight Control Operations Branch, provides Assistant Flight Director and Procedures, develops Mission Rules FIDO Flight Dynamics Officer, the MCC Specialist in Launch and Orbit Trajectories. FOD Flight Operations Directorate Organization, also, Flight Operations Director in the MCC FTE Flight Test Engineer G Acceleration Due to Gravity Forces GMT Greenwich Mean Time, also referred to as Zulu, Z, Time GNC Gemini CSM Engineer in MCC responsible for propulsion, attitude control, guidance, and navigation systems, including computer hardware go no go decision process to continue or abort a mission activity GR guidance reference release GSFC Goddard Space Flight Center. Greenbelt, Maryland, GT Gemini Titan Dash, followed by mission number, Guido, pronounced Guido, MCC specialist in navigation and computer software. During Gemini, this included the Titan II guidance system. Inco MCC engineer responsible for combined CSM, LM, EVA, and rover instrumentation. Communications, command, and television systems. ASC John F. Kennedy Space Center, Florida LM Lunar Module, previously called Lunar Excursion Module, LEM, LMP Lunar Module Pilot LOI Lunar Orbit Injection, Maneuver to Enter into Lunar Orbit, Loss Loss of Signal LRC Langley Research Center, Langley Field, Virginia, MA Mercury Atlas Dash, followed by Mission Number, Mac Ratio of Airspeed to the Speed of Sound at a given altitude MCC Mercury Control Center at Cape 1960-65 or Mission Control Center at Houston 1965-1972 Met Mission Elapsed. Time, time since liftoff, MPAD Mission Planning and Analysis Division, responsible for analytic trajectory design Mr. Mercury Redstone Dash, followed by Mission Number, Master of Science Man Spacecraft Center. Houston, Texas, used through 1973 MSFC Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama. NACA National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics NASA National Aeronautics and Space Administration no-go the decision to cancel a planned event. OD Operations Director Position in Mercury Control Changed to FOD for Gemini and Apollo PAO Public Affairs Officer, position in the MCC to release mission information Pogo Rapid Up and Down Maneuver that if continued would destroy launch vehicle Psi Pounds per square inch PTC Passive Thermal Control RCS Reaction Control System, Small Propulsion Jets for Attitude Control and Small Maneuvers RefSmap Reference to Stable Member Matrix, Technique for Conversion Between Coordinate Systems. Retro Retro Fiery Officer, the MCC Specialist in Reentry Trajectories RSO Range Safety Officer, responsible for protecting landmass across the world from errant rockets SCE Signal Conditioning Electronic SimSup Simulation Supervisor, the leader of the training team in the MCC SM Service Module portion of Apollo CSM that contained main engines and power systems span spacecraft analysis team. Small group in MCC to access design and manufacturing SPC stored program command, a command stored in a computer or program that will activate a function at a specific clock time stay no stay time critical decision to remain on the moon or lift off at the next opportunity. Systems Mercury Control Center Engineer responsible for electrical, attitude control, display, 
and Structural Systems TEC Trans-Earth Coast TEI Trans-Earth Injection maneuver to return the spacecraft to Earth from the Moon. Telmu Lunar Module Engineer responsible for electrical, environmental, communications, pyrotechnic, structural, and EVA systems TLC Translunar Coast TLI Translunar Injection, the maneuver to take the spacecraft to the Moon, TM Telemetry Trench the MCC. Trajectory team consisting of the Retro, Fido, and Guido TVC Thrust Vector Control, Rocket Steering Mechanism, Z Zulu, short and term for Greenwich Mean Time used in logs and messages manned Mercury remote sites BDA Bermuda ATS RKV Atlantic tracking ship Rose not Victor, designation changed in middle of the program CYI Canary Islands KNO Kano. Nigeria ZZB Zanzibar IOS CSQ Indian Ocean Ship Coastal Century Quebec, designation changed in middle of program MUC Muchia, Australia. WM Wimera, Australia, tracking station in a remote desert location on a military test range CTN Canton Island FAA ground beacon for aircraft navigation in South Pacific HAW located at edge of Waimea Canyon on Hawaiian Island off Kaui Cal, California. Site located at Point Aguayo GYM Guaymas, Mexico TEX Corpus Christi, Texas Man Gemini Remote Site CYI Canary Islands CRO Carnivon, Australia HAW located at edge of Waimea Canyon on Hawaiian Island off Kaui GYM Guaymas, Mexico CSQ. Coastal Century Quebec Ship RKV Rose Not Victor Ship TEX used as a training site only.